prologue. I hate having to guess so boldly, Alice Hare told the first clear hoofprint she'd found in three days. But these snort-snouts aren't giving me much time to do it the proper way. Something dark moved on the crest of the ridge behind her. Alice Hare snarled an oath and trotted into the nearest copse of trees. Two days at least now, the orcs had been following her. It had been two nights that she dared not sleep. She was talking to herself more to keep awake than to measure her weary thoughts. Her bold guess as to which valley Rowan had chosen had been right again. But God's bless this. It was sloppy tracking. Rowan had ridden Cadmus here, or someone had. The marks of the hooves where the warhorse had crossed soft mud were deep enough to tell the steel princess that Cadmus had willingly carried a rider, heading as straight north as the land allowed. Three days had passed since Alisair had left her sister Tanalasta and the sage Alafandar and set off to rescue, or learn the fate of, her scout Rowan. The scout, a purple dragon ranger, was an outlawed Cormeral, but the father of Tanalasta's unborn child. Cormeral or not, the wedding was lawful. The babe, if it lived, would be the rightful heir to the throne of Cormir. "'Gods above and below, but father will be furious,' she murmured, ducking her way through a stand of young shadow tops. "'I don't know which I'd rather not be, Tana or Rowan.' A wry smile plucked at the corners of her mouth, then vanished in an instant as her eyes fell on the moss ahead. There was a break in the trees, and Cadmus had passed through it. Tracks led up a mossy slope and away from the open valley floor, where in wet weather a creek meandered, and the rest of the time open turf made for swift and easy mounted travel. Why leave that open ground? To camp? Alisair caught herself yawning again. She slapped her own thigh with the flat of her sword to rouse herself. Gods damn these persistent orcs! The steel princess threw back her head and drew in a deep breath. She was too tired to do this properly. She was suddenly very awake, with her skin crawling. She could feel the creeping all over her that meant her hair was rising. Something was wrong here, very wrong. But, by all the gods, what? The trail went around the man-high, rotten stump of a long, dead duskwood. She hefted her sword. From where she stood, as far as the eye could see, the trees ahead, an entire stand of them, dozens and dozens, were waiting. Silent, and yet not silent. There was a menacing, watchful heaviness hanging in the air. Elisair peered grimly up into still branches and past mighty trunks, seeking a living, lurking foe, but seeing nothing. The trees stood thick enough that there could well be a beast larger than a man, or even a score of such, a head, where she could not see. The steel princess cast a quick glance behind her, listening intently for sounds of orcs scrabbling up the trail, but heard nothing. Her pursuers had never bothered to strive for stealth in their gloating eagerness. After a moment, she shrugged and strode forward, sword-tip tracing a ready circle at her feet, half expecting a root to leap up and try to ensnare her. There was something unhealthy about the trees— Alisair stopped again and studied the nearest one, almost fancying that it had moved slightly, but no. Her weary eyes were playing tricks on her. It was a duskwood, and an old one. Some long-ago lightning had left it misshapen, as grey and as gnarled as the convulsed gauntlet of a buried giant, its bark scaled where there should be no scales. No, not scales, runes. The bark was engraved with a spiral of sinuous, somehow menacing, glyphs. The runes seemed new, powerful, and not good. The roots of the tree were exposed in all their tangles by a crude and recently dug burrow. The loose earth was simply flung aside as if a huge dog or hunting cat had dug swift but clumsy paws into the soil and torn at it. 
The hole was a ragged oval, just large enough for a man to crawl down. Alisair stepped back, then to one side, peering in. Every tree bore similar runes, and a hole had been dug under each of them. Heavy breathing and the scrape of boots came at last. Orcs were ascending the mossy trail behind her. Alisair rolled her eyes and strode quickly forward, following the clear path Cadmus had left for her. The trail continued to climb, and the dark, recently disturbed earth now began to display strange treasures for her inspection. There was a metal scepter of swirling, clearly elven design, yet dead and dark as no elf would have made it. Stones that should have been gleaming gems were dingy and clouded, and the metal itself was as dull and gray as forged lead. Beyond the scepter was a sword, also of splendid shape. It, too, seemed somehow drained. That was it. There were more blades beyond, and a coffer and a quiver, then something that must have been a staff of great magical power or ornate ceremonial significance. Everything was gray, dull, and lifeless, as if all power and beauty had been stolen out of them. The steel princess frowned down at them as she hurried on. Had this been an elven burial ground or a treasure cache? What manner of creature would know where to find, or dare to despoil, either? Gods, she whispered aloud to herself. Cormir was such a simple place when I was a child. When did it grow so many unfolding mysteries? As if in reply, and startling her with its suddenness, a voice sang out of the trees ahead, haunting and mournful. The liquid but sometimes harsh song was that of an elf maiden who was neither friendly nor gentle, as she shaped words Alisair could not understand. If there'd been no orcs right behind her, the steel princess would have backed swiftly away from that sound. As it was, the iron taste of fear was suddenly in her mouth, and she felt again that eerie stirring of hair rising all over her body. Well, at least she was fully awake now. The song swelled, and she made out a few of its words. There was the name Ilifar, then the word Shesapra, which humans had mangled into scepter, and something that sounded like Heriunum, which was in several old elfin ballads sung by master bards when they visited the court, and meant, more or less, all things of elves. It was repeated. Something of a refrain, then, about Ilifar's scepter giving him power over all things elven. The voice was unearthly, achingly beautiful, yet as menacing as the hiss of a serpent. Alisair found herself shivering in time to its soaring. Her hurrying feet brought her around a bend and face to face with more than a hundred orcs. These were black, hulking snort-snouts of the most powerful sort, with battle rings on their tusks and a cruel welcome glittering in their porcine eyes. Their leader, a mighty orc almost twice as tall as the sort of tusker Alisair was used to slaying in the Stonelands, whose much battered breastplate was studded with grinning human skulls, was grinning at her as one large grubby finger rubbed along the glyphs of the largest tainted tree Alisair had yet seen. The song was coming from the runes the orc was touching, each one flickering ever so slightly at the chieftain's touch. "'Well met, princess,' the orc hissed. The scuffle of boots told Alisair that her pursuers were coming up behind her. "'Or, should I say, my next meal?' The orc chieftain's roar of laughter rose to join the eerie song as the steel princess snarled and sprang to one side, snatching at the magic she carried at her belt. She was going to die here, horribly, if she didn't. Almost lazily, the orc chieftain moved one arm, dark muscles rippling, and a blade as long as Alisair stood tall, flashed end over end across the space between them. Alisair ducked away, but the blade seemed to follow, curving down. 
A sudden sharp, clear pain pierced her shoulder like fire. She'd taken an arrow in that shoulder once, and had managed to forget just how sickening it had felt. This was worse. She set her teeth and twisted away from the tree the orc's foul blade had pinned her to. Alisair staggered away, retching. Behind her, the pierced tree was making horrible gurgling sounds, as if it were choking around the orc's blade. Alisair stared at it, wondering what new horrors her next breath could bring. "'Come, Alisair, Nakesha Orberskir, the orc crooned, matching the cadence of the song rising behind him. "'Be my bride before you become my meal. I will do you that honor.' The orc chieftain's laughter rose like roaring thunder around her, and Alisair reeled, hoping she'd have enough strength left to run, perhaps after she screamed. 1. The world vanished, and Tanalasta's stomach rose into her chest. A sudden chill bittered her flesh, and there was a dark eternity of falling. She grew queasy and weak, and heard nothing but the beating of her own heart. Her head reeled. A thousand worried thoughts shot through her mind. Then she was simply someplace else. She was standing on the parapets of a castle wall, choking on some impossibly acrid stench, and trying to recall where in the nine hells she was. "'Teleporter!' yelled a gruff voice. "'Our corner!' Tanalasta glanced over her shoulder and saw a small corner tower. In the arrow loops appeared the tips of four crossbow quarrels. "'Loose at will!' yelled the gruff voice. As the weapons clacked, Tanalasta threw herself headlong down onto the wall walk. The quarrels hissed past and clanged off the stones around her, then ricocheted into the smoke-filled courtyard below. She looked after them, and found the enclave filled with kettles of boiling oil, barrels packed with crossbow bolts, fire tubs brimming with water. At the far end of the enclosure stood a sturdy oak gate, booming loudly under the regular crash of a battering ram. A constant stream of women and children ran up one set of stairs and down another, ferrying buckets of crossbow bolts and pots of boiling oil to the warriors gathered along the front wall. Though a few of the men wore only the flimsy leather jerkins of honest woodsmen, most were armored in the chain-mail hauberks and steel bassinets of Cormirian dragoneers. The sight of royal soldiers finally cleared the teleport after days from Tanalasta's mind, and she recalled that she was in the Cormirian citadel at Goblin Mountain. She would have preferred to enter by the main gate, but there happened to be a host of orcs hammering at the portcullis with an iron-headed ram. Behind her, the tower sergeant's gruff voice called, "'Ready your bolts!' "'Wait!' Tanalasta fished her signet ring from her pocket and spun toward her attackers, holding the amethyst dragon high above her. "'In the name of the Oberskiers, stay your fire!' There was a pause, then the tower sergeant hissed, "'By the black sword! That's a woman! In a war-wizard's cloak!' "'It is!' Tanalasta dared to raise her head and saw a heavy-browed dragoneer peering out of an arrow loop. "'And that woman is Crown Princess Tanalaska Oberskir. The sergeant narrowed his eyes. "'You don't look like any portraits I've seen, Princess!' He spoke to someone inside the tower, and a freshly loaded crossbow appeared in the arrow loop next to him. He turned back to Tanalasta. "'You won't mind if we come down for a closer look?' "'Of course not,' Tanalasta replied. "'And bring some ropes, long ones.' "'One thing at a time,' the sergeant said. "'Until then, don't move. We wouldn't want Magri here to spike the crown princess, would we?' Tanalasta nodded and remained motionless, though doing so made her fume inside. The sergeant was right to be cautious, but she had more than a dozen companions rushing across the valley toward the citadel. If she did not have ropes waiting when the haggard band arrived, the orcs would see them and trap them against the rear wall. 
The tower door opened, and three dragoneers in full battle armor stepped out. Two of the soldiers flanked Tanalasta and leveled their halberds at her, while their heavy-chinned sergeant took the signet ring from her hand. He eyed the amethyst dragon and its white-gold mounting for a moment, then hissed a curse in the name of Tempus. "'Where did you come by this?' "'My father gave it to me for my fourteenth birthday.' Tanalasta craned her neck back so she could glare into the soldier's eyes. "'According to Lord Beru's Manual of Standards and Procedure, Part the Fourth, Item Two, I believe the proper procedure now is for the sentry to demand the royal code word.' The sergeant's face paled, for Tanalasta's command of anything written in a book was well known throughout the kingdom. M "'May I have the code word, please?' Tanalasta snatched her signet back and said, "'Damask Dragon.' The dragoneer paled, then stooped down to take Tanalasta's arm. "'Highness, forgive me.' He pulled her to her feet without awaiting permission, then remembered himself and turned the color of rubies. "'Your face? Er, uh, I, uh, didn't recognize you. I beg your forgiveness.' Tanalasta grimaced at the thought of what she must look like. She had been traveling hard for nearly two months now, and the last few hours had been the most difficult by far. "'No offense taken, sergeant,' she said. "'I must look a fright.' Along with her companions, she had crawled the last mile with her face pressed into the mud to avoid being stung by wasps. "'Now, fetch those ropes and some strong fellows to man them. "'My company is in a dire state, and there's a gasneth close on our heels.' "'At the mention of a gasneth, the dragoneer's face went from pale to white. "'He spat a series of orders to his subordinates, "'then all three men rushed off to do the princess's bidding. "'The orcs continued to batter the portcullis, "'and an iron bar finally gave way with a deep clang. The sound was answered by an astonishing flurry of crackles and sizzles from the war wizards in the small gatehouse. The tempo of the pounding slackened. Tanalasta stepped over to battlements and peered through an embrasure into the valley behind the castle. Below was a vast wooded glen with a broad meandering river and precipitous granite walls. The princess needed several moments to locate the line of figures scrambling through the trees toward the citadel. She could glimpse no more than two or three men at a time, some limping and some struggling to carry wounded fellows, but her heart fell. No matter how patiently she watched, she never counted more than ten forms, and there should have been fifteen. The jangle of approaching soldiers rang along the rampart, and Tanalasta turned to find a sturdy officer of about forty winters leading a dozen dragoneers toward her. Four of the warriors carried a large iron box. The rest were armed with crossbows and iron swords. A pair of anxious war wizards accompanied the group, one at each end of the iron box. The officer stopped before Tanalasta and bowed deeply. "'If I may present myself, Highness,' he said, "'I am Fillmore, Lionar of the Goblin Mountain Outpost,' he motioned to the eldest wizard." And this is Sarman the Spectacular, master of the war wizards King Azun sent to meet you. Sarman stepped forward and also bowed. Though his weathered face looked far older than the Lionars, his hair and long beard remained as dark as that of a youth of twenty. At your service, Highness, we have been expecting you for the past several days. He extended a hand to her and said, the king has commanded that we teleport you to Arabelle the instant of your arrival. When my friends are safe, Tanalaste ignored the wizard's hand and pointed into the valley, where her companions were now struggling up the wooded hillside below the citadel. Several hundred paces behind them, a hazy cloud of insects was drifting across the river after them. A lavender emerask and high harvest master Foley are still out there, and the gasneth is close upon them, as you can see. Sarman and Fillmore peered over the wall, then arched their brows in concern. The wizard turned back to Tanalasa and said, Truly, princess, the citadel is in enough peril from the orcs alone. 
He reached for her arm. My assistant will see to the safety of the royal sage most learned and your friend from Huthduth, but I dare not let you risk your life. Tanalaska pulled away before he could touch her. You are not risking it, and don't you dare teleport me without my permission. You have told me what the king commanded, but there are things he doesn't know. Sarman's eyes betrayed his surprise at her commanding tone, but he nodded and said, "'Of course, Majesty.' The tower guards returned with four long ropes. Tanalaste instructed the sergeant to secure the lines to the merlins and drape the ends over the wall, then appointed four of Fillmore's burliest dragoneers to help the tower guards hoist her companions. The Lionar assigned the rest of the company to battle the Gazneth when it came over the wall. A loud crack sounded from the gate, followed by a muffled round of guttural cheers. The wizards in the gatehouse unleashed a tempest of lightning bolts and blasts of fire even greater than before, and again the tempo of the battering ram slowed. Tanalasta glanced over and wondered if her friends would be any safer inside the citadel. A large vertical split had appeared in the gate, and even Sarman's war wizards seemed unable to repel the attack. An anxious murmur broke out beside Tanalasta. She turned to find the cloud of insects swirling up the slope behind her companions, who were finally breaking into the cleared area near the rear wall. There were only ten of them, and three of those were being carried by others. At least Auden and Olafendar seemed to be all right. As Tanalasta watched, one man stopped and kneeled at the edge of the woods. He placed the man he was carrying on the ground, then pulled off his black cloak and slipped it over the fellow's shoulders. A second man stopped beside them. He placed a second figure in the arms of the first and pointed toward the corner where Tanalasta stood. The man in the cloak managed a weak nod, then he and his companion simply vanished. A sharp noise sounded between the princess and Sarman, and in the next instant two men, stinking of blood and gore, appeared. The pair collapsed in a heap of flesh and armor and lay groaning on the stones. Their faces so swollen and blotchy that Tanalasta recognized only the one in the cloak, and even then only by the sacred sunburst hanging around his neck. Auden! Tanalasta dropped to her friend's side. The man in his arms was already dead, his throat ripped out, and his steel breastplate dented by the gazness claws. Auden himself was in little better condition, with a fist-sized wound in his left side and two ribs protruding from the hole. One elbow was coiled around his burden's leg so that he could reach the weathercloak's magic escape pocket. Tanalasta pulled the arm free, then allowed a dragoneer to drag the dead man from the priest's arms. Auden, can you hear me? The priest's only reply was a muffled groan. Tanalasta motioned to Sarman's assistant and said, Teleport this man to Arabel at once. His life is to be saved, and I don't care if the queen must order the high hand of Timora himself to resurrect him. When the wizard hesitated, Tanalasta added, I think you should hurry. This was the last man to see Vangedahast alive. Alive? demanded Sarman. What do you mean? I thought you would have heard by now, Tanalasta said. After the loss at the Far Sea Marsh, the royal magician vanished. Sarman eyed Tanalasta, as though she had been trying to besmirch Vangedahast's reputation. There was nothing in Her Majesty's message to imply Vangedahast might be dead. The Queen said only that he had disappeared while giving chase to one of the Cormeral traitors. Tanalasta felt the heat rise to her face, but resisted the urge to make a sharp reply. Not all Cormerals are traitors, she said mildly. The wizard could hardly have meant to offend her, for he could not have known about her recent marriage to Rowan Cormeral. The ceremony had been performed deep in the Stonelands, and so far her trail companions were the only ones she had told. But when Vangertahast disappeared, he was chasing Xanthan Cormeral. Now Xanthan is chasing us. Sarman's face fell at the implications. 
both for Vanger de Hast and for the Citadel itself. Then he gave his assistant a curt nod. Take the good harvest master to the palace at once. The wizard nodded his obedience, then took Auden in his arms and uttered a single mystic word. The pair vanished with a distinct pop, leaving a huge pool of crimson blood where the harvest master had been lying. Tanalasta stared at the blood for a long time until Sarman stepped to the wall beside her and peered over the side. Too exhausted to run, even in such desperate circumstances, the rest of her companions were plodding up the steep slope toward the rocky cliff upon which the citadel sat. Behind them, the insect swarm was beginning to boil out of the woods and drone after the haggard company. If Xanthan is chasing you, am I to take it he is also a Gaznath? asked Sarman. I thought the Gaznaths were supposed to rise from the spirits of ancient traitors to Cormir. In most cases, yes, said Tonalasta. Xanthan is the one who dug them out of their graves. He also seems to have found a way to become one. The insect cloud began to obscure the men below. They broke into a weary trot and started to slap and curse. The one in the magic weather cloak pulled the hood over his head and looked up at the citadel. Tanalasa caught a brief glimpse of white hair and pale skin. Then the figure raised a hand to his throat clasp. The wrinkled face of a Lafandar Emerask appeared in Tanalasta's mind. With sunken eyes and hollow cheeks, the old man looked almost mad. He scowled angrily. Then his rasping voice sounded inside her head. Tanalasta, you're smarter than that. Go to Arabelle this instant. You carry Cormir's future in your belly. Tanalasta started to bristle at the sharp tone, then realized the royal sage most learned was right, as always. Though she was barely a month pregnant, that did not diminish the importance of the child growing inside her. With the realm on the brink of war and King Azun the Fourth a few winters beyond sixty, the worst thing a crown princess could do was risk her life or that of her baby. In such precarious times, either of their deaths might well mean the end of the Oberskir dynasty and perhaps of the kingdom itself. I'll wait down in the bailey, Tanalasta replied, speaking to Alafandar with her thoughts. Don't be long. As soon as she finished, the sage's image vanished from her mind. There was no chance for him to argue. A weather cloak's throat clasp allowed the user to exchange only one set of thoughts per day, and even then the messages had to be brief. Tanalasta stepped away from the wall, then turned to Sarman and said, Fillmore and his men seem to have matters well in hand. I'll wait for you in the bailey. Sarman's brow rose. Of course, princess, he replied. There is no sense putting yourself at any greater risk. A hint of disdainful smile danced at the corners of his mouth, and he pointed across the courtyard at the door of the opposite rear corner tower. That will be a safe place to hide. I will not be hiding, Sarman, Tanalasta said. I will be staying out of the way. The wizard's expression turned unreadable. Of course, Highness. Do not take offense at my poor choice of words. Though the insincere apology galled her, Tanalasta bit her tongue and descended the corner tower's musty stone stairs. The comment irked her only because of the truth in it. No matter the reason, she was retreating to safety while Alafandar and her other companions remained in danger, and that made her feel like a coward. Tanalasta stepped out of the tower into a smoky miasma of acrid odors and coppery-smelling blood. Several dozen wounded dragoneers lay in a groaning row along the back wall, attended by two grim-faced clerics and a dozen Quamish women. Apparently, word of Tanalasta's presence had already spread through the citadel, for the soldiers saluted as she passed, and the women curtsied. 
One of the priests went so far as to offer a healing spell for her face. She sent the persistent little man away, telling him graciously, but firmly, that he had better things to do with his prayers. By the time Tonalasta reached her assigned place and turned back toward the rampart, Fillmore's men were already hauling four of her companions through the embrasures. Exhausted, bloody, and groaning, the men were in little better condition than Auden had been. Even from down in the bailey she could see their armor hanging in tatters and their tunics dripping blood. As the rescuers untied the knots around their chests, Tanalasta began to feel hollow and guilty inside. Those men had risked their lives that she might escape. A cloud of insects came boiling over the battlements. Fillmore's dragoneers began to curse and slap at their faces, and several soldiers leaned through embrasures to fire their crossbows down the cliff face. The bolts were answered by a mad cackle of laughter. Then the air blackened with insects. The men howled, dropped their weapons, and stumbled back from the wall. Sarman was the first to recover his wits. The wizard raised his hands and bellowed out a spell, calling up a steady wind that tore across the courtyard and swept the insect cloud out across the forest. As soon as the swarm was gone, the soldiers began to reload their weapons, the rope haulers tossed their lines back over the side, and Fillmore shouted orders. At the front of the castle— the head of the orcish battering ram began to show through a split in the heavy oak. A company of purple-clad dragoneers poured down from the wall to gather in front of the widening breach. The rope haulers pulled another of Tanalasta's companions through an embrasure. Though battered and bloody, the man was strong enough to stand by himself. He freed himself from the ropes with a quick slash of his dagger, then began to drag his wounded fellows out of harm's way. Sarman's wind spell faded abruptly, and again insects started to pour over the battlements. One of Tanalasta's companions screamed, then his rope went slack. Half a dozen dragoneers leaned out through embrasures to fire down along the wall. Whirling spheres of wasps gathered around their heads, stinging them in the eyes and ears, making it impossible to fire their weapons. They stumbled back from the wall, screaming, and in their agony began to batter themselves about their own heads. A second shriek echoed up the wall, and another rope went slack. Tanalasta's heart fell. Though Alafandar's voice had not been one of those that screamed, she could not help fearing that he was already dead. Only one line remained over the side, and the rope haulers were not even pulling it up. She could only hope that the old sage did not need the rope. He had obviously been wearing one of the magic weather cloaks when he sent the thought message to Tonalasta, and if he was wearing a cloak, he could simply teleport into the castle. Fillmore leaned out to shout an order. His head disappeared into a black, swarming cloud. Then he screamed once and vanished over the wall. His men began to rush back and forth, stretching through the embrasures to hack at something with their iron swords. The cloud of insects grew so thick, Tonalasta could barely see what was happening. The orc's battering ram finally splintered the gate with a tremendous crash. A deafening chorus of guttural cheers reverberated through the citadel. Then the ram withdrew. A stoop-shouldered orc stepped into the breach and was met by a hail of crossbow bolts— he died, standing in the hole. In the rear of the citadel, Sarman cried out suddenly and stumbled back from the wall. A tall, gangly silhouette scrambled onto the merlin beside him. The figure was naked and gaunt, with a ragged tuft of beard and a cloud of insects whirling about his body. Tonalasta needed no more to identify him as Xanthan Cormeral, youngest of the Gazness and cousin to her husband Rowan. He had been hounding their trail for several days now, and she had seen more than enough of him to know him by sight. Xanthan dropped into a crouch and lashed out with one hand after the other, catching a pair of dragoneers by their throats. There were two sickening pops, then the soldiers' heads simply came off in his hands, leaving their bodies to take one last step before collapsing in limp heaps. Sarman pointed at the intruder and began a long incantation. The Gazneth, 
spun off his Merlin, turning his back on the wizard and spreading a pair of rudimentary wings across his shoulders. The appendages were thin and square, with ragged edges and a dusty gray color that gave them a distinctly moth-like appearance. As soon as Xanthan landed on the wall, he backed toward the wizard, taking care to keep his wings between him and his foe. The cloud of insects moved with him, giving him a vaguely ghost-like appearance. Sarman's voice cracked and rose an octave, but he continued his spell at the same droning tempo. A trio of brave dragoneers leaped to the attack, their iron swords arcing toward the gazness back from three different angles. Xanthan's foot shot up behind him, crumpling the steel breastplate of one soldier and sending another man tumbling off the rampart with a lightning-fast hook kick to the head. He stopped the third attack with a simple wrist block that snapped the poor fellow's arm and sent him spinning over the battlements. Sarman's voice finally fell silent, and a bolt of gray nothingness shot through the insect cloud to strike Xanthan square in one wing. The Gazneth stumbled forward and dropped to one knee, head shaking and wing glowing brilliant silver. Sarman's jaw fell and a croak of astonishment rose from his throat, as well it should have. Tanalasta had recognized the spell as a bolt of disintegration, one of the most powerful in the arsenal of Cormier's war wizards, and it had done little more than stun the Gazneth. The tower sergeant barked an order. Half a dozen dragoneers rushed forward and surrounded the Gazneth, their swords falling in a flurry of hacking iron. Xanthan let out a raspy snarl and exploded into a flurry of slashing claws and thrashing feet. He ripped the first soldier's leg off at the knee, then hooked the dismembered ankle behind the man's remaining foot and jerked it out from under him. The second and third dragoneers screamed and went down when he smashed the gruesome club into the side of their knees. Xanthan was up, driving his naked claws through a fourth man's throat and shouldering a fifth off the rampart. Sarman raised his hand and uttered a single mystic syllable, blasting a fist-sized meteor into the side of the Gaznet's head. The impact sent Xanthan cartwheeling down the rampart, spraying blood and bone everywhere. A dozen paces later, he finally tumbled over the edge and crashed into courtyard below, his ever-present cloud of insects trailing down behind him. When the Gazneth showed no sign of rising, Sarman waved the surviving dragoneers over the edge and shouted, "'Do you want to kill the rest of us? Get him in the box!' The tower sergeant enlisted the aid of two more dragoneers and shoved the box off the rampart onto the Gazness motionless body, then lowered himself over the edge after it. Sarman simply stepped off the rampart, relying on the magic of his war wizard's weather cloak to lower him gently into the insect cloud. As the wizard descended, a lavender's bony shape appeared on the carnage-strewn walkway. The old man was clutching his side with one bloody hand, and slapping at his wasp-stung face with the other, shaking his head in confusion as he tried to overcome his teleport after days. "'Sarman, above you!' Tanalasti yelled. "'A lavender!' The princess could not make herself heard above the clamor at the front gate, where a hundred orcs were squealing in agony as they poured through the splintered gates. Despite the rain of death pouring down on them through the gatehouse's murder holes, the orcs were slowly forcing their way forward, and Tanalasta knew it would not be long before they came pouring across the courtyard. She closed her weathercloak's magic throat clasp and pictured Sarman's face in her mind. The wizard's brow rose, and she spoke to him with her thoughts. A lavender is on the rampart above you. Get him, and let's go to Arabelle. Sarman glanced up, then looked across the bailey and nodded. As soon as we box the Gazneth, perhaps we can learn of Vangelahast's fate. Box it? Tanalasta cried, too astonished to care that her clasp's magic was gone for the day, and Sarman could no longer hear her. Have you lost your wits? 
heart rising into her throat, Tanalasta opened her throat clasp to deactivate the weather cloak's magic, then pulled her battle bracers from her pocket. She stopped short of slipping the bands onto her wrists. Putting them on would activate their magic, and the last thing she wanted when Xanthan recovered was an aura of magic. Gazness absorbed magic the way plants absorbed sunlight, and they could detect Dway Omer for miles around. To Tanalasta's astonishment, the dragon ears were able to do as the war wizard asked, scooping Xanthan into the box and slamming the lid before he recovered. Sarman stepped over to the box and reached for the iron bolting bar. A muffled squeaking erupted from the rear corner tower, and the wizard glanced reflexively over his shoulder. That was all the opportunity Xanthan needed. The box lid flew open, slamming Sarman so hard that he fell and tumbled backward across the courtyard. The Gazneth sat up, his arm flashing up to swat aside the iron sword of an alert dragoneer, then looked across the courtyard toward Tonalasta. Through the swirling cloud of insects, she saw a strange wedge-shaped face and a pair of red oval eyes. Then a dragoneer blocked her view. The man's sword slashed down once, then he screamed and clutched at his belly. In the next instant, a dark hand wrapped itself around his neck and gave a sharp twist, holding her battle braces ready. Tanalasta backed toward the corner tower behind her. Though she had not yet spoken with Xanthan Cormeril face to face, she knew of his hatred for the Oberskiers and had no doubts about what he would do to her and her unborn child, if he caught her alive. With Sarman still lying in a heap where Xanthan had knocked him, she would have to climb up to the rampart and flee to the gatehouse, where there would be no shortage of war wizards ready to teleport her back to Arabelle. As Tanalasta stepped through the door, she was greeted by the same squeaking sound that had distracted Sarman earlier. Something scratchy brushed past her ankle, and she looked down to see a blanket of rats pouring across the floor beneath her. One stopped to sniff at her leg. Tanalasta bit back a scream and started up the stairs, then heard a pair of feet whispering across the stony floor behind her. A powerful hand grabbed her by the hair, snapping her head back and jerking her off her feet. She landed flat on her back, still clutching her battle bracers in one hand. When she raised her hand to slip the bands on, she found a beady-eyed rat clinging to the cuff of her cloak. This time she did scream. A naked black foot swung across her body, pinning her arm to the floor and trapping the bracers in her hand. "'I think not, princess.' Above Tanalasta appeared a black, chitinous face that seemed more insect than human. The brow was broad and smooth, the nose long and slender, the mouth lined by a ridge of jagged cartilage. Though Sarman's spell had left a fist-sized crater in the side of the thing's head, the edges of the wound were already closing. Little clawed feet started to tug at Tonalasta's weather cloak, and the rats swarmed over her body, gnawing her clothes, hair, and flesh. Xanthan reached out with a spindly arm and slammed the tower door shut, then slipped the heavy lock bar into place as though it were a mere stick. Sentries, Stanislasti yelled, down here. The Gazneth smiled. So it is you, Highness. With his northern accent and dry huskiness, Xanthan sounded so much like Rowan that Tanalasta could have sworn it was her husband talking. The Gazneth chuckled brutally, then said, I fear your face is so swollen that you are no longer recognizable to your loyal subjects. Swollen as it is, at least it remains human, Tanalasta said. Whatever you have made of yourself, it was a poor trade. A metallic clamor began to echo down the stairs. Xanthan glanced toward the sound, and the rat swarm poured up the stone steps. The men started to curse and yell. Then one screamed, and a tremendous crash reverberated down the spiraling passage. Hoping to take advantage of the distraction, Tanalasta screamed for help, then shot her free hand across her body and slipped a bracer onto her wrist. Before she could put on the second, Xanthan caught her arm and plucked the bracer from her grasp. 
You are too kind, princess. The luster of the metal faded at once, and the gruesome wound in Xanthan's head healed before Tunnel lost his eyes. He discarded the band and grabbed the other one. As he pulled it off, he gave Tunnelasta's arm a vicious twist. She felt the bones snap, but heard only the briefest crack before her scream drowned out the sound. A pair of guards stumbled out of the stairwell, cursing and trying to kick the rats off their legs. The first lowered his halberd and drove it into Xanthan's ribs, pushing the gasneth off Tunnelasta and pinning him against the wall. The blade did not penetrate, however, for it was made of steel, and only weapons of cold-forged iron could wound a gasneth. Xanthan slapped the halberd aside, then grabbed the dragoneer by the back of the helmet and smashed his unarmored forehead into the tower's stone wall. There was a sickening crack, and the man went limp. Xanthan finished the second soldier with even less trouble, blocking the attack with one arm, then catching the man beneath the chin and simply tearing his jaw off. Tanalasta's gorge rose with pain and revulsion. Clutching her broken arm to her chest, she pushed her way through the rat swarm and braced herself against the wall. A series of deep thumps reverberated through the tower as warriors outside began to hammer at the door, but Tanalasta knew better than to think they would break through the thick oak. She thrust her good hand into her cloak, trying desperately to slip her shaking finger into her commander's ring. Xanthan ignored the hammering at the door and stepped across the room. He squatted and pulled her hand from her pocket, then plucked the ring from her grasp. The wound in his head was almost completely healed now, and the scalp grew back as he drained the magic from her ring. "'Do you know who is doing this to you?' he asked. "'It is important that you know who is killing you,' Tanalasta nodded. "'Xanthan Cormayril. She tried to keep the fear out of her voice. Whether or not she was going to die, she did not want to give him the satisfaction of seeing her terror. "'I know. Your cousin was a traitor, and you are too. May the both of you rot in the nine-hundredth pit of the abyss!' Xanthan grabbed her jaw. "'I was no traitor until your father stole our lands!' He squeezed until a bone snapped, and Tonalasta nearly fainted from the pain. But we Cormerils have never been ones to hold grudges. Vengeance is so much sweeter. Something cracked in the door, and the hammering began to intensify. Xanthan glanced over his shoulder, then pulled Tanalasta up by her broken jaw. He reached around to grab the back of her neck with his free hand, and she realized he meant to rip her head from her shoulders. A loud crack reverberated through the room, and the hammering at the door grew louder and faster. Xanthan's fingers dug into Tanalasta's neck, and she knew she would never survive until the thick oak splintered. A sudden calm came over her. She closed her eyes and began to pray, begging the Great Mother to watch over her soul and that of her unborn child. "'Open them!' Xanthan hissed. Tanalasta croaked out something she meant to be, "'What?' then was struck by the irony of Xanthan's vengeance." Bitter laughter began to boil up from deep within her, racking her battered body and grating at the ends of her broken jaw. The pain flowed through her like water. Her mouth fell open, and she laughed in Xanthan's face, fully and hysterically. His grasp tightened until Tanalasta thought her neck would snap, but still she laughed. She could not stop. No! Xanthan shook her, and the pain meant nothing to Tonalasta. Stop! How can I? she mumbled. You're killing a Cormeril! Liar! Xanthan squeezed so hard that his fingers broke her skin. You're no Cormeril! Tonalasta shook her head. I'm not, but Rowan is! She managed to stop laughing, then added, I'm carrying his baby! "'Never!' Despite his reaction, Xanthan's jaw fell, and his gaze dropped to her stomach. "'He's a low-born dog, hardly worthy of the Cormero name. "'Still my husband, still your cousin,' Tanalasta mumbled only the words she needed to. 
Now that her hysterics were passing, she saw a slim hope of forestalling her death, and with that hope came pain. A Cormeril could sit on the throne, could have not only your lands, but all of Cormir. The gamble failed. Xanthan's eyes flashed crimson, and the sinews of his dark arms rippled as he jerked on Tunnelasta's jaw. A terrible aching pain filled her head, but she fought to stay conscious, determined to defy her enemy until the end. But her head did not come free. Despite the pain it caused, her neck remained solidly intact, and Tanalasta found herself staggering from one side of the room to another as the Gaznath tried to pull her head off her shoulders. Xanthan's ovoid eyes grew wide and scarlet. Liar! He forced her to kneel and tried again. Tanalasta's hearing faded, and her vision narrowed to a mere tunnel, but the Gaznath's doubt seemed to have sapped his strength. To keep from losing consciousness, she opened her mangled mouth and screamed. The pounding of the door stopped, and a muffled voice began a spell. Xanthan glanced over his shoulder. For a moment, his fading humanity was visible in the profile of his heavy brow and long nose. Then he looked back to Tunnelasta with a hatred more human than Gazneth burning in his eyes. Tunnelasta tried to say it was true that if he killed her, he would be robbing the Cormerals of the first Cormerian monarch to bear their blood, but she was too weak and in too much pain. All she could manage was a pompous smile and a short nod. That was enough. In Tunnelasta's delirium, the shadow seemed to leave Xanthan's body. Suddenly he began to resemble little more than a naked man with hate-filled eyes and a bitter soul. Harlot! Xanthan spat and reached down for the sword of a dead guard. Before he could pull it, Sarman's muffled voice fell silent. A loud boom reverberated through the tiny room, and the tower door came apart in a spray of shattered planks and twisted hinges. The explosion caught Xanthan full in the back, hurling him across the chamber, but shielding Tonalasta from the worst of the blast. Armored soldiers came clanging through the door instantly coughing and choking on sulfurous fumes. Xanthan rolled to his feet and hurled himself down the stairs, disappearing into the musty depths beneath the tower before the dragoneers had taken two steps. A moment later, a lavender rushed through the door, Sarman the Spectacular close on his heels. Tonalasta, cried a lavender, in the name of the binder, no! The old sage collapsed to his knees and cradled her head in his lap. He started to weep and rock to and fro, causing the ends of Tanalasta's broken jaw to rub against each other. She moaned and reached up, clamping her fingers onto his arm to make him stop. By the quill, she's alive! A lavender pulled her higher into his lap, wrenching her broken arm around painfully, and waved Sarman over. Teleport us to Arabelle now. Two. No, the oldest tracker said flatly. No horse willingly gallops along bare rock when there's soft turf to be had, unless the rider it's obeying guides it so. If Cadmus went along here, as he must have done, to leave no trace for so long, and not having wings— then you can be sure someone was riding him. His master, the tracker shrugged. Who else? Suddenly mindful that he was answering an anxious king and not an ignorant recruit, he added awkwardly, Mind, majesty, riders don't exactly leave tracks of their own that we can follow, if you take my meaning, but... I understand, Azun said, lifting a reassuring hand. You do good work, Père Duval. Continue. The fortunes of the realm may depend on the trail you find for us. In reply, the tracker silently lifted a bushy pair of eyebrows for a moment, then bent over again to study the southern end of the bare shoulder of rock. In a matter of moments, he given the impatient wave of his hand that meant he'd found signs left by the passage of the royal magician's war horse, and the army moved on. 
The brief horn call that blared a breath or two later brought the army to an abrupt halt, and hundreds of heads turned in haste. A man was running from the rear guard, waving his hands as he came. "'To arms!' he cried. "'Orcs behind us! Thousands of them!' The king did not hesitate. "'Up this hill, everyone!' he bellowed. "'Form a ring, spears to the fore, all with bows within and readying them. Move!' The sword-lords and lance-lords around him began relaying the orders as purple dragons surged into motion, rolling up the hill in a vast, gleaming wave. "'I'll be needing a foray, force,' Azun called to the lords, Brayer, Winter, and Tolan. "'Gather forty men at most, men who can move swiftly and have good eyes, but none of the scouts. They deserve a rest.' As he spoke, the horns that would call in the far-flung scouts sounded, and the first men reached the crest of the hill. In involuntary unison they turned and peered in the direction the rear guard had indicated for the orcs. "'Move, tempest-damned sheep!' a sword captain bellowed at them. "'Time for sightseeing later. There's a war on, and we're in it.' Several mock bleats came as a reply as dragoneers moved hastily into a ring, grounding their spears and looking for their accustomed officers. "'Move!' I said. The sword captain growled at a lone, motionless figure, then fell silent, realizing he just bawled an order at the king. Azun spun around and clapped him on the shoulder reassuringly. "'Keep right on doing that,' he murmured. "'You never know when you might save a royal life. Just be assured that most of the time I'll ignore you.' They traded grins, albeit a rather sickly one on the sword captain's part, and took their own places. The officers stepped into the ring, and the king stood beside the two nobles who'd wisely selected some veteran officers to lead the force, rather than trying to claim victory for themselves. They were standing with about twenty men. The king nodded approvingly. "'I'll be needing some swift swords to seek out the enemy,' he told them. If anyone is footsore or slowed for any reason, say so now. Your lives will almost certainly depend on being fleet in the field. He looked again at the hill from where the rear guard's warning had come and stiffened. A lone figure was running toward them, stumbling with weariness. It was a warrior, armor covered with dust, but seeming somehow familiar. A Cormirian, to be sure. Orcs were streaming up over that hill now close behind the running knight. They were going to catch him and slay him right under the king's nose, in full view of all the royal army. Azun's mouth tightened. It would be foolish to abandon a strong defensive position to go down there to swing blades with so many orcs, but the last thing he wanted was to stand idle and watch a man he might have saved get hacked apart while he did nothing. It was also something he didn't want purple dragons to see and remember— the lone figure might be them next time. What good is a king who stands heartless when a subject is in need? For a force, down and defend that knight. The rest of you charge when the hilltop is covered with orcs, he roared, and set off down the hill. Majesty, a lancelord protested, and another cried, This is madness, good king. Azun turned without slowing and cupped his hands around his mouth. "'I can only hear officers who run with me,' he called. "'If one man dies while I stand idle, what kind of king am I?' He heard the approving murmur from the warriors in the ring, and the officers heard it too. No more protests came to the royal ears as the king of Cormir and his strike force raced down the hill, angling their charge so as to come between the foremost orcs and the lone fleeing figure. Gods, but it was a horde. Hundreds of tall, hulking orcs, fresh and eager, loped along with their blades out, and their tusks gleaming, howling as they saw the humans rushing to meet them. The two running forces crashed together in a sudden mass of shouts, ringing blades, and thudding bodies. Azun pointed at the lone, gasping knight they were trying to rescue— to make sure no orc slipped through the fray. He saw that Tolan and Brayer Winter were leading four dragoneers to form a ring. Then he crashed into a knot of struggling men, with the old, quickening eagerness for the fray. 
The king drove his sword half through an orc's forearm. The beast screamed and tried to shake the steel free. Azun barely heard an unexpected shout through its noise. Father! Azun! Father! It could only be Alisair, but her voice was a raw sob. The king fell back from the fray, raising his ring. Alessa? Lass? Majesty! Brer Winter's voice arose like a trumpet, and Azun realized that the exhausted fleeing knight had been his daughter. He sprinted across the field, hearing the mighty roar of his main army behind him as it charged down the hill to slay the orcs. He ran to where the small ring led by the lords stood around a lone, shuddering form. The Princess Alisair was sitting, her mouth wet from the healing potion Brer Winter had already forced down her throat, her face streaked with dirt and rivulets of sweat. Her eyes were dull with weariness, and she was shuddering between gulps of air. He might have stood on a hilltop and watched orcs butcher her, one of the best warriors in the realm. Lass, he said fervently, dropping his sword and putting his arms around her in as gentle a cradling as he could manage. Her own embrace was fierce, and she put her face against his armored chest for only a few heaving breaths, never letting the men standing watchfully around them hear a single sob. I found a grove of those twisted trees— "'Twas full of orcs, been running since, spent all the magic I had, fighting and running. Ring wouldn't take me to you. How came you here, to my backlands?' The battle was rising around them, in earnest now, men and orcs shrieking and shouting as they died, their cries almost lost in the incessant ringing of steel. "'Alessa!' Azun said, rocking her slightly in his arms, reluctant to let go of what he'd come so close to losing. I'm looking for the man who always knows what to do, no matter how much you two have crossed swords down the years. I need his counsel now, more than ever. Vanji's war horse came this way. We've been following the trail, hoping to find him alive. Alasir shook her head. Cadmus was carrying someone else on this ride. Vanger de Hast was, is, missing. What? Vanji wasn't in the saddle? Alisair shook her head again. I fear he is truly lost, she whispered. The king threw back his head as if someone had slapped him, paying no heed to the battle raging close around them now. The endless orcs were slowly driving back the men of Cormir. The king closed his eyes and shook his head grimly. No, he muttered. Gods, no. He let go of her and walked away, as if alone in a fog. Alisair and the lords exchanged startled glances, then sprang to their feet and followed. The steel princess scooped up her father's forgotten sword. I'm no good at riddling my way out of prophecies, Azun told the heir around him despairingly. Father, Alisair slapped the blade back into her father's hand and shook his shoulder, imploring. King Azun, speak to me. Vanji's wisdom lost to me when I need it most, Azun murmured, after all these years. He whirled around and snapped. It cannot be. The old wizard's off on some quick work of his own, something he hasn't told us about as usual. And if he's not... Alisair almost whispered. Her father looked at her grimly, then said almost calmly, as if he were noticing the weather out a castle window, "'Then the gods have truly turned their backs on me.' A horn call rang out, bidding the army of Cormir to try to return to their hilltop. The sound was almost lost in the derisive roar of a new wave of orcs. Three. Vanger de Hast sat atop the highest step of the grandest goblin palace in the great goblin city, holding his ring of wishes in one hand and his borrowed mace in the other, staring out over the black expanse of the central goblin plaza into the great goblin basin, where a pair of scaly golden membranes lay furled along opposite rims of the pool giving it the slit-like appearance of a giant reptilian eye, watching him watch it, watch him watch it, 
and so on, so on, to the end of all things, like a mirror mirroring a mirror, or an echo echoing an echo, or a man pondering the depths of his empty, empty soul. A wizard could lose his mind in a place like that. Perhaps a wizard already had. The plaza around the pool seemed to be turning scaly and red, save for a long chain of giant white triangles that bore an uncanny semblance to teeth. Vanjertahast could also make out the shape of a sail-sized ear and the curve of a bridge-length eyebrow, and even the arcs of several lengthy horns sweeping back from the crown of the head. Taken together, the features gave him the uncomfortable feeling of looking at the largest mosaic of a dragon he had ever seen. Probably, Vanjur de Hast should not have worried about failing to notice it earlier. At the time, he had been fighting for his life, trying to capture Xanthan Cormeril and force him to reveal the exit to the Goblin City. There had been flashing spells and gruesome melees and hordes of droning insects— and it would have been normal for even the most observant of combatants to miss the mosaic. But Vanger de Hast was no mere combatant. He was the High Castellan of the War Wizards, the Royal Magician of Cormir, the First Counselor to the King, and he did not overlook such things. He could not afford to. Every day the life of the King and the strength of Cormir depended on his powers of observation— and he kept his senses honed keener than the blade of any dragon-slaying knight. He perceived all that passed before him, heard every whisper behind his back, smelled any kind of trouble the moment it formed, and still he had not noticed the mosaic until, well, until some time earlier. Days had no meaning in this place. The only way to mark time was by the steady shrinkage of his ample belly, and he had already taken in his belt two notches before he began to notice the mosaic. Either he was hallucinating, or the thing had begun to form before his eyes. He would not have liked to wager which. A pair of yellow membranes slid across the pool, coating the surface with a fresh layer of black sheen, and slowly retracted again. Vanjur de Hast had seen the pool blink before, long before the dragon appeared, so perhaps the blinking had nothing to do with the mosaic. Everyone knew mosaics could not blink. Vanger de Hast slipped his ring on, then descended the stairs, moving slowly to keep himself from blacking out. The goblin city contained nothing but stone and water, and he could not eat stone. He had long since passed the stage of hunger pangs and a growling stomach, but his dizziness was almost constant. Near the bottom— his strength failed. He dropped to a stair, where it was all he could do to brace his hands against the cold granite and prevent himself from sliding the rest of the way down. A meal you need. The words were deep and sibilant, and they rumbled through the lonely city like an earthquake. A nice roast roté, and a big flagon to wash it down. Vanger de Hast leaped to his feet, his strength returning in a rush. He peered into the murk beyond the plaza, searching for a pair of glinting eyes, or a skulking black silhouette, or some other hint of the speaker. Seeing nothing but murk, he considered hurling a few light spells into the darkness, but quickly realized he would find nothing. His hunger had finally gotten the best of him, and now he was hearing things as well as seeing them. There was no sense wasting his magic on hallucinations. Magic was too precious in this place, where even spells of permanent light seemed to burn out like common torches. The pool continued to stare, and it seemed to venture to Hass that the darkness in its heart had swung around to stay focused on him. He crept down to the bottom stair and crouched above what would be the crown of the dragon's head. There was a definite rise where the skull swelled up out of the ground, and he could feel a rhythmic shuddering in the steps beneath his feet. Vanger de Hast reached out and ran his hand down the nearest scale. It was the size of a tournament shield, and as warm to his touch as his own flesh. "'I've lost my mind,' he gasped. "'Yes, 
You have lost something, but not your mind, the voice rumbled. Ten paces beyond the eye, the row of white triangles moved in time to the words. You've lost only your big belly, and soon your life, too, unless you eat. Vanger de Hast scrambled up the stairs, but grew dizzy half a dozen steps later and had to stop. He rubbed his eyes with the heels of his hands. When he looked again, the dragon face remained, the eye in the basin still staring at him. "'Why have you less faith in your eyes and ears than the doubts of a spent and weary mind?' asked the dragon. I am as real as you. Touch me and see. I'd rather, uh, trust you about that. Venger de Hast remained where he was, his mind whirling as it tried to make sense of what he was seeing. Insanity still seemed the greatest likelihood, save that he had always heard the insane were the last to know of their illnesses. But down here, he would be the last to know. He had been trapped in the Goblin City for, well, for some while. In the eternal darkness of the place, time had no meaning. The only way to mark hours was by the duration of his spells, which all seemed to fade far too quickly. When Vegeta Hast remained quiet, the dragon spoke again. "'You don't believe in me, or you would ask my name.' The admonishment jarred Vanger de Hast back to a semblance of his senses, concluding that if he was going insane, he had already lost the battle. He decided to treat the dragon as though it were real. He gathered up his courage, then sat down on the step and addressed the dragon. "'I'm interested less in who you are than what,' he said. "'If you are some chimera manifested by my guilty soul to abuse me in the lonely hours before death,' I'll thank you to spare me the nonsense and get down to business. I know the evil I've done, and I'd do it again, fully conscious of the costs to myself and others. Fully conscious, the dragon echoed. That is impressive. Cyric's tongue, Vanger de Hast cursed. You are a phantasm. I suppose that's my reward for letting Elephandar and Auden prattle on about symbols and meaning. "'Meaning has power,' answered the dragon. "'But I am nothing of yours, I promise. "'I am a true dragon.' "'Dragons are hatched, not—' "'Vanger de Hast paused and glanced derisively at its emerging figure. "'Not formed.' "'And hatched I was, in the days when Rothe ran free, and elves ruled the woods.' The dragon's eyes shifted from Venger to Hast, and stared at a magic sphere of light fading above it. "'But now I am a prisoner, and more than you.' "'A prisoner, you say?' As Venger de Hast spoke, he was doing a quick set of mental calculations— the dragon's accent and its reference to Rothe, the extinct buffalo that once roamed the forests of Cormir, placed its age at well over fourteen hundred years, even for such an ancient worm. However, it was too large by far. The distance from its eye to the last white fang had to be sixty feet, which would make the length from snout to tail somewhere in excess of six hundred feet. I doubt that. The wizard has not been born who could cage such an ancient worm. Nor the warrior who could imprison a mage so great as yourself, replied the dragon. Yet I have seen you casting your spells, teleporting here, plain walking there, dimension dooring all places between, sending thought pleas to anyone who might hear, and yet you remain here with me. It was no wizard who caught me or you. We were trapped here by our own folly and pride, and prisoners will stay. Venger de Hast rolled his eyes and stood. "'If you're going to talk like that—' "'Oh, yes. Go and starve to death.' 
a tremendous boom resounded from the dragon's one visible nostril, and a fireball the size of an elephant went sizzling into the darkness. It crashed into a distant goblin manor, spraying blobs of melted stone in every direction. Vangedahast cocked a brow. "'I won't be stepping in front of you, I think.' A scaly red lip drew away from the dragon's teeth, creating a snarl as long as some streams Vanger de Hast had seen. "'Die if you like, but leave your wishes for me.' Vanger de Hast folded his hands behind his back, concealing the ring he had been contemplating earlier. "'Wishes? In the ring!' A wisp of yellow fume streamed out of the dragon's distant nostrils. "'Everything else you have tried, but the wishes are too dangerous. You don't understand this place, and if you wish wrong, puff, no more wizard!' Vangerda Hast frowned. "'Have you been reading my mind?' The dragon broke into a raucous chuckle, and clouds of boiling sulfur hissed into the plaza. Vangerdehast waited until its mirth died away, then said, "'Your point, I suppose, is that you do know the nature of this place?' The yellow membranes closed over the basin in a sort of reptilian wink. "'A long time I have been here,' it said. "'But you, even if there was food, humans do not live so long. If you are to leave, I think it must be with me. Vangerdehast studied the beast for a moment, considering the kind of havoc he would unleash by helping such a creature escape. If the thing truly was as old as it appeared, its magical abilities would rival his own, and he had already seen what its fire breath could do. On the other hand, Cormir was doomed without him, especially with the Gaznes loose, and Princess Tanalasta still infatuated with that lowly ranger she had met, kin to the traitorous Cormirals he was, and a ground-splitting Chontia worshipper as well. Badger de Hast unclasped his hands and started down the stairs. "'I suppose you have a name?' "'I do,' replied the dragon." But no human could understand it. You may call me Nalavara. It was all Vangedehas could do to avoid falling again. The name came almost directly from a chapter of Cormir's earliest history, and not a very proud chapter at that. Something is wrong, wizard, rumbled Nalavara. Vangedehas looked up and saw he had stopped moving. Not at all just weak with hunger. Hoping that Nalavara had not been reading his mind, he started down the stairs again. But I would like to hear your full name, if I might. The dragon's huge eye membranes drew closer together. Why? Human translations are so graceless. Vangerdehast reached into the component pockets inside his weather cloak and withdrew a pinch of salt and another of soot then rubbed them between his fingers and uttered a quick little spell. "'My understanding of old Wormish might surprise you. I have a special fondness for the beauty of the language.' "'Do you?' Nalavara's eye remained narrow, but her long lips twisted into a crocodile's smile. "'Very well.' She rattled off a long series of rumbling growls and fire-like crackles that Vangedehast understood perfectly as Nalavarothatoral the Red. "'So, human, do you like my name?' asked Nalavarothatoral the Red. "'Sorry, didn't understand a word.' Actually, Vangedehast understood better than he would have liked. The name wasn't Old Wormish at all, but Ancient Elvish. The phrase meant something like, the maiden Alavara, betrothed of Thatoral, painted in blood. He forced a stupid smile and added, The human ear can be a bit flat. One fault among many, Nalavara agreed. And you are called? Elminster, Vangedehast replied, lying through his teeth. Elminster of Shadowdale. Now, how do we get out of here? 
Nalavara's eye widened to its normal proportions, which was to say about as broad and long as a spacious work table. First, Helminster, you must wish for something to eat. You will need a clear head for the work to come. Work? You must be jesting, ventured a hast scoffed. That's why I have a ring of wishes, and I'm not about to waste the last one on a pot of porridge. An angry shudder shook the stairs. Then Nalavara rumbled, One wish only? Only one, so be certain of yourself. Ventured a hast was not exactly lying. The truth was he had no idea how many wishes remained to the ring. It had been handed down to him through a long line of royal magicians, and if any of them had ever known the number it contained, the secret had died long before it reached Vangerdehast. "'Tell me what to wish,' the royal magician said, "'and I'll have us out of here.' A long ribbon of flame snorted from Nalavara's distant nostril. "'A fool I am not,' she rumbled. "'Come and bind yourself to my horn, and I will tell.' Vangerdehast did as he was asked, but the horn was as large as a tree trunk, and even his over-large belt was not long enough to reach. He explained this to Nalavara, then wrapped his arms around the horn and said, "'I give you my word, I won't let go.' Nalavara snorted angrily, then said, "'Be warned! If you try to leave me behind, the wish will not work.' "'Leave you behind?' Vanger de Hast echoed. "'Never! My word is as good as my name.' "'That is less of a comfort than you think, Elminster,' the dragon rumbled. "'Know that if you try to cheat me—' "'Yes, yes, I can imagine,' Vanger de Hast said. You will look me up in Shadowdale, and I shall forever after have reason to regret my perfidy. Now, are we going to cast our wish or not? Very well, grumbled Nalavara. The secret is not to wish us out of the city, but to wish the city back in time. You must call upon the ring to fill it again with goblins. Goblins? The Grod Goblins. Nalavara said. That returns the city to the time when goblins ruled the land. From there we must use our own spells to travel to our own times. Have you a time-walking spell? No, ventured a hast grumbled, though it hardly matters. He released the dragon's horn and jumped off her head, then started down the plaza filled with disappointment and despair. Had there been any real chance of the spell working, Nalavara would certainly have insisted on holding him in her mouth. Then she'd bite him in two, once the wish was made. Wait! Nalavara boomed. Without me, the spell will not work. And not with you, either, he called back. Whatever you want, Nalavara, it isn't to be free of this place. Red dragons are not so trusting. To Vangerdehast's great surprise, Nalavara did not explode into a fit of anger. Instead, she began to chuckle, shaking the plaza so violently he lost his footing and had to sit. "'Come now, Elminster,' she rumbled. "'You know I am more than a dragon, and I know you are not who you claim to be.' Seeing that the virtues of deception had long exhausted themselves, Venger de Hast also began to laugh, a deep, mad laugh, begot more of weariness and despair than humor, but a laugh nonetheless. He was one of only two men living who knew the name Alavara and what it meant to Cormier, and it struck him as absurdly funny to find himself trapped alone with her in a deserted goblin city. Lorelei Alavara was an elf-maiden, quite beautiful by all accounts, who had lived in the wolf-woods when the first humans began to intrude. She had been betrothed to Thatterall Elian, a handsome young hunter foolish enough to argue with a band of human poachers over whose arrow had killed a bear. The argument ended only when Thatterall became the first wolf-woods elf to be murdered by human hands. 
Lorelei Alavara's grief knew no bounds, and she plotted constantly with King Ilifar to make war on the humans and drive them from the land. It was she who organized the slaughter of Mondar Bleth in the days before Cormir was a kingdom, and who slew a thousand humans more before her own kind grew weary of her obsession with vengeance, and, a century after the first murder, finally banished her to the Stonelands. That much of the story was told to every member of the royal family as soon as they reached the age of majority, but there was more passed only from royal magician to royal magician, and told only to the ruling monarch since the founding of the kingdom. Thatterall Elian's murderer had been Andar Oberskir, brother to the founder of Cormir, Ondeth Oberskir, and uncle to the first king, Ondeth's son, Fairlthan. According to the story passed down to Vanger de Hast, Andar had escaped retribution by virtue of good luck, having been tending to nature's call deep in the woods when the elves came to avenge their kinsman's death. Though the massacre had left Andar too frightened to ever again set foot in elven territories himself, he had told his brother many times of the bounty of the wolf woods, and those descriptions were what convinced Ondeth to build a new home beyond the frontier. That Cormir's birth had resulted from such a miscarriage of justice had been the kingdom's most jealously guarded secret for more than fourteen centuries now, and Vangedahast could not help chuckling at the thought that the dragon had actually hoped to make him the instrument of its divulgence. Alavara the Red, he said, I should have thought even your thirst for vengeance long quenched. It is not vengeance I seek, only justice, answered Nalavara. Though I know a different appetite sustains the mighty Vangina hast. As Nalavara spoke, the sphere of magic light floating above her head grew dim. A black circle appeared on the dark ground between Vangita Hast's feet. He cried out in astonishment and scrambled away, then began to feel cowardly and foolish when he saw that the thing was not moving. "'Take it,' urged Nalavara. "'There is no reason to be afraid.' Vangita Hast exchanged his ring of wishes for a simple commander's ring from the royal armory, then whispered, King's light. A halo of golden radiance rose from his hand and illuminated the ground in front of him, revealing a simple crown of iron. What's that? he demanded. You know, answered Nalavara, your whole life have you craved it, and now it is yours. All you need do is wish. Wish? Vanger de Hast kicked the crown away, then stood and began to hobble off into the darkness. If I were to wish for anything, it would be that you never existed. By all means, Nalavara chuckled, any wish will do. Four. The horn call rang out a second time, and Alisair glanced over at her father. To her astonishment, the king was smiling. He caught sight of her and said almost exultantly, "'Magic still serves the crown in some things, lass.' The steel princess lifted an eyebrow, overjoyed to see the king of Cormir out of his dark mood, but somewhat puzzled as to why. "'You didn't expect Doneth to meet us here?' she asked, glancing around at the familiar cliffs and crags of Knoll Pass." You told me yesterday how sorely we needed the reinforcements he'd bring, and now his obedience seems to be a cause of— Are things in Arabelle worse than I'd heard? No, no, lass, Azun chuckled. Tis what he's brought with him that's a cause of— I'll tell all later. For now let us claim yonder hilltop, and there raise the tent I hope young Marla ears also brought along. Tent? Father, are your wits addled at last? Have a care for treason of the tongue, the landlord snapped from behind the steel princess. You speak ill of the king. 
She whirled around with sparks fairly spewing from her eyes and snarled, "'Dare less with your own speech, soldier. Oberskiers speak freely, and thereby keep the realm strong. Learn that well, if you learn nothing else about fighting under the Purple Dragon banner.' "'You chided the Steel Princess?' "'Someone muttered, just loudly enough for Alisair to hear "'as she turned to stride after her father. "'Man, are your wits addled at last?' "'A smile almost rose to the lips of the princess at that, "'as she hastened down loose rocks and slippery tussocks of clinging vine "'and grass to where Donath Marleyear was kneeling before his king. "'All is as you requested, your majesty.' the High Warden of the Eastern Marches was saying earnestly. "'The Pole's crew await your orders. The mages stand there with the cage. As you can see, it is wrapped to hide its true nature, just as you instructed.' "'Wrapped to hide?' Alasair murmured, coming up to stand beside her father's shoulder. "'What by all the unslain orcs of the Stonelands is—' "'Tell me now,' Azun was asking— "'What was the look on Elamander's face when you brought him my orders, "'and showed him the royal ring?' "'Total astonishment,' Donath said with a smile. "'But it soon slipped into disgust about the time I began describing the massive cold iron bars. "'Beneath my skills,' he sniffed, "'and snatched the ring from my fingers to make sure I wasn't playing him false. "'He cursed. "'I can't remember all the words, even if your majesty cared to hear such foulness.' and I doubt there even is such a thing as the blind-flying spawn of a love-slave slapped, dung-sucking donkey. Then he took the suit of armor he'd been working on from its stand and hurled it the length of his shop. The king exploded in laughter, slapping his thighs, then dealing Donath a blow across the back that sent the young warden staggering. Wonderful! Will someone— Alasair asked, with silken politeness, "'Kindly tell me what this matter of royal armorers "'fashioning crude, cold iron cages is all about?' Las, her father said jovially, "'indicating the hilltop and giving Donath a nod "'to tell him to send the Poles' crew on its way. "'We're going to catch ourselves a Gazneth, "'and if need be, trade its freedom in exchange "'for our lost royal magician.' Oh, Alasair replied with deceptive mildness, just like that. Well, now that you've told me, I'm sure everything's going to go off without a hitch. It certainly sounds plausible enough, hmm? Azun lifted an eyebrow at her tone, murmured something under his breath that might have been just like your mother, and swung around to point back behind them. Surely you've had enough of fleeing from floods of orcs? "'Gods, yes!' Alasir growled as fervently as any purple dragon veteran, sick of long marches, and given a chance at sitting idle instead, might. "'Well, with Donna's reinforcements guarding our flanks, we're going to turn around and strike right back at them. They've been howling at our heels for long enough now, that they don't expect anything else from us except grim retreat.' We're giving them a despairing last stand right now, on the other side of that last hill behind us. The moment that tent is up, we're going to break ranks and run back here. They'll pour after us to enjoy the rout and slaughter, and we'll send Dornith's troops looping out and around them like a long arm, taking them from behind while the war wizards, Donath's also brought with him, hurls spells at them from the tent. So the slaughterers will become the slaughtered, Alasair said calmly. I'm with you so far. Just how, exactly, are we to deal with the Gazness who'll inevitably come soaring in at us when we start this hurling of spells? Wizards will cast visible defensive magics, harmless fairy fires, on the tent, the king told her. Then scuttle inside when the Gazness swoop down. The cage will be lined up with a tent mouth, and purple dragons will be standing inside with weapons of cold iron raised and ready to transfix any Gazneth bursting in. 
Alice Hare shook her head, then suddenly shrugged and grinned. In other words, you're just pitching in, running wild, and hoping, she said. Well, why not? We've tried everything else. I knew you'd be ready for a little striking back, her father replied, because, by all the sheep who've ever drunk from the wyvern water, I certainly am. Three young war wizards stood in the dark mouth of the tent on the hill, their faces tight and pale with fear. Fireballs and lightning bolts streamed from their hands, flashing into the heart of the howling orcs surging up the slope, then recoiling from the line of hard-thrusting purple dragon spearmen. Orc bodies arched in agony, or were flung broken through the air, only to be caught in the blast of the next spell and hurled anew. It took only the space of a few breaths for the first of the expected gasness to streak in, flying low and hard from the south. "'Gods above, but they're fast,' Alisair murmured at the king's shoulder. She glanced over at the three war wizards, Storm Shoulder, Gondolon, and Starlagger, that was his name, Mavalar Starlagger, and saw them to a man, pale-faced and trembling with fear. "'Are you sure our war wizards are up to this?' Azun followed her quizzical glance in time to see one of the young mages convulsively lose his last meal onto the ground. The king lifted his shoulders in a shrug and said, "'We all have to face our first battle some time, and I can't hold the realm if only old, grizzled veterans know how to stand and fight for Cormir.' "'Old, grizzled veterans?' "'Like the king?' Alisair said with a smile. "'Exactly,' Azun snarled back and sprang forward. "'Here comes a bolder bird now!' The second Gazna to appear over the hilltop wasted no time in the circling and shrieking that its fellow was engaged in. Without pause it swooped at the tent. One war wizard moaned in fear and fell over his nearest fellow mage in his haste to escape— causing them both to topple over into the tent. The third one stood desperately, trying to roll them out of the way, as the Gazneth, a large, powerful one with a bald head and the shoulders of a large and imposing man, plunged down at it. With seconds to spare, war wizard Lawrider Gondolon got his two companions out of the way and threw himself over their bodies into the dim interior of the tent. The Gazneth raced in behind them like a laughing bolt of black lightning, whose swift flight ended in a crash of splintering bones and reluctantly rolling cage that shook the entire hilltop. A sword lord threw the slide that locked the cage, thrust the two iron spikes that would hold it from moving into place, and waved forward the spearmen whose weapons would keep the captured Gazneth away from them. Well, Majesty, the Sword Lord said. You've got your caged bird, faster and cleaner than I'd feared it had come to us, too. And now? The king shrugged and said, We only have the one cage. He looked out over the tumult of bloody battle, where purple dragons were slowly advancing to meet each other, hacking down the orcs trapped between them, then up at the three by now, Gazneths who were swooping down to claw off a head here and rake open a face there. Enough, he said. Doneth, is the senior war wizard ready? Majesty, he is, the warden replied, and gave a chopping hand signal to a man the Oberskiers couldn't see. A long moment later, a small foundry of cold iron daggers, arrowheads, and spear points appeared as a mid-air cloud above the nearest swooping gazneth and fell on it like pelting rain. Its shriek was raw and deafening as it fell helplessly into the heart of the hacking fray. Long before it rose, flying raggedly, and fled low over the raging battle, the other two gazneths had flown away. "'That worked well,' Alisair said admiringly. "'Now all we have to do is hold off another few thousand orcs "'while you go and horse-trade with a wounded, furious Gazneth. "'Blood of Tempest, look at them coming down the hills. "'How can any orc tribe feed so many mouths?' 
Horse trade indeed, the king said with a smile. By the looks of him, we've landed the worst of them after Baldivar, too. It'll be Luthax, I've no doubt, once second only to Amadehast, among the war wizards of his day. Alasair shook her head ruefully and said, You never did believe in doing things the easy way, did you? Azun's grinning reply was lost in the fresh howls of orcs, charging furiously up the hill on all sides. 5. The rat bites had withered to little red puckers, leaving Tanalasta's pale breasts and belly strewn with star-shaped scars and oozing abscesses. Though her head throbbed and her joints ached with the remnant of a fever, she felt remarkably alert and rested, and, finally, safe. Auden Foley, looking pale and battered but alive, sat at the edge of her bed. His eyes were closed in concentration, and a healing hand was pressed over her womb. The corridors outside her chambers were guarded by an entire troop of dragoneers. Two war wizards sat in her anteroom, just a short yell away. Even her windows had been double secured, being both barred by iron and sealed with mortar and stone. Auden opened his eyes, but left his hand pressed to Tanalasta's naked abdomen. She could feel the goddess's mending heat flowing into her womb, making her loins tingle and ache in a way that was not entirely unfamiliar and a little bit embarrassing. Tanalasta let the sensations wash over her and tried to accept what she felt with no shame. Such stirrings were a gift from Chontia, and private though they were, no worshipper of the Great Mother should deny them. By the time the High Harvest Master's gaze finally drifted toward Tonalasa's face, she could bear the suspense no longer. What of the child, Auden? The princess found it difficult to speak, though a healer had obviously worked his magic on her broken jaw. It was sore, stiff, and bound by a silken scarf. Has it been injured? Auden's eyes flickered away before answering. You have had no pain or bleeding? Icy fingers of panic began to work up through Tonalas's chest. What's wrong? We don't know that anything is, Auden said. He did not remove his hand from Tonalas's abdomen. It's only a question. One you must know I can't answer. Tonalasta had awakened only a short time earlier, but the first thing she had done was send for Auden. How long have I been asleep? Half a ten day, or so, they tell me. Auden raised his free hand and absent-mindedly rubbed the cloth over his own wound. I awoke only yesterday myself. And a lavender? In the palace library. Seabert and Othram are also here, but I'm afraid the others— He shook his head, then said— the orcs came in too fast. Tanalasa closed her eyes. May their bodies feed the land and their souls blossom again, she whispered. The goddess will tend them. Auden clasped her arm. They were brave men. That they were. Tanalasta glanced down between her bare breasts to the Harvest Master's other hand, still pouring its healing warmth into her womb, and asked, "'Now, what of the child? I trust you are not just enjoying yourself?' The joke drew a forced smile from the normally jovial priest. "'With all those guards out there, I think not.' He glanced toward the anteroom door, then shook his head and told her, the truth is, I have no way of knowing. I could ask the royal healers if there have been any signs, but they'd know at once my reason for asking. Tanalasta considered this, then shook her head. Let's avoid that. We need no rumors sweeping the realm, at least not until the nobles have accepted that I am married. And to whom? Auden added pointedly. 
Tonalasta flashed him a frown of irritation, one of those rare glowers she reserved for the few people who would not interpret them as some subtle message by which whole families were made and unmade. Would knowing the signs make any difference to the child? Auden thought for a moment, then shook his head. Either you are still with child or you aren't, he said simply. If you are... All we can do is keep pouring Chontia's blessings into your womb and pray they are enough to counter the corrupting influences of your association with the Gazneth. Would you please call it a fight? Tanalasa asked dryly. Association makes it sound like we were trysting. Auden winced at her objection, but the anteroom door banged open before he could apologize. Jerking her bedgown down over her breasts, Tanalasa looked over with an angry rebuke on her tongue and found her mother striding into the room. Queen Philfaerel was, as always, strikingly beautiful. Tresses of honey-blonde hair streamed behind her, and blue eyes glared at Auden's hand, which continued to rest over Tanalasta's womb. If the Harvest Master felt any embarrassment, his face did not betray it. Mother, Tanalasta mumbled, so surprised that she strained her aching jaw. You might have had someone announce you. Phil Pharaoh continued toward the bed, her stride growing more assertive and forceful. I came as soon as I heard you had awakened. She stopped at the base of the bed and continued to glare at Alden's hand. I'm glad to see you feeling so well. Tanalasta felt the heat rising to her cheeks, but took her cue from Alden and refused to take the bait. To be truthful, I'm not quite sure how I feel. She waved at Alden and said, You remember Harvest Master Foley? How could I forget? The expression in Philfaerel's eyes would have wilted a lesser man, but Auden merely stood and bowed without removing his hand from Tanalasta's abdomen. As radiant as ever, Your Majesty. Having failed to intimidate Auden, Philfaerel turned to Tanalasta and said, A bit old for you, don't you think? That is hardly to the point, mother, said Tanalasta. Harvest Master Foley is tending to my health, as I am sure you know. Phil Pharaoh's expression remained icy. The royal healers are not to your satisfaction? I prefer Auden. Though her feelings were fast growing as icy as her mother's glare, Tanalasta forced herself to smile. Surely even a princess may choose who lays hands on her own body without the matter becoming the latest political crisis? A hint of shame flashed through Phil Pharaoh's eyes, but she quickly regained control of her expression. In a slightly warmer voice, she said, I suppose that is hardly too much to ask, and I really did not come here to discuss the matter of your royal temple anyway. She turned to Auden and graced him with a queenly smile. So, how does our patient fare? I wasn't aware that she had suffered any injuries so far. South. She is a hale woman, Majesty. Auden raised a querying eyebrow at Tanalasta, ever so slightly, and received the merest shake of a head in response, then continued without missing a beat. She had some pain in her intestines, but I'm sure it is merely a matter of lying in bed too long. Nothing a long walk won't cure. As subtle as the signals between Tonalasta and Auden had been, they did not escape Philfaerel's notice. Her queenly smile grew cold enough to freeze a bonfire. A walk, you say? the queen asked. Your Chontian remedies are certainly more forward than those of our royal healers. They have warned me not to let her leave bed for the next ten day. A ten day? Tanalasta pushed herself up. Not on there. Auden motioned her back down and said, The royal healers have not had occasion to observe the princess as closely as I over the past year. Trust me. 
The exercise will do her more good. I trust you, said Tonalasta. That's all that matters. Thankfully, Alden's healing hand finally cooled against her skin. He withdrew it, allowing her to lower her bedgown the rest of the way. Filfayrol continued to glare at the priest so icily that even he began to grow uncomfortable. He turned to Tonalasta and said, "'If you are feeling well enough, perhaps I will withdraw and see to my own wounds.' "'Of course, Auden, and thank you for everything.' Auden bowed to her and the queen, then left. As soon as the anteroom door closed, the queen's attitude softened. She took the priest's place on the edge of the bed. "'I really didn't mean to intrude, my dear.' She took Tonalasta's hand. "'It's just that when I heard you were awake, I couldn't wait a moment longer to apologize. "'Apologize?' Tonalasta regarded her mother warily, as surprised now as at their parting less than two months earlier, when the queen had berated her so ferociously for wanting to establish the royal temple of Chontia. "'Truly?' Tonalasta's astonishment seemed to take Phil Pharaoh aback. The queen looked confused for a moment, then let slip an uncharacteristic snort of laughter. "'Not about the temple, my dear. You're still going to have to forget that idea before your father will feel comfortable dying and leaving the throne to you.' Phil Pharaoh tried a diplomatic smile and saw it fail, but continued unabashed. What I am sorry about is the way I handled you. Handled me, mother? Yes, Tanalasta, handled you. Filfaro's voice had grown stern. We are both women of the palace, and the time has come to acknowledge that. It doesn't mean that we don't love each other, or Azun and Alisair, or even Vanji, Tanalasta added. The queen's eyes darkened noticeably. But she added, "'Even Vanger de Hast, and he is the worst handler of any of us. We all have our own aims that inevitably set us against each other, and the only way to stay a family is to acknowledge the fact.' Tonalasta regarded her mother as though meeting her for the first time. "'All right. So what I am sorry about is misjudging you. I was frightened by the change in you after Huthduth, and I thought you weren't ready to be queen.' Phil Pharaoh paused to blink away the tears welling in her eyes, then continued, "'I thought you never would be, and I told your father to name Alisair in your place. I did everything I could to persuade him, but Vanger de Hast wouldn't have it.' "'Vanger de Hast?' Tonalasta began to wonder what her mother was playing at. Vanger de Hast had made a living hell of her life over the last year, constantly trying to bully her into becoming the kind of queen he expected to sit on the throne of Cormier. Finally, the situation had grown so bad that Tonalasta had rebelled and told him to take what she was or start bullying Alisair into shape. "'You aren't saying that just because he's gone, are you?' No, Phil Pharaoh said. She shook her head vehemently, and now the tears did begin to spill out of her eyes. It's the truth. He never doubted you, but I did. I apologize. Don't, Tonalasta said. There's no need to apologize. There was at least one time when you were right. When Gaspar and Onadar tried to poison father, I couldn't have been less ready. I'm far from sure if I am now, but that hardly matters at the moment. With the gasness running loose, Cormier is on the verge of disaster. It is no longer on the verge, I fear. Phil Pharaoh wiped her eyes dry, then rose to her feet, assuming her familiar regal air. The blight has destroyed every crop in the north, and it's working its way south by the day. There are wildfires everywhere, whole villages are going mad, and others are dying of the plague. The orcs have massed in the north, and— And the seven scourges are upon us, said Tanalasta. Blight, madness, war, pestilence, fire, swarms. That's only six. The seventh is 
soon to come, and when he does, out come the armies of the dead and the legions of the devil made by itself, till Pharaoh finished, quoting Alondo's ancient prophecy. What then? Tanalasa could only shake her head. We can't let it come to that. She threw her covers back and swung her legs out of bed, then looked toward the anteroom door and barked, Corvar? Filfarel took Tanalasa's arm. What are you doing? I did something in Goblin Mountain that weakened Xanthan, she explained, all but dragging her mother to the wardrobe. It may be that I've stumbled onto something. What? Filfarel asked. I don't know yet. It's going to take some research. Tanalasta pulled her bedgown off and tossed it aside, then flung the wardrobe open and discovered it to be empty. The anteroom door slammed open, and Corvar Rallyhorn, the lionar of her guards, burst into the room with a dozen men at his back. They all skidded to a halt, then nearly fell over each other in their rush to avert their eyes and retreat. I, I b beg your forgiveness, princess, stammered Corvar. We thought you called. I did. Phil Pharaoh snatched the bedgown off the floor and thrust it at Tanalasta. Find Alafandar and tell him to meet me in the library, Tanalasta said, draping the bedgown more or less over her breasts. And send me something to wear. As you command, princess. Corvar did his best to escape the room without looking at Tanalasta. As the door shut, Filfairil turned to her daughter and said, "'My, you have changed.' Tanalasta smiled and draped her arm over her mother's shoulder. "'And you have not seen half of it. Which reminds me, I have only heard half the news. What a father!' "'And Donath, perhaps?' Tanalasta rolled her eyes. "'If you must. But I warn you, I have less reason than ever to interest myself in the good warden. What a pity! You'd make such a handsome couple. Though the pout Phil Pharaoh feigned was playful, there was a serious element to it. The queen and king had yet to hear of Tanalasta's marriage to Rowan Cormeril, or her pregnancy. Phil Pharaoh raised her hands as though to forestall her daughter's ire. I'm not goading. Only handling, perhaps? Perhaps, Filfaro smiled briefly, then grew more serious. The last I heard, your father and Alasair— Alasair? Tanalasta gasped. Then she is safe? Yes, Filfaro said. Your father came across her in the Stonelands. As I was saying, they were to meet Donath and his army in Nall Pass— was Alasair alone? Tanalasta demanded. After Vangelahast's disappearance at the Battle of the Farsi Marsh, Rowan Cormeril had somehow come into possession of the royal magician's horse and set off to warn King Azun about the Gaznes. Unfortunately, Tanalasta and Alasair had come across his trail a few days later, heading north into the Stonelands for some reason they could not understand. Alasair had set out alone to track Rowan down, and that had been the last Tanalasta heard of either one. Did she find Vangerdehast's horse? As a matter of fact, Alasair did send a message for you. How silly of me to forget. The queen's sly smile made clear that she had not forgotten. She said to tell you, The king has Cadmus, but your favorite scout is still on the prowl. Tanalasta retreated to the bed and sank down, suddenly feeling weary and weak. The queen came and pulled the cover up around her shoulders. Tanalasta, I'm sorry, she said. I had no idea this would upset you. It shouldn't, I suppose, Tanalasta replied. The mountains have grown so dangerous, and I was hoping for something a little more certain. Phil Pharaoh leaned down and embraced her daughter. I know. If I could even count the times I have wondered after your father's safety, and often as not he was off with the daughter of some minor noble. Tanalasta shook her head. Rowan wouldn't do that, even if there were noble daughters in the Stonelands. Rowan? 
Tilferil stood up again and frowned. The only scout named Rowan I know is Rowan Cormeril. Tanalasta nodded, then patted the bed beside her. You'd better sit down, mother. I have something to tell you. Six. They'll draw off now, Alasair said with some satisfaction, and wait for the dark. Just make sure we've gathered brush enough for a good big ring of fires. The royal army stood wearily leaning on well-used swords atop three hilltops somewhere in the northern marches of the realm. They watched orcs beyond counting, growl and hiss and snarl their way down the hillsides, leaving their dead heaped in spilled gore behind them. The fray had been long and bloody, the Tuskers rightly not believing that such a paltry few humans could stand their ground, even high ground, against charge after charge of tested and eager warrior orcs. The slaughter had been frightful, awing even gray-haired veterans among the purple dragons. If the orcs had been able to muster just a little more boldness— they might have forced their way past tired human sword-arms and cleared the hilltops of human life, reaping a king and a princess among their kills. The Gazneth had exhorted them with harsh, orcish cries and barked orders, shaking its iron cage in its eager fury, but to no avail. The attacking orcs, so far as Alasair's experienced eye could tell, had mounted no special effort to reach the imprisoned creature. In the eerie silence that had fallen on the heels of the retreating orcs, the steel princess and her father watched the first cautious forays of dragon ears and noble blades move out to gather brush, then turned to face each other. "'Time to learn what we can of the fate of Vangelahast,' Azun muttered, taking care to turn his shoulder between his lips and the watching Gazneth. Do you still have the tracing dust Vanji gave you to find wayward, rebellious princesses? Alasair asked, arching an eyebrow. Azun nodded and said, I'd not forgotten it. I yet retain the fire-fending magic he laid upon me, too. Alasair's eyes fell to the wands hanging from her father's belt and settled on a certain one marked with a red rune. "'Bait?' she asked simply, and the king nodded again. "'Let's be about it,' he said tersely, and beckoned a lancelord to his side to deliver the orders for everyone to stand back, a good twenty paces back, from the cage.' The Gazneth laughed harshly, as the Cremerians backed warily away, not sheathing their blades or taking their eyes off it for long. The deep, rumbling laughter grew as the two Oberskiers strode forward to approach it. "'Made bold by your iron bars? Paltry excuse for a king?' "'Well met, Luthax,' Zoon replied evenly. "'Found your way out yet?' The Gazneth, who had once been the second most powerful, and, in a brief, dark moment, perhaps the most powerful, war-wizard in Cormir, hissed and rattled long talons along the bars. He could draw those talons right back into his fingers, Alasair noted, taking care to keep just out of reach of those corded black arms. "'Seeking to supplant the rightful royal magician of today?' the king continued, almost playfully. Luthax threw back his bald head and laughed, the broken fringe of beard around his jaw, giving him a truly bestial appearance. "'Is that fool's fate your most pressing concern? Oh, blind king, you've far worse troubles to worry about right now. There's the survival of your throne and kingdom, for instance.' The Gazneth leered at Alasair through the bars and asked, "'How much for this she-wolf, Azun? I have need of a spirited apprentice, or a breeding wench for the steed I plan to birth wrapped in truly powerful spells. Care to try your best mages against me?' "'Not particularly,' Azun said, strolling around the cage with a humorless half-smile flickering at the edges of his mouth. 
My duty is to preserve the lives and well-being of my subjects as much as I can, even subjects such as you, not throw them away in pointless spell-hurlings. I'm not your subject, Luthag spat. Go find Vangerdehast, if it's the fawning kisses of tame, groveling wizards you want. And just where would I find him? Oh, no, Luthax taunted. You must be used to crossing verbal swords with very dull-witted courtiers, Azun. Think you to worm one word out of me that I don't care to let fall? I'm Luthax, a mage the likes of whom you've never seen, and can't, brute wits that you are, even hope to understand. Cormir seems infested with gasnets just now, doesn't it? Enough of us, more than enough of us, to hold one feeble old venture to hast, where neither you nor any other man will ever find him. Think you so? the king replied softly. The royal magician's magic has already told me otherwise. Otherwise? The hold of a gazneth, Azun said casually, seems far less sure than at least one gazneth presumes it to be. Certainly less powerful than these crude iron bars. I wonder, now, just how much more of the vaunted powers of gazneth are mere bluff and arrogance. The dark creature in the cage roared in fury and laid hold of the bars, shoulders rippling. The cage shook with its straining, but the bars held fast, and the creature hissed and snatched its hands away, holding them curled and trembling as if it had been burned. "'Starved for magic?' the king of Cormir murmured. Azun waited until the Gaznes' angry eyes were fixed on his, then brought into view the wand he'd drawn from his belt, and held hidden behind his back as the Gaznes vainly tried to tear apart its prison. "'I am prepared to make a little trade.' He stepped back and watched the Gaznath that had been Luthax struggle with rage, then several other emotions in turn, before he wheeled and asked in a deep rumble, what was once more calm and cunning. A trade of what for what? This untrapped operating wand of fireballs. Azun paused, watching the Gaznath's fiery eyes flicker. For complete and accurate identification, that I can understand and deem sufficient as to the wizard Vangelahast's whereabouts, and any traps or guardians upon him, or on the way to reaching him. Luthax seemed to freeze, sitting hunched in silent thought for a time that stretched longer than most men would have found comfortable. But the Gazneth and the king might have been two statues, so patient and still did they both remain. The bald head in the cage suddenly stirred, and its owner rumbled, "'You have a trade, king. Approach!' Azun took a step closer to the cage, then halted with a smile, holding out the wand crosswise. Both he and it were still well outside the Gazneth's reach." Luthax's eyes flickered again, but he said merely, "'Some seven hills southeast of yonder ridge is an abandoned stead, a house dug into a hillside, a privy, and a collapsed barn. There is a well between the house and the barn, and your prized wizard is at the bottom of it, yoked and weighted, wet but safe. He cannot speak, see?' or move his hands, and from his shoulders rise two rings that a gazneth, or you, with rope and hooks and a little patience, can draw him up by. He is well, if you'll excuse the pun, but probably far from amused. No traps? None, unless you consider the uncovered, unmarked well-hole a trap— I don't suppose a wizard would be improved by having a purple dragon in full battle armor crash down on top of him. This is all I should know. By our bargain, all. Give me the wand, if kings yet have honor. 
Kings still do, Azun told him dryly, and drew out the locking pins that held the sliding hatch lock shut. He threw back the heavy hatch with surprising strength for a lone man of his age, and hurled the wand into the cage. The gazneth snatched it out of the air, howled in glee, and boiled up into the air like a serpent striking at the sun. His wings beat in a ragged blur as blue lightning raged around the wand, became a burst of light, and sank back into Luthax's now empty hands as he spat. "'I've not forgotten all my old spells,' Luthax said. "'Lose a wand and gain a meteor swarm.' Balls of fire raced out from the gazness mouth, followed by bellows of wild laughter straight at the king. Azun stood his ground, shouting, "'Everyone, get back and get down!' On the heels of Azun's cry, the hilltop exploded in flames. Hooting with laughter, the gazneth tumbled backward through the air, flapping his wings exultantly. "'A little warmer than you expected, Azun? Huh? <laughs> what an idiot! What a fool! This was the best the Oberskiers could give the realm!' The gazneth circled the blazing hilltop once, roaring with laughter as the warriors below cowered away from him with their vainly upthrust swords bristling like blades of grass. Luthax flew away. There were gasps of awe from the warriors as the king of Cormir strode out of the raging flames, apparently unharmed, and snapped at the nearest sword lord. Waste no time searching for fictitious wells or abandoned steads. A quarry I once lost a horse in lies seven hills southeast of yonder ridge. Whither then, Majesty? Azun Oberskir pointed at the gazneth in the distance. Clever and arrogant war wizards gone bad, maybe, but they aren't quite confident enough not to check on their captives once the seed of doubt is planted. He smiled a tight smile and reached for the hilt of his ready sword. 7. Vangerdehast crested the last flight of crooked stairs in the great goblin palace, and knew he had finally, certainly, lost his mind. The grand corridor was steeped in a savory, rich aroma, the same savory aroma that had drawn him into the murky warrens of the palace in the first place. A strange chorus of chittering voices echoed down the corridor from the left, where the expanse of dark wall was broken by a cockeyed square of yellow light. The voices were entirely alien to him, but the odor he recognized, rabbit, roast rabbit. He plucked one of his eyelashes and encased it in a small wad of gum Arabic from his pocket, then whispered the incantation of his invisibility spell. His hand vanished from sight, leaving only a halo of light emanating from his unseen commander's ring. He slipped the ring off, then on again, suspending its magic radiance, and crept down the grand corridor. Though the hallway was the largest he had seen inside any goblin building, he still had to crouch to almost half his height. Grand goblin architecture expressed its majesty in the horizontal and more or less ignored the vertical. As Vangerdehast neared the yellow light, it resolved itself into a lopsided doorway with one side taller than the other and neither perpendicular to the floor. He began to pick out distinct speakers among the chittering voices, and the aroma grew deliciously, irresistibly overpowering. He had not been conscious of his hunger as such a palpable force for some time, but the smell of food, or the illusion of the smell, filled his mouth with saliva and made his stomach rumble. Knowing the despair that would come over him when he rounded the corner and found an empty room, he almost turned back. His belt was wrapped around him almost double now, and he suffered regular blackouts and periods of weakness so severe he could not stand. Discovering this wonderful aroma to be mere illusion might be enough to kill him. But, of course, 
Vajra Hast did not turn back. The smell drew him on, and the sound, also, of voices other than his own, no matter how strange and alien. Soon he stood hunched over the little door, craning his neck around to peer under the sill at a candle-lit table laden with the steaming carcasses of ten plump skunks and several dozen crows. They certainly looked real enough. The skunks had been fully dressed and spit-roasted, then served on their own fur. The birds had been prepared just as elegantly, having been baked en feather, with shelled walnuts in their beaks and silver root grubs in their eye sockets. Vangerdehast wondered what kind of sick trick his mind was playing. At any other time, the mere sight of such a banquet would have disgusted him to the point of illness. Now it made his hands tremble and his mouth water. Squatting on their haunches, around the table, were more than thirty goblins, well-dressed in brightly colored loincloths and pale tunics girded with leather sword belts. Rather husky and short for their race, they stood at most three feet tall. They were also the wrong color. The eyes and hides of most goblins ranged in hue from yellow to red, but these had pallid green skin and pale blue eyes the color of Queen Filfarel's. To Vegeta Hast's amazement, the goblins' manners were as eloquent as the creatures themselves were strange. A dozen white-cloaked waiters stood stationed around the table at equal intervals, using bronze carving utensils to cut the meat into bite-sized chunks. Whenever a diner chittered at one of the servers, the server would flip a tasty morsel in its direction, which the creature then endeavored to catch by moving its open mouth beneath the food. There seemed to be something of an art to process, with diners being careful to remain on their haunches and keep their hands tucked securely behind their knees until the food arrived. Whenever a guest caught a morsel that had been flipped a particularly long distance, behind the back, or through a flickering candle flame, the others would break into a burst of appreciative hissing. Only once did Vangita Hast see a diner miss, and the others quietly averted their eyes while the embarrassed goblin pressed its face down to snap the morsel off the dirty floor. So polite were the goblins that Vangita Hast suspected he might win a dinner invitation simply by casting a comprehend languages spell and introducing himself. With a somewhat smaller mouth than the hosts, however, he suspected his manners would not measure up to their standards, and he really did not fancy eating his crow off the floor. In fact, he had never liked the idea of eating crow at all, and he was not about to start now, not when there was tasty, whole-roasted, mephitis mephitis to be had instead. Vangita Hast raised an invisible hand toward the nearest skunk, then turned his palm up and made a lifting motion. As he whispered his incantation, a soft rustle sounded from the head of the great staircase. He spun around and thought he glimpsed a pair of pearly dots at the mouth of the corridor. The goblins broke into a cacophony of astonished chitters and alarmed snarls. He looked back into the banquet hall and found his skunk, hovering just above his invisible hand, filling his nostrils with an aroma that— if it was a hallucination, was at least the sweetest hallucination he had ever experienced. The goblins were staring at the floating skunk less in fear than wide-eyed amazement, as though waiting for the fang-filled mouth of some unseen god to materialize out of the darkness and gulp the thing down whole. Happy to oblige them in the best way possible, Vangita Hast pulled his invisible dagger from its sheath and cut a morsel off the carcass, then popped it into his mouth. It certainly tasted real. In fact, he could not remember ever before enjoying a piece of meat so much, not even from the kitchens of Suzale Palace. The banquet room erupted into a tumult of chattering and chiming as the goblins jumped up and began drawing little iron swords from their little bronze scabbards. Vangita Hast reached into his pocket and tossed a pinch of diamond dust into the doorway, booming out an incantation even as they turned to rush him. 
a shimmering curtain of force flickered into existence across the cockeyed portal. The first goblins slammed into it at a dead sprint and bounced back into their companions. Vangidahast broke a length of rib bone off the skunk carcass, then illuminated it with a quick spell of light and tossed it down the corridor. A tall, man-like silhouette ducked quietly down the great staircase, and a chill ran down the wizard's spine. The thing looked far too robust and human to be Xanthan, but there had been no hint of a tunic or cloak covering the smooth outline of its shoulders, and the wizard was all too certain of what that meant. Gazness could not wear clothes, for their bodies caused fabric to rot almost instantly. The skunk suddenly lost its taste, but Vangertahast forced himself to cut another piece and eat it. He was going to need his strength. The goblins hurled themselves at the wall of force for only a few moments before concluding they could not get at their invisible thief through the doorway. They posted four guards in front of the portal and retreated to their table, then fell into a heated discussion. Keeping a watchful eye in both directions, Vangertahast remained where he was and cast a spell to eavesdrop on their conversation. With a gazneth lurking somewhere in the palace, he did not want to move until he had eaten his fill and recovered some of his energy. "'This thief we must find,' rasped one goblin, a particularly broad fellow in a crimson loincloth. "'The grod palace he must not have the run of. To Vangidahast's great dismay, it sounded to him as though the goblins were speaking some corrupted dialect of the same ancient elvish in which Nalavara had spoken her name. "'One chill it is only,' said another. "'Let the sneak have it and choke. Later we will smell him out.' "'Nay, later there will be more.' This speaker seemed to be female, and the others remained respectfully silent when she spoke. Has the Iron One not spoken of these human things? If one is abided, a thousand come. We must smell him out before others follow, or the way of Cormenthor will we grod go. As Otka commands, the male who had spoken pointed toward a door in the back of the room. Gislan and Hardy, through the kitchen with your companies, and the alarm sound, Pepin and Roared at the wall with yours. With chilling efficiency, Pepin and Roared gathered twenty of the diners and began to chink at the powdery mortar in the walls. Gislan and Hardy took the rest and rushed off through the kitchen, leaving only Otka and the white-cloaked servers standing alone in the center of the banquet hall. Vangidahest had no idea whether Gislan and Hardy or Pepin and Roared or their subordinates were male or female. The only hint of their sexes he had been able to identify was their voices, and now they were too busy working to talk. Vangidahast managed to wolf down only half of the skunk before he heard the companies of Gislan and Hardy charging up the great staircase. Deciding this particular tribe of goblins was too efficient to toy with, he wrapped the remaining carcass in its fur and stuffed it inside his cloak, then cast a spell to help him see in the dark, and scuttled away down the corridor. At the first intersection, Vangidahast turned down a small side passage, circling toward a secondary staircase he had seen at the rear of the palace's great foyer. The skunk meat sat in his belly like lead, though he suspected this had more to do with the condition of his neglected stomach than the grod's skills as chefs. This particular tribe was unlike any he had ever seen before, being much more organized and, it made him shudder to think such a thing, civilized. His thoughts leaped to the forlorn keeps scattered throughout the goblin marches, but he could not see how the grod were related to those ancient structures, which had stood abandoned long before there was a Cormier. Of course, he did not see how he had failed to notice Otka and her band earlier and yet here they were in the Grand Goblin Palace. Both mysteries, he suspected, had more to do with Nalavar Othotoro the Red than he would have liked. When Vangelahast finally started down the final passage toward the stairs, he was dismayed to find a reddish, man-like silhouette crouching atop the landing.
The head and body remained distinctly human, but the thing's pearly gaze shone with the same faint light the wizard had seen in the eyes of Xanthan Cormeril and the other Gaznes. Moreover, the figure was definitely naked, and he was peering across the foyer toward the skunk bone Van Jutahast had illuminated earlier. Though only a few minutes had passed since the spell was cast, all that remained of the magic was a faint yellow aura. Van Jutahast cursed silently, then burped under his breath, and retreated back up the corridor. He was already feeling stronger, but not yet strong enough to battle a Gazneth. It would be better to take his chances with the goblins. He had scuttled nearly to the front of the palace when the soft hiss of sniffing goblins sounded around the next corner. Quietly, he retreated to the previous corner and started up another passage. This corridor was the smallest yet. So cramped, he had to crawl on hands and knees. Had his life depended on it, he could not have turned around. The first goblins, silent save for the snuffle of their noses, passed the corner behind him. When none of them sounded the alarm, Vanger de Hast breathed a silent sigh of relief and kneeled on his haunches, peering back beneath an arm to watch the rest of the group pass. The sigh came too soon. The line had almost passed when a goblin stopped and squinted into the cramped passage, then chittered in excitement. With a sinking feeling, Vanger de Hast dropped a shoulder and craned his neck to look down along his back. Where he should have seen nothing but darkness, he glimpsed a faint patch of blue. Like all magic he cast in the city of the Grod, his spell of invisibility was wearing off prematurely. Vanger de Hast started to reach for a fire wand, then had a terrible thought. If his magic was not lasting as long as it should, and it was not, perhaps that meant something was draining it. If that something was what he feared— the last thing he wanted was to start spraying magic bolts around like arrows. Deciding his brain was starting to work again now, that he had something in his stomach, he shoved the wand back in its sleeve and scurried down the passage as fast as his hands and knees would carry him. The goblins quickly began to close the gap. Given the choice of being spitted on an iron sword or using another small bit of magic, the wizard allowed himself a single wall of stone. The goblins hit the barrier at a sprint, then bounced away into the murky warrens to find another route to their quarry. They must have known the labyrinth far better than Vanger de Hast. It was all he could do to reach the front of the palace and crawl out onto a tiny balcony before the little warriors caught up. The first one rushed out after him, nearly piercing a kidney, before the wizard hurled himself over the balustrade into the darkness. Vanger de Hast experienced a flash of pain as his weather cloak's magic triggered itself, and he began to flutter toward the ground as slowly as a feather. The wizard allowed himself to descend slowly, secure in the knowledge that there had been no time for the goblins to fetch crossbows. Then he felt his stomach rise as he began to fall faster. He grabbed the commander's ring on his finger and said, "'King's Light!' A sphere of purple light sprang up around Vanger de Hast, revealing the startling fact that he was not only picking up speed, he was drifting away from the Grod Palace. He twisted around to look toward the center plaza, and was even more startled to find Nalavara's huge eye rearing up before him, slowly blinking and still bearing a strong semblance to the dark basin it had been when Vanger de Hast arrived in this strange city. The spell failed entirely then. The wizard plummeted to the ground and hit hard, then rolled to his knees and found himself looking up at Nalavara's reptilian jaw. As he shook his head clear, the dragon pulled another two neck scales out of the ground, and Vanger Hast knew he had guessed right about what was happening to his magic. Shrew, he yelled, furious at being used in such a manner. I'll die in hell before I free you. As you like. Nalavara's voice seethed from her throat like hissing steam. But were I you, I would mind my wishes. Remember the ring. 
a terrifying chittering broke out in the entrance to the Grod Palace. Vangelahast looked up and saw a company of goblins starting to spill down the stairs. He hoisted himself to his feet, but when he turned to run, his ribs were too sore and his legs too weary. Even strong and fresh, you are too old for that, Nalavara chuckled. She raised her head far above, her horns gouging great tufts of spongy substance out of the city's dark ceiling. You have only the choices I give. Die by the hands of my goblins, or take up their iron crown and rule in my name. Vangedahast glanced up toward the palace and saw how right Nalavara was. The leading goblins were already halfway down the stairs, with more than a hundred of their fellows close behind. It would have been an easy matter for a wizard of his power to slay them all, of course, but only with a lot of magic, and he could see for himself what that would mean to Nalavara. The dragon's head was already free, and every spell he cast only liberated more of her. Better to die, then save that the goblins would capture his magic and no doubt turn it over to Nalavara, all of the wands, rings, clasps, and amulets he carried hidden inside his secret pockets, not to mention the weather cloak itself, and even his tiny traveling spell book, which relied on magic of its own to enlarge itself whenever he needed to read it. Dying would be worse than fighting. Dying would instantly give her all the magic she needed to free herself. Vangedahast did not even consider the Iron Crown, of course. Quite aside from any mystic powers Nalavara might have instilled into the circlet, to don the crown would be to declare himself a subject of the dragon herself, and he knew better than to think she would lack the means to enforce his liege duties. That left him with only one choice— the goblins reached the bottom of the palace stairs and started across the plaza. Vangedahast pulled a dove's feather from his cloak and tossed it into the air. "'This is it,' he swore, spewing out the incantation of a flying spell. "'This is the last magic you get from me.'" 8. "'Are you hurt, Your Majesty?' Several warriors growled in rough unison, charging forward with swords raised. Azun gave them a mirthless smile and said, "'Not unless my men refuse to follow me. Lass, have you chosen?' "'These who stand with me,' Alisair replied, spreading her hands to indicate a burly sword-lord, a lance-lord, a war-wizard, a dozen or so noble blades and dragoneers, and the lords Brayer Winter and Tolan. "'We've left a command here in the field?' the king of Cormir asked, indicating the army spread out around them. Alisair gave her father what some were wont to call a dirty look. Zoon grinned openly before turning his head to watch the Gazneth, who'd once been a lord among war wizards, streak away into the sky. "'Then let us be away,' he said calmly. "'You go to try to recapture the escaped Darkwings?' a sword captain asked excitedly. "'Take me!' the king spun around. "'No loyal warrior. A few only are needed for this foray.' The Gazneth did not escape. We let him go, that he might lead us to its lair. But he's gone, beyond our sight. The royal magician gifted me with a magical trick, the king explained, raising his voice so that many could hear. It's a dust I used to taint that which the Gazneth snatched. I can trace it for some days, which I hope will not be needed. Expect our return forthwith." But do not hesitate to move on from here if battle demands it. We go. Without further ado, the small force went, shaping itself around the king like a gigantic wary shield. Azun seemed sure of the Gaznes direction and led them without pause over a hill into a place of stony slopes. Think you there are orcs ahead? 
a purple dragon growled to his companion. Undoubtedly, that veteran warrior replied, hefting his sword. In fact, I'm counting on it. Why is it, Lance Lord Rattlesar inquired of the world at large, that so much of fighting consists of hurrying through the wilder lands, chasing something that's well beyond the ends of our swords, and possibly beyond our powers to slay. That's not just fighting, warrior, the war wizard told him quietly. That's life. Some stealthy things that might have been orcs scurried out from behind rocks and away as the king led his small strike force over several hills into an area where the land was riddled with breakneck gullies and rock outcrops cloaked in stunted trees. They were probably only a few miles from the main army, but they might as well have been several kingdoms away, in land that, save for the occasional sheep's skull, looked like men had never set foot on it. A shrill cry rang out from a ridge ahead as they struggled up a thorny slope to a knife-edged crest. "'A sentinel,' Alasair said warningly. "'Expect trouble ahead, and keep low. Beware of arrows.' Trouble was indeed waiting for them when they reached the ridge. A line of impassive, hulking orcs in black leather armor, with well-used axes and swords in their hands, stood ready. "'Strike, then withdraw at my horn-call,' Alasair snapped. Men looked to the king for guidance. He merely nodded and indicated the steel princess, so they inclined their heads to her and made ready their swords. The fray was brief and brutal, the king's men keeping close together so that two or three of them could face, and swiftly fell, a single orc. With the safety of both the king and a royal heir at stake, there was no fairness to hold to. Two dragon ears fell before Alasair sounded her horn, and the panting Cormyrians drew back, leaving behind twice their number of twitching or motionless orcs to the flies. "'Did you see?' the Lancelord gasped. "'Not yet,' the Steel Princess snapped. "'But I'm watching. Look there.' A dozen orcs, no more, came up the hill to join the few survivors along the ridge. "'If there are many more ahead, they want us to advance. I see no messengers hastening away to call any others.' The king nodded. "'So into the waiting jaws we'll go,' he said. "'I'm tired of wandering around these hills, waiting to be attacked by a foe who seems to dwell or rest nowhere. It's time, and past time, to lash out.' Heads nodded agreement, as the steel princess raised her hand and looked around. "'Ready all?' she asked. A breath or two later, she brought her hand, chopping down. "'Then forward!' The orcs seemed to melt away like smoke before the wind of their charge. The Gormerians broke through a small thicket onto a ridge that overlooked a small, deep bowl valley. Its depths held a mud castle, akin to the ones many in the force had seen before. "'Gods!' one of them swore. "'How is it that these things can be built in our own marches, and us not know?' "'A fortress!' another growled in disbelief. "'A bloody Tusker castle!' Orcs in plenty could be seen on the slopes of the valley, and on the spiraling ramparts of the mud tower, which was grey wherever it wasn't a sickly, fresh, dung colour. It rose untidily out of a muddy moat, rock rubble strewn around it. The tower might have been raised the day before, or might have been older than the king. "'Has anyone among us travelled these hills before?' Azun asked, almost absently. He was answered only by uneasy silence, until his daughter growled, "'What does it matter? We know what we have to do.' As if her words had been a signal, the gazneth that Luthax the war wizard had become circled the mud tower almost lazily, slipping out of one of the structure's many gaping arched windows to plunge back into another. It was almost a taunt. "'I've no love for these mud fortresses,' the king said flatly. "'But a lair we came seeking, and a lair we've found.' 
Let our swords strike for Cormir. For Cormir, came a ragged shout in reply. The small force trotted down into the valley. Steel rang on steel, and again the slaughter began. Nine. It was what had become a typical morning in the courtyard of the Arabellan Palace. Walls rumbled to the sound of passing plague wagons. The air was laced with smoke from the wildfires outside the city, and cobblestones rang to the bark and clang of drill sergeants training recruits to meet the orc menace in the north. Beyond the lowered portcullis, women begged gruel for hungry children, Madmen trumpeted the world's end, and clouds of flies droned over carts of food, spoiling faster than it could be shared. The scene was much the same across all of northern Cormir. If the Gaznes ran free much longer, Tanalasta felt sure, the entire kingdom north of the high road would be reduced to a scorched, diseased wasteland. With some difficulty, the princess turned from the gate and looked to her small entourage. Save for herself and the queen, all of the guards, wizards, and companions carried only one small satchel of personal effects. Even Filfaril and Tanalasta had packed their belongings into a single trunk each. "'Is everyone ready?' When no one reported otherwise, Tanalasta nodded to Korvar Rallyhorn. You may proceed. As you command, princess. The steely-eyed Lionar bowed stiffly, almost resentfully, Tanalasta thought, then turned toward the front of the group. There two war wizards stood, each one linking arms with four burly dragoneers. In their hands the dragoneers held bare iron swords. You may proceed. We will follow in a hundred count. The wizard spoke a magic command word and vanished with a distinct blat, taking their eight dragoneer escorts along. Korvar began to count aloud, slowly and audibly, so everyone in the remaining half of the party could hear and understand. Tanalasta's mother leaned close. "'You know what this looks like, dear. That can't be helped.' Tanalasta replied. The research I need is in Suzale. People will think we're fleeing to safety, Filfaro continued. It hardly inspires confidence. I am not confident, Tanalasta replied. We understand, Xanthan, but what about the other Gaznes? The Arabellan Library doesn't have the answers. If we want to stop them, I must return to the Royal Archives. And knowing why these traitors forsook Cormir will help us how? Filfaro asked pointedly. You know how. I've already explained what happened to Xanthan when he learned that I had married Rowan. Tanalasta spoke even more quietly than before. Together she and Filfaro had decided it would be wisest to let Azun announce her marriage so it would appear the king approved. Learning the reasons the other gas nest betrayed the realm is just a matter of enough study. And studying is what I'm best at. You are also an emblem of Cormir, Filfaro reminded her. If the people think we are fleeing, they will lose hope. Then you may stay to reassure them, mother, Tanalasta said, but I will do what I think best for Cormir. Korvar's count reached ninety, and Sarman the Spectacular stepped up and offered them his arms. Tanalasta slipped her hand through the crook of the wizard's elbow, then cocked a querying eyebrow at her mother. "'I am coming,' Filfaro sighed. "'For me to appear braver than you would undercut your station, and I am done costing you prestige.' One hundred, Korvar announced." Sarman uttered his spell, and Tanalasta's stomach rose into her chest. There was that timeless interval of numb, colorless falling, in which she knew only the wizard's fingers around her wrist and the roar of silence in her ears. Now she was somewhere else, standing in a different courtyard, attempting to blink away the teleport after days and recall where she was. 
The dull clamor of clanging iron rang off the bailey walls, and the air reeked of battle gore. The stones beneath her feet reverberated to the erratic thud of tramping feet and falling bodies, and there were armored men and black shapes flashing past in every direction. Sarman had teleported them into a battle, and for the life of her, the princess could not recall why. A dark silhouette whirled back toward her, and Tanalasta glimpsed an eerily familiar shape streaking toward her on black wings. The thing had gangling arms and hands with ebony talons, a skeletal torso with naked female breasts, coarse black hair that framed smoldering scarlet eyes. "'Ambush!' cried Korvar Rallyhorn. The Lionar's armored body struck Tanalasta sidelong, slamming her into Sarman and Filfayrol, and driving all three to the ground. Suddenly Tanalasta recalled where they were supposed to be. They were supposed to be in the inner bailey of the Suzail Palace, but Sarman seemed to have bungled his spell and teleported them into one of the terrible battles raging in the north. A loud clunk sounded above Tanalasta as the Gaznes Talon struck Korvar's armor and tore him off her. Trying to fathom how the Lionar's escort had bungled a teleport spell in exactly the same way as Sarman the Spectacular, the princess rolled off the pile. She pulled the wizard off her mother and shoved him toward Korvar. Help the Lionar, she ordered. Even as the Gaznath dragged Korvar, bouncing and skipping across the cobblestone pavement, the Lionar somehow managed to pull his iron sword and start hacking at the creature. "'And Sarman, try not to bungle your spell this time,' Tanalasta added, not bothering to conceal her anger at the wizard's incredible mistake. Brow rising at her sharp tone, Sarman pulled something from his weather cloak and tossed it in the Lionar's direction. As he started his incantation, a familiar drone rose behind Tonalasta. She spun around to find herself looking through a swirling fog of wasps and flies at the looming spires of the dragon keep, which stood well inside Suzail Palace. As Tonalasta struggled to digest the fact that they had teleported on destination, the lanky figure of Xanthan Cormeril emerged from the droning haze and started to fight his way through the royal bodyguards. He was carrying a ten-foot halberd in each hand, leaping and spinning and whirling the ungainly pole-arms like a pair of windmills. The dragon ears countered bravely, charging in behind their purple bucklers to hack at his legs or thrust iron-headed spears at his heart, but they were no match for the Gaznes' speed. He batted their attacks aside, one after the other, and continued toward the crown princess. Phil Pharaoh grasped Tanalasta's arm and pulled her in the opposite direction, following Alafandar, Auden, and half a dozen dragoneers toward the purple barracks. Their escape came to a sudden halt, when a squat little Gazneth with a pot belly and a filthy black beard dropped out of the sky and blocked their way. He fixed his crimson eyes on Queen Filfarel and started forward, using his powerful wings to bat aside fully armored soldiers as though they were little children. Baldivar! Filfarel gasped the name so softly that Tanalasta barely heard it. No! Faithless harlot! Baldivar hissed, wagging his red tongue at the Queen. I love that in a woman! Filfarel shrank back, then turned and would have run had Tanalasta not caught hold of her arm. Auden stepped forward, placing himself squarely between the queen and her tormentor. Baldivar sneered and spread his wings in readiness. Instead of raising his iron mace, the harvestmaster pulled the sacred flower amulet off his neck and thrust it toward the Gazneth. "'In the name of the Great Mother!' "'Return thee to the grave, and surrender thy body to the good soil.' Baldivar's eyes grew as hot as flames. He began to curse and gnash his teeth so furiously that a bloody froth spilled from his mouth. But he veered away from the holy symbol and tried to circle around, not to Filfarel's side, but to Tanalasta's. Auden cut the Gazneth off and stepped forward, pushing the amulet, to little more than an arm's reach of the Gazneth. Auden, don't be a fool! 
Tanalasta caught the priest by the back of the cloak, then glanced in the direction of the first Gazneth. The creature was knee-deep in mangled dragon ears, and also struggling to reach her. It was hindered by a trio of warriors whose armor and iron halberds had suddenly turned flaky and orange with rust, and by a short chain of golden magic wrapped around both legs. At the other end of the chain lay a feeble old wizard bearing a fatherly semblance to Sarman the Spectacular. One arm was buried to the shoulder beneath the cobblestones, and he was screaming in anguish as the Gazneth struggled to pull free. There was no sign of Korvar, unless he was the green hummingbird darting in and out to plunge his pointed beak into the Gazneth's scarlet eyes. The bird seemed to be having more effect than any other attacker. Every time it struck, the Gazness screeched and used its powers to heal the injured eye, then flailed about madly, trying to knock the tiny creature from the sky. As quick as the dark fiend was, however, the humming bird was quicker. It dodged, darted, then zipped in to strike again. A cloud of wasps and flies arrived in a boiling, stinging swarm. Tanalasta looked back to see Xanthan, less than five paces away, tearing into her last two bodyguards. Behind him, the palace garrison was streaming into the bailey from all directions, but the princess had noticed the pattern of the Gazness attacks and knew the guards would never arrive in time to save her. Even Baldivar, who had held Filfaro captive for nearly a ten-day, and in his madness still considered her to be his queen, was circling toward Tanalasta instead of her mother. Clearly, the time had come to reach for her escape pocket and count herself lucky. Instead, Tanalasta turned to face Xanthan. It alarmed her to find him here, as powerful as ever, and perhaps even more so, his wings were now large enough that the tips rose above his shoulders. Had her theory about how to defeat the Gazness been correct, he would be no more than the sniveling traitor who had fled Sarman at Goblin Mountain. But the princess was not about to give up her ideas so easily. If her theory was wrong, she would at least understand why. Xanthan trapped one dragonier's iron sword in the head of a halberd and began a tight loop, preparing to fling the weapon out of the warrior's grasp. Tanalasta raised her chin haughtily and stepped toward the battle, dragging her mother along and ignoring the wasps and flies descending to attack their faces. "'How now, cousin?' Tanalasta called. "'Is a cormeral on the throne no longer vindication enough?' The loop of Xanthan's halberd stopped short, and the dragoneer managed to free his sword from the trap. "'Don't talk of thrones to me, shrew! You are no more married to Rowan than you were to Onadar!' "'She's not!' Filfaro cried. She pulled free of Tanalasta's grasp and placed a hand over her breast. "'By the lady's fiery tresses, that's good news. "'I didn't know how I was going to explain it to the king. "'Imagine a Cormeral as the royal husband. "'What would the silver swords do?' "'Xanthan's eyes flashed crimson, and he gasped. "'She told you?' "'He grew so distracted that he was barely quick enough "'to deflect the next few attacks. "'Then it's true? "'I should hope not.' Filfaro stepped toward the Gazneth. "'If it is, take me now and end my shame.' The shadow seemed to fade from Xanthan's face, and the hatred in his eyes took on the more human aspect Tanalasta had witnessed at Goblin Mountain. She caught her mother's arm and jerked her back, beginning to fear that perhaps the queen's reaction was not really an act. "'That's quite enough, mother.' Tanalasta had learned all she needed— perhaps even more than she would have liked. She nudged Lafandar toward Auden, who was still facing off Baldivar, then spun away from Xanthan and reached for her weathercloak's escape pocket. We'll discuss this further in my chambers. A dark door opened before Tanalasta, and she stepped through, dragging her mother along behind her. There was that timeless moment of falling— then she was back in the familiar confines of her own chamber, not quite sure why she felt so disoriented or why she was holding hands with the queen. 
In the next instant, a Laffendar arrived with Auden Foley in tow. Then Tanalasta heard the battle clamor out in the bailey, and it all came rushing back to her. She opened the door to her ante-room and shouted, "'Sentries! Alarm!' "'And bring your irons,' added the queen. "'We have Gazness!' Tanalasa could not help smiling as she heard the startled cries echoing down the halls. Though she had not been home in well over a year, she was glad to see some things never changed. She listened for a moment to the astonished guards relaying the news of her return, then turned back to her mother. "'I hope that act was for Xanthan's benefit,' she said. Filfairel smiled too sweetly. "'Of course, my dear. I couldn't be happier for you.' Without awaiting a reply, the queen crossed the bedchamber and peered out between the draperies. Tanalasta followed close behind and took the other side. Out in the bailey, Baldivar and the other winged Gazneth. It had to be either Suzara Oberskir or Rindala Merindil, since they were the only two female Gazneths, were little more than specks in the sky. Still, lacking wings large enough to lift him, Xanthan Cormeril was clambering up the outer wall like a huge spider, now fully reverted to his full Gazneth self. Shaking her head in frustration, Tanalasta stepped away from the curtain and turned to her mother. "'It's my turn to apologize. Apparently I was wrong.' "'You? Wrong?' Filfairel let the curtain drop and gave her daughter a doubtful look. Why do I have a hard time believing that? Because she wasn't. A Laffendar stepped between the two women and cautiously peered out between the draperies. Had Tanalusta been wrong, I doubt the Gazness would have set this trap for her. A trap? echoed Auden. He and a Laffendar exchanged meaningful glances. Then he looked away and did the same with Tanalusta. "'You don't suppose they could have been worried about something else?' "'I don't see what,' Tanalasta said quickly. Though enough time had passed for the princess to be certain she remained with child, she had not yet told her mother, partly because she feared the queen's reaction, and partly because of her own irrational desire to shelter the child by keeping the pregnancy secret as long as possible. "'But we shouldn't congratulate ourselves yet.' "'We've been able to weaken Xanthan twice now, but he has also recovered, and in fairly short order. I don't think my theory is going to destroy the Gazness.' "'Not yet, but it is a start,' insisted Alafandar. "'If not, why would the Gazness be worried?' The sage's question caused Filfairel to cock her brow. "'A much more interesting question, I think, is why they were worried at all.' Auden and Laffendar frowned, but Tanalasta, who was more accustomed to her mother's shrewd political thinking, was quicker to understand her meaning. And how they happened to be waiting when we arrived. Laffendar's old chin dropped. By Ogma's eternal quill. Only Auden, unfamiliar with the duplicitous life at court, did not understand. I can't believe they're that smart. To surmise that we might come to Suzail is one thing, but to guess when— Tanalasta laid a silencing hand on the Harvest Master's thigh. It wasn't a guess, Auden. They have a spy. 10. The brisk, muffled tramp of a goblin company on the march rumbled up the crooked lane, and Vangedahast snuffed the candle by which he had been studying. The goblins were chittering a cadence, slightly off the beat, as usual, slapping their palms against their iron breast armor to make their numbers sound greater. They were definitely coming in his direction. The wizard closed his traveling spell-book— then let it shrink back to carrying size before slipping it back into his cloak pocket. Without the candle, his world grew as black and tight as a crypt. The cavern's spongy ceiling hung somewhere above, a full arm's length away, yet as musty and pressing as a coffin lid. 
The single opening was the small third-story window through which he accessed his crude hammock, and even that led to a cramped little room where he could barely stretch his arms. Vangertahast rolled to his stomach, ready to cast a spell into the pitch darkness below. He had no reason to believe there would be need. More than a hundred patrols had passed beneath him already, and the closest thing he had heard to a goblin alarm was a goblin's sneeze. He knew that would change eventually. Every time he woke, there seemed to be more grod living in the city. They materialized out of nowhere, simply appearing as though they had been living there all along. Twice now, Vangertahast had been forced to move farther from the central plaza after nearby buildings became suddenly inhabited. Despite his vow to use no more magic, Vangertahast was occasionally forced to cast a spell after the goblins caught him stealing food or filling his water skin. Once, while using an enchantment to eavesdrop on his pursuers, he heard the goblins refer to the command of the Iron One that he and his ring be captured, though Vangertahas felt certain they were referring to Nalavara, and that the ring she wanted was his ring of wishes. What he did not understand was why. During their first meeting, Nalavara had tried to trick him into wishing the then-empty city full of goblins, a wish she had apparently not needed his ring to fulfill. Had she merely been trying to trick him into making any wish, so she could absorb the spell's powerful magic and be freed? Or had she been trying to keep him from wishing himself out of the city, or perhaps from wishing her out of existence? Vangertahast had pondered the question, and pondered it. He had little else to do, and still he could not decide. He was beginning to fear the matter would come down to simply trying an option and seeing what followed. This was a means of escape he was disinclined to attempt, given the high price of guessing wrong. The tramp of the first company had barely faded before the sound of another one followed. The wizard listened carefully, and heard several more companies coming in his direction. This was no simple scouting party. This sounded like an entire legion. Vangertahast pulled an agate from his pocket, and held it to his eye, whispering the incantation that would allow him to see in the dark. He did not know how close Nalavara was to freedom. Every time he went to the plaza to see— he was discovered by an entire cohort of goblins and forced to use even more magic to escape. But something important was happening, and he had to find out what. By the time Vangertahast finished his spell, the second company of goblins had passed down the lane and vanished around a corner. He did not have to wait long for a third. By the magic of his spell, which enabled him to see via radiant heat instead of light— he beheld a file of red glowing forms marching single file behind a bronze armored standard bearer. Their centurion followed half a dozen steps behind, jaw snapping as he barked the cadence. Like the goblins behind him, he wore a heavy field pack on his shoulders and a short sword on his hip. Instead of the iron javelins they carried against their shoulders, however, he cradled an ivory baton in the crook of his elbow. As the company passed by fifteen feet beneath his hammock, it was all Vangertahast could do to remain motionless. He had been lurking on the fringe of the occupied warrens for some time now, quietly trying to follow a hunting party to wherever they killed their crows and skunks, presumably somewhere outside the city since he had never seen signs of any such creatures in its vast darkness. His efforts had met with no more success than his attempts to teleport, dimension door, or plain walk out of his prison. The hunting parties always seemed to disappear a thousand paces beyond the occupied portions of the city, sometimes vanishing after they rounded a corner, and other times simply fading into the darkness at the other end of a long, straight corridor. Nothing Vangertahast tried had ever enabled him to trace their route, not even magic. This time it was no mere hunting party. This was an entire army, and armies did not vanish into thin air, not even goblin armies. 
The present company had barely rounded the corner before Vanderhast heard the next one coming. He gathered his possessions and scrambled through the window. Before descending to the bottom floor, he cast a spell to make himself invisible. Goblins seldom looked up, but they were extremely aware of matters at their own level and would certainly notice him if he did not take precautions. Once the company had passed, Vanderhast slipped out the door and started down the alley after them. He had no trouble keeping up for the first quarter mile or so, until the goblins entered a series of low passages running beneath the tenement building's second stories. He dropped to his hands and knees and quickly began to fall behind. Somewhat reluctantly, Vanderhast cast a flying spell so he could keep up without making too much noise. It was the nineteenth spell he had used since he came to realize that his magic was freeing Nalavara. By the time the company reached its destination, the magic had been drained from all three of Vanderhast's spells. He cast each spell again. The twentieth, twenty-first, and twenty-second, since he had vowed to use no more magic, then followed the goblins into an open space covered by an immense domed ceiling, with jagged boulders littering the floor and stalactites hanging from the ceiling. The area had the look of a natural cavern. In the center of the vast space, a set of crooked timber stairs ascended an equally crooked scaffold and disappeared into the darkness above. A full legion of goblins, more than a hundred companies, stood before the structure in tiny ranks. Their attention was fixed on the first landing, where a handful of high-ranking goblins in iron armor stood staring out over their growing army. Heart pounding in excitement, Vanderhast ducked behind a nearby boulder to plan his next move. There was a time when he would have been arrogant enough to slip invisibly through the ranks and ascend the scaffold at once, but he had long ago learned not to underestimate the grod goblins. Another dozen companies entered the marshalling ground and took their places at the rear of the legion. Finally, when the last warrior had taken his place and posted his javelin in front of him, a tall goblin in a red robe stepped forward. He raised both arms, and a curt, deafening cheer rose from the legion. Twice more the goblin raised his arms, and twice more the legion gave its cheer. The red-garbed figure pressed his fingertips together and gestured toward the legion, then stepped back. Another goblin, this one in white, took his place and began to speak. Vanderhast cast his twenty-third spell. "'Iron One has spoken,' said the goblin. The voice was that of Otka, the female whom Vanderhast had seen giving orders in the Grod Palace. "'Now is the time. To the wolf woods you go.' Otka flung her arm up the stairs and stepped aside. The first company started up the stairs three abreast, leaving Vanderhast to curse the waste of his magic." Even the dimmest of Azun's high nobles would not have needed magic to guess the meaning of such a short speech. Seeing no reason to wait in line, even in the city of the Grod, royal wizards were entitled to their privileges. Vanderhast stepped out of his hiding place and launched himself over the heads of the goblins. He landed three quarters of the way up the tower on a platform fully thirty feet above the leading company and started up the cockeyed stairs. He ascended rapidly but cautiously, being careful not to stomp or slap his soles on the stair treads or make any other noise that would alert the goblins to his invisible presence. Unfortunately, there was nothing he could do to keep the scaffold from shaking and swaying beneath his weight. The grod had many strengths, especially for goblins, but construction was not one of them. Upon reaching the next landing, Vanderhast looked up and saw the stairs ascending into pitch darkness. The wizard climbed to within arm's reach of it, then looked down and decided to cast one last spell before departing the goblin city. He pulled a small handful of sulfur and bat guano from his cloak and began to roll it into a sticky ball. Then saw the glowing eyes of a gazneth watching him from the mouth of a goblin tunnel. One pearly eye vanished and reappeared. Vanderhast stopped rolling his fingers. 
the thing had winked at him. Forgetting about the spell components in his hand, the wizard bounded up the last few steps in a dead sprint and crashed headlong into the cavern's spongy ceiling. The surface parted and yielded ever so slightly, then suddenly stiffened and forced his head downward, so that he found himself staring at the goblins below. The ball of sulfur slipped from his fingers, half combined, and plummeted groundward. He feared for an instant that he would follow, but the ceiling held him fast, spread-eagled, forty feet above the legion. Vanderdehast lost sight of the sulphur ball, then heard a dull ping, and saw a goblin centurion drop to a surprised squat. The soldier pulled his helmet off and craned his neck to look, of all directions for a goblin to look, up. Even then Vanderdehast thought he might remain undetected. He was, after all, forty feet in the air, invisible, and camouflaged in a black weather cloak, but the goblin's eyes grew round and white and vanished into pitch darkness. The wizard dared to hope he was being drawn through the ceiling into the wolf woods, known in his own day as Cormir, when a high little voice began to chitter far below, and the scaffold began to groan and sway beneath the trammeling of little boots. Vanger de Hast realized that the spongy barrier holding him fast was also drawing the magic from his spells. He could no longer see in the dark, nor, in all likelihood, fly. Vanger de Hast glanced toward the tunnel where he had seen the pearly eyes and found nothing but darkness. Having no doubts about what the thing would do next, he reached for his weather cloak's escape pocket and found his arm stuck fast to the ceiling. Shrill goblin voices began to chitter below, not more than ten feet away. Knowing he could never teleport out of the cavern, he had tried it a dozen times before and never found himself anywhere but the immense goblin city, Vanger de Hast elected to try something simpler. He closed his eyes and spoke the incantation of a blink spell. There was a fizzle and a hiss, then a dozen tiny hands clutching him from below, tugging at his lapels and jerking the throat clasp from his collar, fishing through his pockets and pulling out wands, potions, and rings, little bundles of dried toad tongue and chopped rock lichen and powdered new tie of no use to anyone but him. A pair of shining pearl eyes appeared in the darkness below, more or less where Vanger de Hast remembered the corner of the scaffold to be. The goblins began to shriek and yammer madly. The eyes grew steadily, rapidly larger. The gazneth was coming. Finally, a goblin leaped up and caught hold of Vanger de Hast's sleeve, then began to work its way hand over hand toward his wrist. The wizard's heart rose into his throat. He closed his eyes and tried one more time to decide whether Nalavara needed this ring of wishes or was frightened of it. When the goblin grabbed hold of his wrist, he still had not decided. He closed his eyes and began, I wish. A deafening clap of thunder interrupted the command. Vanger de Hast's eyes were pained by a brilliant flash of light, and the goblin's weight vanished from his arm. A smell like scorched rabbit permeated the air. Do not, growled a raspy voice. As it is, you have nearly freed her. After squeezing his eyes open and shut several times, Vanger de Hast was finally able to see a small cascade of flames licking the scaffold below him. The goblin leaders were chittering angrily and pointing at the flames. A moment later, several brave goblin warriors hurled themselves into the conflagration, using their own bodies and bare hands to beat out the fire. Vanger de Hast ignored their selfless display and stared into the Gazness gray eyes. Do I know you? No, came the answer. The Gazneth pulled his shadowy body onto the landing beneath Vanger de Hast, then plucked a pair of wands from a squealing goblin's wrist and began to absorb the magic. Nobody knows me. You're lying, Vanger de Hast said. Though the voice was far raspier than any he knew intimately, 
there was something familiar in its dry huskiness and crisp northern accent. Where have we met? Nowhere but here in this hell. The Gazna spun away and began to knock goblins off the scaffold, crying out when one little warrior managed to thrust an iron javelin through his abdomen. Vangita Hast watched in astonishment, at first confused as to why the phantom had come to his aid, then growing more frightened as the obvious answer occurred to him. He was a magician, and Gaznes needed magic the way vultures needed death. After clearing the immediate area of goblins, the Gaznath spun around to point down the stairs. As the phantom turned, Vangitahast glimpsed a dark but handsome face with reasonably human features and a grotesquely cleft chin. Before the wizard could see more, a torrent of water shot from the Gaznath's hand and blasted twenty goblins off the scaffold. The spray doused the fire they had been fighting and plunged the cavern back into darkness. A powerful hand reached up and pulled Vanger to Hast out of his wizard's cloak, then turned to throw him off the tower. Wait! Vanger to Hast cried, finally putting the chiseled face and northern accent together. I do know you. No longer, said the voice. Now go back to your nest, and do not make me sorry I saved you. The Gazneth pitched him into the darkness, and Vanger de Hast barely had time to picture his snug little hammock before he heard himself shout the syllables of his teleport spell. 11. These tuskers are so ugly, Lancelord Rattlesar grunted, as his blade ripped apart a fat-bellied orc's belly from its crotch to its breastbone. That you'd think orc mothers would soon lose interest in mothering more of them, hey? They never do, Keldon, another landslord, replied mournfully. They just never do. Those were the last words he ever uttered. A black blade burst through his helm and cheek, and out his mouth in a red froth, and landslord Garthen toppled into the blood-churned mud without a sound. His dreams of settling his sweetheart in a grand house in Suzale swept away in one bright and terrible instant. His fall went unseen by his fellows in the frantic, hacking tumult. "'I've slain at least thirty, a sword captain gasped, bringing his blade around in an arc that struck sparks and rang shrieks of protesting weapon steel from a dozen orc swords. The endmost orc reeled back from that clash of arms, and Sword Captain Thorne's blade darted in like the fangs of a springing rock viper, in and out of a fat tusker's throat, so swiftly that one might have been forgiven for not seeing the slaying stroke, at least until the blood started to jet, and a fat, dirty body staggered helplessly back. "'Is that all, Thorne?' Lord Brayer Winter called, over the surging shoulders of two orcs that were hacking an already dead armsman to the ground. "'Whatever have you been doing all this time?' the sword captain chuckled. "'Sharpening my steel,' he roared back, trading deafening blows with a snarling orc captain larger than he was, and tempering it. Both combatants swung as hard as they could, blades cleaving air until they clashed together numbingly, spraying sparks. Tortured steel screamed around their ears, as one, orc and man, staggered back, shoulders shaking helplessly from the force of their meeting blades. One of the gigantic snort-snout's elbows struck a dragoneer's helm, sending the man flying. The warrior, fighting beside the downed man, gave the reeling orc a look of disgust, whirled, despite an orc blade seeking his own ribs, and drove his dagger hilt deep behind the tusker's ear. "'In orc blood!' Theldon Thorn roared, drawing back his war-sword in both hands and smashing it forward through the staggering orc's guard with such force that both of his boots left the ground." and the huge, hairy jaw, breast, and ribs beneath all shattered. They fell together, rolling in the mud, sweeping the legs out from under the orc trying to slay the dragoneer. 
Someone else fell atop that orc, screaming in raw agony, and two sword blades burst through the tusker's body inches from Thorn's nose, almost blinding him with hot, dark gore. As he shook his head frantically in the stinking darkness, the screaming above him ended abruptly. The sword captain blinked and heaved and spat his way up from under, finding his feet somehow in the muck. When he could see once more, he found he was in a little space clear of living orcs, facing staggering and blood-spattered purple dragons across heaps of the dead. He gave the dragoneer a dark look and snarled, "'Slay your own orcs, bold blade!' "'Well,' the dragoneer growled back, kicking his way free of bodies that were still leaking bright blood, "'I humbly beg my lord's sword-captain's pardon. My hand must have slipped. "'No doubt,' Thorn grunted, setting his shoulders to hack his way forward through a squalling tangle of blood-streaked orcs whose blades were caught in the armor of the purple dragon they'd spitted together. No doubt. In the heart of the fray, Sword Lord Glamourhand and the Lords Brayer Winter and Tolan were grimly hacking and parrying, trying to keep orc blades away from two fellow warriors who refused to be protected. King Azun and his daughter Alisair. The steel princess was leaping and twisting like a mad thing in the heart of knot after knot of snorting, screaming tuskers, hurling herself into danger as if she were eager to die. Black orc blood dripped from her helm and chin, and her blade leaped like a flickering flame amid the gore, rising and falling tirelessly. Ever Alisair struck boldly forward, and ever her father followed her, hacking and stabbing with cool efficiency, as he sought to deal death to any orc who got between him and his daughter, and thus necessarily around behind Alisair's back. Orcs, a head taller than she, was snorted in anger as they put their shoulders down and rammed forward together. One paid for his lowered guard with his life, his gorget cut away, and the throat beneath opened in a hot flood, but the other sent Alisair staggering, and chopped sidearm with his blade like a forester hewing down a sapling. She grunted. It was more of a sob, as his blade bit home and almost fell. An orc blade had drawn royal blood. Roars went up from both sides as orcs shouted in triumph, and Cormirians bellowed their fervent need to reach and rescue the steel princess. "'Die, Tuskers!' Sword Lord Glamourhand shouted, almost beheading an orc with a terrific cut. "'Get thee to death and save us this trouble!' Azun's eyes narrowed as he caught sight of dark limbs and wings waving almost tauntingly in the shadows beyond the orcs. A few more desperate thrusts and slashes brought him to where he could stand over the shuddering Alisair. He slapped a vial of healing elixir into her hand and growled, "'Drink, reckless idiot!' Alisair coughed, on her knees in the mud between two sprawled bodies— neither of them an orc. Th thanks father she said thickly, spitting blood. Always there when I need you. Get up, lass, he snapped. I need your thoughts now, not your blade. How so? she gasped, reeling to her feet as the lords Brayerwinter and Tolan took up stances on one side of the royal pair, blades raised and ready, and Sword Lord Glamourhand and Lance Lord Rattlesar stood guard on the other. "'Look, you!' Azun gasped, pointing through the slaughter with his blade. "'We chase and chase this Gazneth, and it retreats, never crossing claws with us, is this the usual way these beasts war with us? And all we ever see is one and the same Gazneth. Where are the others? We've been lured away, Alisair said quietly, holding her side where the orc blade had bitten into her, and bringing her fingers away sticky with her own blood. She lifted her head and shot glances like arrows around the fray, stopping when she found the war wizard who was never far from the king. Arkenfrost was the mightiest mage out in the field with the royal army. 
How many of your fellow wizards remain with the troops, Lord Mage? Eight or so, if one counts untried apprentices, Arkenfrost replied calmly through the tumult, and three who've spells enough to make a difference in battle. If they try, Azun snarled, Gaznes Galore will be down on them like hungry vultures. We've been duped again. Gods, he missed Vanderdehast's foresight and sarcastic calm, but this was one war the King of Cormir was just going to have to win without his royal magician. He looked around at purple dragons, heartily hacking down orcs, then back at Arkenfrost. If we leave you, can you bring these men out into the sunlight again and back to rejoin us? Arkenfrost shrugged. We fought our way in here, Majesty he replied calmly. I dare say we can fight our way out. The king nodded curtly, caught hold of Alasair's hand, and snapped, We go. Guard yourselves. Alasair opened her mouth to say something, but Azun made no move to halt his will. His ring flashed once as the vast blue falling seized them both, and when it cleared, they were out under the sun again, the royal standard Azun had sought to return to, was fluttering beside their ears, and they were staring into the frightened eyes of three men in robes, whose hands were leveled at the obiskirs, and whose wrists were crackling with the awakened lightning of battle magic. "'Strike not your king!' Alasair roared, her voice as deep a snarl as any sword-captain's. "'How goes the battle? Did you face any gazneths?' The foremost man sketched the briefest of bows, and stammered, N "'None, royal lady. Ah, ear-eagle storm-shoulder, loyal mage of the crown, at your service. Ah, your majesties?' He drew in an unhappy breath, and said stiffly, "'We face a sea of orcs, tuskers everywhere, like a cloak on the hillsides all around. We dare not use much magic, for fear of the dark the gazness. Prudent, the king said, nodding, but use what magic you must. To let men die while you stand idle is to give a gazneth a victory it hasn't even taken the field to earn. He shot the other two mages a steely glance. Has Storm Shoulder seen the fray correctly? Uh, he has, your majesty, one wizard said awkwardly, while the other stammered, he has. Then they both seemed to remember whom they were addressing and found their knees with almost comical haste. Loyal mage, law rider Gondolon, O king. Loyal mage, Mavalar Starlagger at your service, crowned lord of Cormir. Azun waved these formalities aside with a growl that became the command, Follow me. I'll have these orcs swept from my land, even if I have to slay each and every last one of them myself, for Cormir and victory. Holding high his war-sword as if it were a flaming brand sent down by the gods, the king charged forward. Alasair snatched up the royal standard and followed, snapping a quiet, Come, to the open-mouthed war-wizards. Helmed heads were turning to look at them as they trotted forward. The king's army was facing a host of orcs that covered the hills ahead, for as far as they could see— but a great shout went up as the Oberskiers surged forward to the line, where men and orcs were hacking at each other in the sunlight with a sort of grim resignation. For Cormir and victory! A thousand throats shouted in unison. Death to all orcs! A sword captain called back, and the reply rolled out deafeningly. For Cormir and victory! And as the royal army raced forward with renewed vigor to hew down orcs, slipping and sliding in the black blood of the tuskers who'd already fallen, not a man there spared a glance into the sky for a gazneth. There were orcs to kill, and too little daylight left to down them all. For Cormir, Azun shouted happily, shouldering his way past a startled lancelord to lay open the face of a snarling orc. Forever! "'Gods, yes,' Alasair murmured, from somewhere near his left shoulder. "'Let it be forever.'" Twelve. 
Tanalasta stood on the amethyst dais of the royal audience hall, feeling small and lost in the soaring grandeur of the golden chamber, yet also very glad for the concealing bulk of her purple robe of state. She was beginning to thicken around the middle, and it wouldn't do to have this particular pack of wolves speculating over the cause. There were nearly two hundred of them clustered at the base of the stairs, droning quietly in their little cliques, even as Lord Emlar Goldsword addressed the crown. "'These gasnets are proving a nuisance, Highness. Already a rather stubborn blight has taken hold in my vineyard. The flies have made a maggot barn of my stables, and I have had to dismiss several servants who spoke harshly to Lady Rattelard. The complaints differed only in detail from the litany of grievances to which Tunnelasta had been listening all morning. A fissure of molten rock had run down the middle of the Hunt Crown country estate, swallowing the mansion. Lord Tabert's favorite stallion, and a dozen good gardeners. A quarter of the ships in the Daunting Horn merchant fleet had developed sudden cases of dry rot, forcing the family to leave whole shiploads of foodstuffs moldering on the docks. For no reason anyone could name, the young men of the prolific Silverhorn family had developed a sudden hatred of the horn holds and initiated a deadly blood feud that had already cost both families their firstborn heirs. Most of the speakers were united in implying that Tanalasta had brought this plague of calamities with her when she came down from the north, and in suggesting that had she had the foresight to seek refuge elsewhere, perhaps they would not have been so inconvenienced. She listened to each lord politely, interrupting only to clarify a point, or to ask a description in the rare event that the speaker had actually joined his guards and gone out to do battle when the Gazneth came. What the princess heard convinced her that all six of the creatures were now plaguing southern Cormir. It also convinced her that most of the nobles before her were not worthy of the name. Why was it, she wondered, that the high-born of a family so often turned out to be selfish cowards, while the lesser cousins proved true and brave? That had certainly been so among the Cormerals. She could easily picture Gaspar or Xanthan there before her, complaining about the inconvenience of having the kingdom assaulted by the scourges of Alondo's prophecy, while their lesser cousin, Rowan, was off actually trying to do something about it. Tanalasta forced herself to focus on Lord Goldsword. She did not know whether it was her condition or her growing concern about Rowan's long absence, but she found her attention wandering to her husband at increasing intervals. It had been three months since King Azun had found the ranger's mount riderless and alone in the Stonelands, and she had heard about the blood on the saddle and the likelihood it had come from a festering wound. The conclusion was obvious, but Tonalasta could not bring herself to believe it without a body, especially not when she had heard nothing from Rowan himself. He had been wearing a royal ranger's cloak, which had the same magic throat clasp as a war wizard's weather cloak. Had he lain slowly dying somewhere, Tonalasta knew his last act would have been ascending to say goodbye. He would never be cruel enough to simply die and leave her in doubt. Not Rowan Cormero. "'Highness,' asked Lord Goldsword. Tanalasta found herself looking past the pate of Emlar's shiny bald head, and realized she had been staring off into space again. With much practiced poise, she kept her gaze fixed on the ivory dragon at which she had been staring, and did not allow her face to betray any shock. "'You were saying that some of your servants had gone mad and insulted Lady Radelard, Tonalasta said. "'Was there anything else?' "'Only the matter of the hounds, Highness,' he said. "'Ah, yes, the hounds.' Tonalasta let her gaze drop to the Lord's face. This time she did not try to disguise the irritation she felt at being petitioned about vineyards and hunting dogs— while the ancient prophecy of Cormir's doom came true before their eyes. 
What do you intend to do about it, my lord? Goldsword looked taken aback, and the drone of the half-whispered conversations around him fell suddenly silent. Do, Majesty? Yes, M. Lar, said Tanalasta. What do you intend to do about the gasness? They are the cause of all these troubles, or haven't you heard? M. Lar's eyes flashed with irritation. Of course I have heard, Highness. His voice assumed that silky tone nobles like to use when they tried to manipulate some fact or half-truth to their own advantage. Everyone knows how you brought them. The princess did not bring them, Lord Goldsword, said Queen Philpharel. She rose from her throne, where she had been quietly working on a silken needlepoint, depicting her rescue from Mad King Baldivar. If you will recall, they were waiting when we arrived. The princess was very nearly killed, and I, for one, would like to know how that came to be. The color drained from Emlar's jowly face, as it did from so many faces when the queen spoke in that icy tone. I beg the princess's pardon. He continued to look at Philpharel and bowed more deeply than he had to Tanalasta. I meant only to say that these gasnes are a matter for the crown. The nobles can hardly be expected to muster their household guards. And why not? demanded Tanalasta, glaring at the lord even more harshly than he deserved. Though her mother had been careful to stop a pace behind her, the princess would rather the queen had remained in her throne. Even the mere demonstration of support for Tanalasta's leadership implied that it was needed and weakened her in the eyes of the nobles. To regain their respect, she would need to be more stern than before. While I was in Huthduth, did the king release the nobles of their liege duties and neglect to inform me? Of course not, replied the lord. But the king is not here. The king is always here, Philpharel began. Tanalasta raised her hand ever so slightly. As subtle as the movement was, such things seldom went unnoticed in the cagey world of lordly politics, and the gesture drew an astonished gasp. Lord Goldsword looked to the queen, clearly expecting her to put Tanalasta in her place and take over the audience. Instead, Philpharel merely inclined her head and retreated to her throne, leaving the nobles to ponder the new structure of royal power. Tanalasta stepped to the top of the stairs. The king is in the north fighting orcs, as are most of Cormier's armies. She looked away from Goldsword and ran her gaze over the other nobles. If the south is to be defended, it will not be by purple dragons. The expected murmur had barely begun when a husky voice called out from the back of the crowd. Perhaps I may be of some service in that regard, Majesty. Tanalasta looked toward the speaker and saw a broad-shouldered man with dark hair and darker eyes stepping out of a small circle of rowan mantles, long thumbs, and other merchant families. The fellow's foppish feathered hat prevented the princess from seeing his face clearly, but as he bowed she caught a glimpse of swarthy cheekbone and a proud cleft chin. Her heart began to pound so violently that she feared the nobles could hear it down on the chamber floor, though she could not imagine what Rowan would be doing in the garish silks of a Sembian merchant, the similarity of their appearance was too great to overlook. Tanalasta extended a hand, and could not quite keep the excitement from her voice as she said, "'The gentleman in feathers may rise and present himself.' The enthusiasm in her voice prompted a louder murmur than the last, and even Lord Goldsword turned to see what stranger had prompted such a reaction from their taciturn princess. The newcomer removed his hat with a flourish and bowed even lower, then answered in an almost comically thick Sembian accent, "'As you command, Majesty?' The man stood and started forward, and Tanalasta's heart fell a little. The distance was too far to see his face clearly, but his hair was shorter than Rowan's and more heavily styled. Still, 
hair could be cut and trained, and if her husband had some reason for coming to her in the guise of a foreigner, and she could not believe any true Sembian would speak with such a thick accent, it would behoove him to be certain his hair supported the disguise. Tanalasta's curiosity could not wait until the man reached the base of the stairs. "'Tell us your name, good sir.' The man stopped and bowed again, and even Queen Philpharo grew curious enough to leave her throne and step to Tanalasta's side. "'That would be Corian Havane,' said the man. "'Ambassador of the Consortium Princes of Seirlun, Selgont, and all of Sembia at your service, Majesty.' Philpharo glanced at Tanalasta and cocked her brow, but the princess paid the gesture no regard and motioned the man forward again. "'Come along, Ambassador Havane,' she said, playing along. "'We are discussing serious matters here. We do not have all day to wait on your bowing and scraping.' Corian quickly rose and started forward again, and Tanalasta's heart sank a little further. The man's face was fleshier than her husband's, and it lacked the chiseled, weather-worn aspect that had attracted her to Rowan in the first place. Still, Sembians liked to eat well, as though the number of a squid tails and octopus legs a man could afford to choke down were a measure of his acumen as a merchant. Two months of such rich, heavily buttered food would fatten the cheeks of even the hardiest royal scout. Now the Sembian began to speak as he walked. "'I apologize for keeping Her Majesty waiting, and will endeavor to be brief. Cormir's many and growing troubles in the north and elsewhere, having come to my master's attention, they have bade me come to Suzale and offer their every assistance.' "'Assistance?' Tarnalasta echoed, finding it difficult to concentrate on the man's words instead of his face. What kind of assistance? The kind the crown of Cormir finds to be mutually agreeable. The ambassador stopped at the base of the stairs and started to bow again, then caught himself and simply continued. At this moment, my masters have an army of ten thousand sellswords, commanded by our own Sembian officers on the march toward Derlun. Ten thousand? Philpharo gasped. Tanalasta barely heard her mother, for she saw now that this handsome ambassador could not be her Rowan. Though hardly fat, especially by Sembian standards, the merchant's softness clung to him like a blanket, and his mannerisms had the smooth, practiced air of an accomplished liar. Ten thousand sellswords? Philpharo repeated, this time more into Tanalasta's ear than toward the ambassador. "'That is not help. That is an invasion.' Corian raised his hands in denial. "'Nothing of the sort is meant. My masters only wish me to convey that the army is advancing to the Swamp Run for our own protection, and since it will already be close, they thought—' "'They might as well claim Southern Cormir,' Tanalasta said. Now that she had discovered the error of her assumptions, the princess's amiable disposition toward the man was replaced by an unreasonably terse anger. "'Ambassador Hovene, you may return to your masters with our thanks, and this warning. While their armies remain on Symbia's side of the swamp run, our countries remain at peace.' The ambassador's eyes widened in a practiced show of surprise. "'Majesty!' I fear you misinterpret my master's intentions. And I fear I do not, replied Tanalasta. And I fear you are being too hasty, said Lord Goldsword. He dared to place a foot on the bottom stair of the dais, prompting Korvar Rallyhorn and a dozen more of Tanalasta's bodyguards to grab the hilts of their swords and flank him. Goldsword remained where he was. You said yourself that our own armies are occupied in the north, and I'm sure I speak for every noble here when I say we have our hands full enough just trying to keep these gaznes off our lands. He glanced around the chamber and received an enthusiastic round of Here, here's. Only Giogi Wyvernspur, Ildamore, 
Hardcastle, and a handful of other dour-looking loyalists remained silent. A terrible anger welled up inside Tonalasta, and she descended a single step toward Emlar Goldsword. "'Are you a coward, sir?' Emlar's jaw dropped, and his face turned stormy and red. "'I beg your pardon?' Tonalasta descended another step, ignoring Korvar Rallyhorn's startled headshake. "'I believe my question was clear enough, Goldsword. I asked if you were a coward.' Emlar's face turned the color of Tonalasta's royal robe. He started to ascend the stairs to meet the princess, only to find the tip of Korvar's dagger pressed beneath his chin. What? Emlar was so furious he had to stop and lift his shaking jowls off the dagger before continuing. What is the meaning of this? Tonalasta descended another step, bringing her to within arm's length of the quivering noble. The crown demands to know. She reached out and slapped the man. Are you such a coward that you'd rather sell your realm than defend it? I, I, I ought to. Careful. Korvar pricked his dagger beneath the man's chin. You're speaking to the throne? Emlar glared at the princess. You are not the king. No. I am the crown princess acting in his absence. Tanalasta looked to Korvar, then said, If that is all Lord Goldsword cares to hide behind, let us see how brave he really is. Korvar, stand back and let him go. The Lionar's eyes flashed in alarm, but he sheathed his dagger and backed away as ordered. Tanalasta stepped down another stair, so that she was now standing eye to eye with Goldsword. Well? Goldsword's body began to shake so violently that Tunnelusta thought he would drop dead. His hand drifted toward his sword belt, and a series of sharp chimes echoed through the chamber. Giyogi Wyvernspur and a few others drew their own weapons. That was enough for Emlar, who backed off the step and turned to leave. "'Lord Goldsword!' Tunnelusta snapped. Emlar stopped, but did not turn around. "'What now, princess?' Now that you have answered my question, you are free to go. Emlar paused, then started toward the door at a brisk, overly dignified march. As he passed, the other nobles looked away and said nothing. Tanalasta waited until his steps had grown distant enough not to compete with her voice, then said quietly, Anyone else who would rather trade our land than fight for it may join him. She paused a moment to see if anyone would accept the offer, and Ambassador Havane started to leave as well. Not yet, Ambassador. There's something I want you to understand. Havane turned. I think you have made your point clearly enough. Humor me, Tonalasta said. She looked to Giyogi Wyvernspur, who, having heard the audience was to be a council of war, had come to the audience dressed in a gleaming suit of steel plate. "'Lord Wyvernspur, may I take it that you and yours stand at the crown's service?' Giyogi raised his sword in salute. "'You may.' "'Then you are to prepare an army and hide it well in your Hulak woods,' said Tonalasta. "'Should even one of those sellswords cross the swamp run, "'you are to visit upon Sembia all that the Gaznes are visiting upon Cormir. "'This time—' Ambassador Havane's eyes grew genuinely wide. He glanced toward Queen Filfarel and, finding no support there, looked back to Tonalasta. "'I assure you, Princess, that won't be necessary.' "'Good,' Tonalasta said, "'because it angers me that I must even consider the possibility during our current troubles. You are dismissed.' Havane bowed rather more shallowly than he had before, then left." Tanalasta watched him depart with a growing heaviness in her heart, and not because she feared any trouble Sembia might cause. Whatever their aspirations in Cormir, Giyogi would see to it that they found the price too dear to pay. Once the ambassador was gone, Tanalasta looked back to the nobles below. Giyogi Wyvernspur has declared himself ready to serve the crown. Who will stand with him? Ildemore Hardcastle? 
Corvar Rallyhorn's father, Erthrin, and a handful of others stepped forward to declare their readiness to sacrifice life and fortune on behalf of Cormir. Most of the other nobles, however, remained ominously silent. Tanalasta surveyed them silently, pausing on each lord just long enough to be sure they knew she had noted their reluctance, then came to the one true surprise, Beldemir Axehand. "'Lord Beldemir?' she asked. Beldemir's face reddened, but he did not look away. "'We are ready,' he said, "'when the king calls.' Though the refusal struck Tanalasta like a blow, she tried not to show how much it disheartened her. Even had she been given to self-delusion, and she was not, Beldemir's refusal could not be attributed to cowardice. His family was one of the few that had remained steadfastly loyal to her father during the previous year's attempt on the throne, and Beldemir's reluctance to commit now could only be attributed to his lack of confidence in her. Tanalasta held Beldemir's gaze and simply nodded. "'Then I will try to keep the realm together until he is able. Be ready.' She ascended the dais again, then turned to face the nobles. "'Between most of us there is little more to say. I respect your decisions, even if I am disappointed in them, and stand ready to accept your help when you are ready to fulfill your liege duties. Until then, honor me in this much. The crown hereby forbids all non-royal use of magic south of the high road, on pain of confiscation, imprisonment, or death, depending on whether it is we who find you or the Gazness. There were a few grumbles, but most of the lords understood either the sense of the edict or the wisdom of keeping their objections to themselves. Tanalasta waited until the chamber fell silent again, then dismissed the assembly with a wave. "'I will hold a war council in one hour,' she said. "'The royal chamberlain will make messengers available for dispatches for those who attend. Corvar, you will prepare your men for a noon departure.' The Lionar bowed his acknowledgment and turned to issue the orders, and it was Queen Filfarel who asked the obvious question. "'Departure? Where are we going?' "'Not we, mother. Me,' replied Tanalasta. "'I'd like you to stay by the Lafandar and continue the research in the royal archives.' Filfarel folded her arms. "'And what are you doing, leading the Gazneth hunt?' "'Someone must,' said Tanalasta, "'and I am the one who knows them best.'" 13. Gods, but he'd missed the wild, rolling northern marches of the realm. Azun looked out over miles of sheep-studded hills with stone rabble and tangle-stump fences, broken here and there with dense stands of trees. A lone hawk circled high in the cloudless blue sky. Turning his head slowly, the king of Cormir could see the rising purple and gray bulk of the stonelands on one hand, and the distant green and gold of the tilled fields nigh Immersy on the other. It had been years since he'd ridden these backlands with no more cares cloaking his shoulders than keeping word of his worst exploits from his father's ears. A sudden thought made him turn his head to look at his younger daughter. Alice Hare's gaze was fixed on his face, a curiously gentle expression in her often stormy eyes. Over the last few years, the cares of the steel princess had been just the same as those of her young and carefree father. Azun wondered just how much the war wizards who watched over her omitted from the reports they sent back to the king. A lot, if he knew anything about wizards. "'Gods,' he murmured to Alasair, leaning his head toward her to make his lowered voice carry. "'But I begin to remember from my younger days the real reasons you spend so much of every year out here, riding with your sword drawn and your men around you. "'Prettier perils than at court, eh?' the steel princess murmured back. "'Though truth be told, my nobles treat me to a petty, bickering, little traveling court that's all their own.' "'I suppose so,' 
Azun agreed, eyes still on the rolling beauty of this corner of his realm. And with all of that riding with you, why ever seek the dust of Suzail for pomp, feuding, and intrigue? Why, indeed, Alasair echoed, as they shared a smile. Azun shook his head. Gods, but Alasair reminded him of himself, the younger, more rebellious self, who'd chafed over formalities and ceremony and preferred flirtations to feasts. Why, for half the coins in his— My king, a landlord he did not know, called out. There's a man come to us who demands audience with you. He gives his name as Randeron Farlakir, and says he brings urgent word from court. Azun frowned and exchanged glances with the steel princess. Alasair gave him a half-smile and a gesture that said clearly, "'Your trials, and you're welcome to them. "'Consider yourself in command for the next few breaths, ere I return,' he told her with a wry smile. "'Urgent word from court always meant trouble. "'Moreover, the landlord was obviously suspicious of the messenger. "'When armies go to war,' Many men ride with their suspicions held ready before them like a drawn sword. "'I will speak with him,' Azun told the officer. "'Conduct me to him without delay.' It seemed like only a passing breath or two before Azun found himself looking down at a travel-stained man in plain leather armor who lay gasping on his back on an untidy heap of blankets. His weapons had been taken from him, and he was ringed by the glittering points of many drawn swords. "'My king,' he panted, trembling with weariness, "'I am come from the wyvern spurs with pressing news intended for your majesty's ears alone.' "'Withdraw,' Azun murmured, lifting a hand without bothering to look up. "'I know this man.' In truth, he'd laid eyes on the ranger only once or twice before, and had never known his name. But if Cat Wyvernspur trusted a man, that was good enough for the king of Koromir. Shuddering with exhaustion, Randeron was now trying to roll to a kneeling position. Azun put a hand on his shoulder to stop him, and to induce the more suspicious purple dragons to put away their blades and step out of hearing. "'How came you here?' the king murmured. "'Ran, my liege, the Lady Wyvernspur, used her magic to teleport me to a watchtower well south of here. A gas nest came and circled it before diving at me. I, I fought it off and ducked into ditches and ran until it flew away. Then I met with goblins and fought and ran more.' "'Goblins,' Azun nodded. Thus far they'd encountered only orcs. The king took note of this, then asked, "'What news?' "'The crown princess faces troubles at court. "'Though her words are firm and fair, "'some nobles openly refuse to obey her, "'vowing to follow only you, sire. "'The dragon queen is similarly ignored "'by those who choose to do so, and they are many.' "'There came a stirring among the men standing around, "'a muttering without words, "'but Azun never looked up from the laboring lips. "'The ranger coughed weakly and went on. "'The situation is... Not good. Sembian interests seek a breach in our armor. Many factions at court rise like restless lions to renew old plots, dismissing the war in the north as a ploy of the crown to empty their coffers and keep their sons as royal hostages. And the old whispers of rebellion, Arabelle and Marcember, hidden royal blood heirs and all— are heard again in the passages of the palace and the back rooms of the taverns. The Wyvernspurs fear the Oberskir hold on the dragon throne will be lost, and Cormir itself split over warring noble ambitions, despite the real foes that threaten the realm here. All it will take, Cat says, if I may be so bold, sire, is one blade through the wrong, hot-headed noble's guts, and the bloodshed will begin. You are needed, Majesty, and better you come surrounded by loyal and ready knights in strength to slay any thoughts of daggers in royal backs or sealing spells sent down onto crowned heads. The king nodded, allowing the wry ghost of a smile to touch his lips. I can tell there's more, yet. Speak. The ranger let out a deep and unhappy sigh, then said in a rush, 
Princess Tanalasta looks unwell and not content, yet she seems determined to personally destroy the Gaznes. The more they're seen, the more she rushes to cross blades with them. He and Azum stared into each other's eyes for a long, shared breath, both of them keeping their faces carefully expressionless, before the ranger added quietly, I, too, have a daughter left alone in this sire. The wyvern spurs are not the only ones who fear that Cormir may soon lose its heir. So it would be best, Azun murmured, if I reached the gas nest before the princess does. Another smile twisted his lips before he added, And even better, if I had some sort of plan in mind for defeating them when we do meet. Majesty, Randaron agreed carefully. It would. Azun nodded. You've done well. Stay in the field with the Princess Alisair, I charge you. As I take the men we can best spare here, and head south in haste to hold my kingdom. He strode away, murmuring, And if the gods really smile upon me, perhaps I'll even win myself a little rest. Old lions, however stupid, deserve to lie down once in a while. Randaron knew he wasn't supposed to officially hear that last royal remark, so he let his eyes close and kept silent. Silence is often the best court policy. 14. The echo of a distant splash rolled down the river behind Vangerdehast and faded into nothingness. The wizard turned and looked toward the sound. The water was as black as the foul air, and the air was as black as the contorted walls, and the walls were as black as a chimney flue, save that instead of soot they were covered in some black scum that seemed half moss and half stone. Circles of the stuff floated on the water just a few inches beneath Vanger de Hast's chin, stinking of must and mildew, and some ancient filth he did not dare consider, given that he was in a tunnel just one level beneath the city of the Grod. The cavern remained ominously quiet, but at the last bend behind Vanger de Hast, the scum circles were rising and falling ever so slightly on the river's surface. The wizard looked at the tiny crow-leg hovering above his palm, which he was holding above the water more or less at eye level, and saw that it was still pointing forward. The gasneth remained somewhere ahead. So what was behind? Visions of albino sharks and cave-dwelling anacondas began to fill his head, but Vangerdehast dismissed these fears as unfounded nonsense. Such creatures needed a steady diet, and the goblins, the only substantial food source he had found in these caverns, had repopulated their city only recently. It seemed more likely that a patch of scum had simply fallen off the ceiling and made the sound as it landed. Much more likely. Vangerdehast continued down the passage, following his makeshift compass down one fork of a three-way intersection. If he was right about the Gaznes' identity, and he sincerely hoped he was not, the thing was Rowan Cormeril, the handsome young ranger whom Princess Tanalasta had found so unfortunately infatuating. The wizard had last seen them together in the foothills of the Stormhorn Mountains, when the pair had pulled free of his grasp to avoid being teleported back to Arabelle. At the time, Vangetahast had been furious with the pair, but now he was... Well, now he was scared to death. If Rowan had become a Gazneth, he could not bear to think what had happened to Tonalasta. The water grew a few inches deeper, and the wizard tipped his chin back and slipped his feet carefully along the bottom. Holding the torch so high tired his arm, and he wondered whether it might be wiser to cast a spell of light on the crow's foot. With both hands full, he would have a difficult time defending himself if there was something behind him, and there was a very real possibility of stepping into a hole and dousing the flame anyway. But casting a light spell would mean feeding Nalavara more magic, and he was worried about how close he had come to freeing her already. A few hours after his near capture at the Goblin Tower, Vangerdehas had taken advantage of his pursuer's lingering confusion to return to the Great Plaza and sneak a peek at Nalavara. 
To his horror, he had found a dragon fully six hundred feet long, with the remains of his weather cloak, wands, rings, and other magic items lying dull and drained of mystic energy around her head. Though she was still attached to the ground along one flank, writhing in the air were four tree-sized legs, a wing large enough to shade the Suzale Palace, and a spiked tail half the length of the royal parade ground. The sight had frightened Vanger de Hast so greatly that when the inevitable cohort of goblins found him out, he very nearly allowed himself to be captured rather than cast another spell. Only his determination to track down the gasneth and find out what had happened to Tunnelasta had convinced him to flee. Another splash sounded in the cavern behind Vangelahast, louder and more certain than the last. The noise was followed by a hissed chitter, and for a moment the wizard could not grasp what he was hearing. It could not be goblins, not when the water was so deep it soaked his beard to the chin. He listened and heard a soft, rhythmic purling, and his disbelief changed to dismay. They had followed him and his own nose told him how. Though he had grown accustomed to the acrid stench of his torch, the smoke it produced was heavy and rancid, and must have seemed like a beacon to the goblins. Vanger de Hast glanced one more time at the crow's leg in his palm, then thrust the butt of his torch into a small wall crevice. The flames began to lick a loose sheet of black crust, and almost instantly the edge began to smolder, sending plumes of ghastly-smelling smoke rolling along the ceiling. Chuckling quietly at the thought of what the bitter stench would do to the goblins' sensitive noses, the wizard set off into the darkness. A few minutes later, the goblins seemed to realize what was happening, and filled the tunnel with angry chittering. Though Vanger de Hast was already feeling his way around the next bend, he paused long enough to look back down the passage into what had become a flickering ring of fire. The goblins were paddling into view on rough-hewn logs, sitting three and four to a raft, with their legs dangling in the water and using crudely shaped paddles to propel their craft forward. As they approached the burning wall, they squealed and pressed their faces into their elbows, trying to shield their heat-seeing eyes from the flames. The first log hit the wall and spilled its passengers into the water, and it became apparent that goblins could not swim, at least not in bronze armor. The second log seemed to be staying on course, so Vanger de Hast backed around the corner and turned into the darkness— then let out a cry when he saw a pair of pearly eyes shining down on him from above. The cry elicited a cacophony of chortled commands and sloshing paddles from the goblins, but Vanger de Hast had no time to react before a hand grabbed him by the beard and hauled him onto a small rock ledge. "'I am growing tired of saving you, old Snoop,' said the same husky voice he had heard earlier. A powerful hand caught Vanger de Hast's wrist and plucked the enchanted crow's leg from his palm. "'Were I you, I would not rely on my good graces again!' Vanger de Hast's heart sank, for there were only a handful of individuals who knew him by Tanalasta's favorite nickname, and Rowan Cormeril was one of them. "'Stay here, old fool!' Rowan dropped off the ledge and slipped into the water, as silently as an owl slips into the air. "'Rowan, wait!' Vanger de Hast rolled to his belly in the darkness and began to feel for the edge. The goblins' voices rose in a sudden panic. Then a tremendous wind roared through the passage, stirring the water into a splashing frenzy and threatening to tear the wizard from his perch. Vanger de Hast pressed his face to the ledge and dug his fingers into the dirt, working his hand cautiously forward until he came to a loose rock. When the wind finally slackened to a mere tempest, he sat up and rubbed his fingers over the stone's slickness, casting a spell of continual light upon it. 
He would have preferred to give himself the ability to see in darkness, but that particular enchantment required either an agate or a pinch of dried carrot to activate it, and he had lost most of his spell components when Rowan pulled him out of his weather cloak at the Goblin Tower. A deep glow arose within the rock, flooding the passage with magical light and illuminating the gasneth at the bend of the passage. Though the wind was roaring past his head and the water crashing against him in waves, Rowan stood upright without any hint of effort, his long hair hanging to his collar motionless, straight, and utterly undisturbed. Finally, no more sounds were heard from the goblins, and the wind slackened to a mere bluster. Rowan glanced back once, then looked away and started around the corner without causing the water to ripple or purl even slightly. "'No, you don't, Rowan Cormero,' Van Jutehast swung his legs over the lip of the ledge and dropped into the water, then splashed down the passage after the gasneth. "'Come back here, coward! Stand and present yourself!' Much to Van Jutehast's surprise, he rounded the corner and found himself looking up into Rowan Cormero's murky face. With a sturdy brow, prominent cheeks, and cleft chin, the scout's features were still chiseled and handsome. They were also more gaunt and pronounced than Van Jutehast remembered, so that the overall effect was one of power and domination. "'Do I look like a royal scout to you?' Rowan's hand seemed to twitch. Van Judehast found his wrist locked in the Gazness grasp. The time when I must take orders from you is long past. No one has released. Van Judehast had to swallow to wet his dry throat. No one has released you from your oath. I am the king's royal magician and superior to every soldier in the land. You will do as I command. "'Unless the blood of all Cormerals runs treasonous?' Rowan's eyes grew white with anger. His grasp began to tighten, and Van Jutehast's fingers came open of their own accord. The Gazneth glared at him for a long moment, perhaps debating whether to continue squeezing, then plucked the glowing stone from Van Jutehast's hand and began to absorb its magic.' For someone reputed to be the most cunning man in Cormir, you are certainly the fool, said Rowan. I would think you would know the consequences of using magic by now. Van Jutehast began to breathe easier. I do, but you have made yourself difficult to reach. It was the only way to find you. You have found me now. Rowan absorbed the last of the light from Van Jutehast's rock, then dropped it into the water. And I pray you are done mocking me. Do not be so bold again. Ignoring the menace in the Gazness words, Van Jutehast reached out blindly and caught his arm. The flesh was firm and cold, and as slimy to the touch as that of an eel. I did not come to mock you, the wizard said. To kill you, perhaps, or to ask your aid, depending. Rowan's eyes continued to glow white. "'Depending on what?' "'On what became of Tunnelusta?' Van Jutehast said. The anger faded from Rowan's gaze. He turned away, plunging the cavern into total darkness. Thinking his quarry was slipping silently away, Van Jutehast sloshed forward and ran headlong into the Gazness back. "'I left her with Alasir,' said Rowan. I was leaving the company to find you, and they were on their way to Goblin Mountain. That was the last time I saw her, and knew it to be certain. And knew it to be certain, Van Jutehast echoed. Rowan grabbed the wizard by the shoulder and led him up the passage, guiding him onto a slick incline that climbed up onto the ledge where he had been earlier. It was perhaps a day after the battle at the Farsi Marsh, Rowan began. Your company lay floating and bloated in the water, and the orcs were still looting the bodies. 
I discovered a note in a lavender spyglass charging whoever found it to report to the king that the scourges of Alondo's prophecy were awakened. I took the note and was about to start for Goblin Mountain when your horse, Cadmus, broke out of hiding in some willows at the edge of the marsh. As Cadmus crested the hill, the Gaznes noticed him and left their keep. It was all I could do to get mounted and into the woods before they were on us. They hunted me the rest of the day. One even even ambushed me as I crossed a clearing and latched its talons into my shoulder before I dragged it into a tree. That night I decoyed the monsters by activating my cloak's throat clasp and sending it downstream on a log. I slipped away and was no more than a day from Goblin Mountain when I heard her. Tunnel Lostone? There was a pause in which Vandra de Hast could imagine the Gazneth nodding. Then Rowan continued. She was screaming and begging me to kill her, and and I couldn't bear it. I knew Alafandar's message to be even more important than Tanalasta's life, but I was in love, and I went after her. The Gazness turned northward and started to play games, scraping her along the treetops above my head, landing on the other side of a meadow and making her beg for death until I used my escape pocket to reach her. Then, snatching her away and flying off before I came out of the after days, by then I knew they didn't want to kill me. They were just luring me northward into a trap. But what could I do? I was too exhausted to think straight and terrified of letting her suffer. Even if I had turned back, they would have killed me on the spot. No doubt, said Vandra de Hurst, trying not to sound unsympathetic. But what of Tunnel Asta? I, I don't know, Rowan said. Before I knew it, we had crossed to the north side of the storm horns again. The last I saw her, King Baldivar had her on the far rim of gorge. And he was, he was doing something unthinkable to her. I went mad and used my escape pocket to reach his side of the canyon. But when I came out of the after days, she wasn't there. Only my cousin Xanthan, laughing and holding me over the canyon by my collar, threatening to push me in after Tunnelasta. Though he was already in the dark, Vanderhurst closed his eyes and whispered, "Very good, very good," echoed Rowan, sounding less surprised than he might have. Then it was a decoy. Our own trick used against us, Vanderhurst confirmed. Baldivar can create illusions. He did the same thing to us at the Farsi battle, and it nearly cost Alafandar his life. It has cost me more than that, I fear, Rowan continued. I slipped my iron dagger out and managed to plunge it into Xanthan's stomach, then held on as he stumbled back from the edge of the rim. Baldivar started after me, then the others appeared, and I took Cadmus and fled into a grove of the largest trees I can ever recall seeing. The Gazness stopped at the edge and stood there, hurling the vilest curses I've ever heard, and I couldn't understand why they didn't come after me until I looked around and saw the elven glyphs. They were similar to the glyphs we found on those twisted trees over the tombs Baldivar and the others came from, except these trees were not twisted and diseased. They were all beautiful and healthy, and when I ran my finger along the letters, the songs made me cry. Even the gazness fell quiet until the music was done. A whole copse of trees of the body, Vandra de gasped. A tree of the body was a sort of memorial created by the ancient elves who had inhabited Cormir before men. According to Tanalasta, and the princess was known for being well-read on such things, when an esteemed elf died, his fellows sometimes inscribed his epitaph on the trunk of a small sapling and buried the body beneath the roots. Vangitahas did not understand all of the subtleties of such commemorations, but he had never before heard of even two of the majestic trees being found in a single location, much less a whole copse. "'You are sure?' They were trees of the body? Vangita Hast asked. Later I became sure, Rowan said. There were hundreds of them, 
and the gas nests kept me trapped among them for nearly a ten day. They watched me constantly, and were there waiting every time I tried to leave. One night I decided the time had come to die or escape, and I was riding out when the ghost of a handsome elf lord rose from the ground before me. He wore a three-spiked circlet set with a single purple stone, and in his hand he carried a golden staff with the haft twisted in a rope-like pattern, and he spoke to me harshly. Nine days have thou forsaken thy duty hiding here, human, and nine days have we sheltered thee. But ere thou leave, know thy death atones nothing. To undo thy betrayal, a greater amends must thou make, at a cost greater to thee than death. I did not need to ask what betrayal, for I still carried Alafandar's letter close to my heart, and knew well how I had failed. I had let my love for Tanalasta blind me to my duty, and I knew that Cormir would pay dearly for my failure. What could I do but bow my head and reply, My lord, I would redeem myself. My only question is how. The elf warned me again of the terrible cost, and again I told him I would gladly pay. The elf smiled then and took Cadmus's reins from my hand. He whispered something in the horse's ear that caused him to nicker and nuzzle me on the cheek, then turn and flee to the far side of the grove. The elf spoke again. No, human, he said, that I am Ilafar, king of scepters, and this grove is my burial place, where a thousand treasures have lain hidden for more long ages than I can count. Follow me, that I may bestow on thee the greatest of all, the scepter of lords. King Ilafar led me to the center of the grove, where stood an ancient oak the size of a castle keep. The ghost pointed at the base of the tree and said, Take my scepter and give it to thy king. Tell him that when wielded with compassion, it has the power to smite any elven spawned evil, but only given that all the wrongs that spawned that evil in the first place have been set right. By surrendering the scepter to a human, I am righting the first. It will be for he who wields this weapon to right the other. And that was all King Ilafar said, said Rowan. He stepped away and faded back into his tree. I drew my dagger and began to dig where he had pointed. No sooner had my blade touched the soil than the gasness screeched in triumph and streaked in to attack. I thought for a moment they had deceived me again and tricked me into dispelling the grove's magic protection, which I am sure now was their entire purpose in luring me north in the first place. But if so, the last trick was on them. An army of elf ghosts rose from beneath their trees to meet the gasness, and the trees wove their branches into an impenetrable net of protection. The gasness tore into the limbs with fire and blight, and the ghosts tore into them with sword and club. I concentrated on my digging, and it was not long before I had wormed my way well down among the roots. But even the elves could not hold on forever, and it seemed the deeper I dug, the weaker they grew. By the time I finally broke into Ilafar's treasure chamber, the great tree branches behind me were cracking and snapping as the gasness tore through. I pulled my commander's ring and activated the light spell, then cried out at all the treasure I saw heaped beneath the tree. There were hills of it, glowing with magic and crusted with enough gems to dazzle the eyes of old Thor glory himself. A loud rumble rolled down the tunnel from outside. Then all the trees started to sing at once. I rushed into the chamber and began tearing through the treasure heaps. There were wands and staves and rods of every ilk. Any one of them and none of them could have been the scepter of lords, and I despaired of ever finding the right one. Then a terrible rasping broke out in the tunnel behind me. Thinking to bring the roof down on my pursuer, I grabbed a silver her sword and rushed toward the mouth, and that is when I saw it, resting in the crooks of two roots, with a thin circlet of gold hanging from its haft. The scepter of lords, 
Vangitahast asked. Rowan's pearly eyes rose and fell in the darkness. It was a golden scepter, fashioned in the shape of sapling oak, with finely wrought branches sprouting off at odd angles, and a huge pommel of amethyst carved in the figure of an acorn. It was the most beautiful treasure in the chamber, and there was no mistaking its power. I snatched the scepter off its hooks and stepped off to the side of the tunnel, still fumbling with the crown on its haft as I cocked the thing back. The crimson eyes of a gazneth appeared in the tunnel mouth, and I threw my weight into a mighty strike. But as I brought the head down, a hellish curse came from the tunnel and spilled out into the room in billowing black fumes. The ground shook and cracked beneath me. The floor gave way, and I fell into this horrid abyss, and I have been no more able to leave than you have. What of the scepter? Vangita Hast's heart was pounding so ferociously he could barely hear his own question. Tell me you didn't lose the scepter. Of course not. Rowan's fingertips crackled with tiny balls of lightning, illuminating the ledge in twinkling bursts of silver. He reached behind him and produced a small, triple-spiked circlet with a pale amethyst set in the center. "'Nor the crown that went with it,' Vangitahast snatched the crown from the Gazness hand. It was as dull as lead, all the golden magic gone from it. "'You didn't!' "'I am afraid I did, before I realized what I was turning into,' said Rowan. On the other hand, it was a useful lesson. The scepter of lords is still full of magic, and hidden safely away, some place where Nalavara's goblins will never find it, and where it hasn't been a constant temptation to me. That's something, Vangitahast flipped the leaden crown in his fingers, silently bemoaning the loss of such ancient magic. He could have learned much by examining it, almost as much as he had by listening to the tale of its recovery. He patted Rowan warmly on the knee, then instantly regretted the gesture when it elicited a shudder of revulsion from the Gazneth. "'You've done well, Rowan. We can make this work for Cormir.' "'Oh!' the Gazneth waved his crackling fingers around the cavern in despair. "'How oh, can we make this work for anyone?' Vangertahas smiled. Nalavara went to a lot of trouble to trick you into breaking the power of Ilafar's burial ground. She wouldn't have done that unless she was worried about the scepter, a weapon you've kept out of her hands. Rowan's expression brightened considerably. We're going to kill her? Not us, said Vangita Hast. He was thinking of the ancient secret that he and the other royal magicians had helped their kings keep for so many centuries. Azun will do it. If the scepter is to work, I fear it must be wielded by a king. Fifteen. Tears of Chontia, Azun swore. Even if they raid so savagely and so unopposed as to strip the land bare, fair Cormir's northern reaches can't feed this many goblins. Where are they all coming from? The grim, weary officers around him didn't bother to answer. After hacking a bloody way through two walls of goblins already this day, the king's army had crested another hill to find the rolling country ahead, awash in hooting, chittering goblins. The little humanoids waved their banners tauntingly at the sight of the royal standard, but held their positions as if they were the claws of a well-disciplined foe rather than charging in their usual wild flood. The way south, it seemed, was blocked by several thousand sharp and waiting goblin blades. "'Hold ranks!' a sword lord snapped, as some of the men ahead surged forward, armor clanking. "'To Talos with orders and ordered formations now!' a nobleman roared, raising his blade. "'In at them and slay, for a zoon and for me. Others took up the cry. For a zoon, and for me. The king watched them charge to their deaths with frustration and pleasure, warring behind a tightly expressionless face. 
He couldn't afford swift-tempered, disobedient idiots of nobles here in the field, or, for that matter, flourishing anywhere in the realm. But it did feel good to hear that battle cry and see the excitement around him as men joined in, waving their blades, but holding their positions under the watchful gazes of growling sword captains and cold eyed lance lords. Let no true Cormirian leave this height without orders to do so, a sword lord roared, and Zoon doffed his helm to let the eyes he knew would be turning his way clearly see him nodding in agreement. He needed capable swords, not glory-seeking corpses. He also needed a way south to Suzale that would be swifter and less bloody than carving his way through all of these waiting goblins. The war wizards had already agreed grimly that wild nursery tales notwithstanding, the army was much too large to teleport, not even by draining all their magic items and trying a combined spell— even without Gazness racing to pounce on any significant use of magic, could they guarantee to pluck more than a few hundred men south. Their best efforts, therefore, could only serve to scatter the army, and even slay a few men with the roiling energies of the translocational magic. Even that was assuming nothing at all went wrong, and something would, they all knew. On battlefields, something always did. There had to be another way, even if he'd had time and men enough to march wide to the east, his purple dragons couldn't outrun eager goblins or avoid running into the barrier of the wyvern water that left only the forest. It would be something of a shield against spying eyes and a deadly maze for both his men and any goblins who plunged into it in search of them, unless of course. He had a guide as expert as the foresters who accompanied him on his rarer and rarer stag hunts. That meant finding dusk runes, or one of the other dozens of foresters' cottages, along the edge of the forest. Felden was a local man. He turned to the landlord standing nearest and said crisply, "'Sword Captain Felden, to me, at once.' The man scurried to obey, and it seemed like the space of only two long, goblin-surveying breaths before Felden's familiar ragged mustache was bobbing before him. "'Your Majesty!' "'Good Felden,' he said. "'I need the nearest royal forester of skill brought before me, well guarded and in a trice.' The sword captain's weathered face split in a broad smile. "'Would the warden of the king's forest do my liege?' He's staying at Ildolf's stead, not three bow-shots west. With all his family, in the very teeth of all these goblins, Felden's smile disappeared. Well, the way of it's like this, your majesty, he muttered. Lord Huntsilver and Goodman Ildolf are both of the mind that the royal writ is a shield for all loyal men. If the goblins aren't there by the king's will— then before all the gods, the goblins just aren't there, Azun completed the sentence calmly, or at least they dare not attack or despoil save by royal leave. Felden nodded, and Azun smiled slowly and said, Fetch them both. Before Felden could more than open his mouth to reply, something occurred to the king. Bid the warden bring his family. Let the ladies be ready to march, without two warrior loads of jewels and finery each. As warden, Maystoon Huntsilver saw to the state of all the game in the king's forest, and all of the royal foresters, too. He was one of the few Huntsilvers capable of doing the crown so useful a service as guiding the royal army through the heart of the forest. Moreover, he was one of the few who probably would want to. There have been many marriages between the Hunt Silvers and the Oberskiers down the years, but there were Hunt Silvers who'd probably laughed to see Azun the Fourth laid in his grave. Maystoon's last surviving son, Cordron, was one of those nobles exiled and disinherited for conspiring with Gaspar Cormeril in his plot to seize the throne. Maystoon himself, however, 
or so Vanjur de Hest had sworn, after a little covert magical spying, was genuinely ashamed of that, and anxious to return to the royal good graces. Soft-spoken and even effeminate, he was that rare thing, a forester who knew wildlife and how to encourage their breeding. He was also a courtier so skilled with his tongue, and so watchful as to always say the right thing, in any awkward situation at court. Maystoon had at least two more troubles than the tendency of his sons to get themselves killed or mired in treason. He had a wife and a daughter. His lady, Alanna, much younger than her husband and a daunting horn by birth, was an ash blonde of thin, sleek, devastating beauty, whose dancing had been known to make watching men growl with lust, and who knew her powers only too well. She amused herself by toying with almost every noble she met, setting some against others, and all to doing ridiculous tasks and pranks, purely in hopes of tasting her favors. Maystoon's daughter, Shalana, was a very different bad apple. She played her own pranks, knowing just enough magic to be malicious and dangerous to those she dared to turn it against. That one was fat and sullen resenting her mother for being beautiful and the war wizards for not making fat Shalana the beauty she deserved to be, and all young noblemen for courting her for her riches, and standing when she knew she disgusted them, and everyone else, Azun supposed, for seeing her as she truly was, both inside and out. Azun didn't know which she-viper was worse. Half his kingdom was under the sway of folk worse than these, the kingdom he was fighting to preserve, and would some day die fighting for. Yet it was the only realm he had, and his home, and Azun knew he'd not trade it for another, if his own queen and all the other women in it were Alanna's and Shalana's. Right now he wished Maystoon joy of them, and hoped he'd not have their blood on his hands a few days from now. He'd hate to give that sort of cold reward to so good and loyal a man. There came the warden now, smiling eagerly at his king, and bustling in his haste to serve. Azun watched him come, and drew in a deep breath. Yes, there were a lot of good and loyal men in Cormir he'd not want to hand the cold reward of death to in the days ahead and a few others who must be stone-cold insane to want the dragon throne for themselves. 16. Though the summit of Jondal's Ridge stood well hidden beneath an ancient forest of giant hawthorn and oak, the west side fell away in a steep scarp that overlooked all Cormiers south of Grey Oaks, from her camp table beneath the spreading boughs of an old iron bark, Tanalasta could mark the location of each gasneth by the particular devastation following in its wake. Luthax's wildfires gushed smoke along the star water, Suzara's blight browned the fields between Kalantar's bridge and Marsember, and Xanthan's locusts boiled northward along the way of the dragon. The Gaznes were easy enough to locate, but what could she do to stop them? So far, Tanalasta's campaign to save the South had been little more than a meaningless string of hard rides and costly battles. After spying a Gaznes depredations, she and a company of hand-picked soldiers would teleport to the scene to keep the Phantom pinned in place until the rest of the army arrived to destroy it. Inevitably, they caused the area a lot of inadvertent damage, then finally suffered too many casualties to prevent their foe from escaping. That the creatures always seemed to appear a good half-day's ride from her army struck the princess as more than coincidence, especially since she was taking precautions to keep the force hidden but she also knew that her suspicions might be little more than the frustration of trying to catch up to a winged enemy. A loud rustle sounded from the woods behind Tanalasta, and she turned to find Korvar Rallyhorn leading Filfairel, Alafandar, and a small company of bodyguards toward her table. 
hoping her black weather cloak would be enough to conceal her growing bulk from the queen's discerning eye, Tanalasta still had not found the right occasion to mention her pregnancy. She spread her arms and went to embrace her mother. "'You had a safe journey, Majesty?' "'No journey is safe these days, Tanalasta, but it was without incident.' Filfavorl returned her daughter's embrace, then stepped back and eyed her up and down. "'I see the hardships of the trail have not affected your appetite.' Tanalasta launched instantly into the response she had planned. "'We do a lot of waiting. Sometimes it seems there is nothing to do but eat.' She stepped away from her mother and embraced a lavender. "'And how are you, old friend?' "'As well as I hope you are,' the sage pressed his mouth to her ear. "'Tell her soon, my dear. You are running out of time.' Tanalasta laughed lightly, as though at some jest. "'A lavender! That is not a very nice thing to say to a princess.' She released him and glanced over to the war wizards in her mother's party. Sarman the Spectacular could not attend? Still too old, Alafandar said. The royal priests have not yet learned how to reverse the Gazness aging effect. Pity, said Tanalasta. Perhaps Harvest Master Foley will have some thoughts on the matter when we return. She guided the pair to her camp table, where Auden Foley sat poring over maps and dispatches. As they approached, the priest stood and bowed to Phil Farrell, who returned the gesture with a polite, if unenthusiastic, smile, then stepped away from his chair to embrace a Lafandar like the old friends they had become. Tanalasta waited while one of her bodyguards pulled a chair for the queen, then sat next to her. "'What news from Alasair and the king, Majesty?' She did not ask about Vangidahast. Nobody asked about Vangidahast any more. "'Still nothing about your friend, I'm afraid,' said Phil Farrell. They both knew what the princess was really asking, for the question was always Tanalasta's first on the infrequent occasions they spoke. "'Alasair seems to be holding her own against the orcs. "'Your father is on his way south to help with the Gazneths. "'Of course.' "'Though Tanalasta's heart sank, she tried not to show her disappointment. "'The mere presence of her father would draw the rest of the nobles into the fray "'and spare Cormir much suffering. "'That it would also undo what little progress she had made in winning their respect "'really did not matter.' The destruction of the Gazness was too important to let concerns about prestige interfere. I am sure the king will bring the situation quickly under control. Phil Farrell took her daughter's hand. That's what he's best at, Tonalasto, and what he loves. You are to be commended for taking the field in his place, of course, but everyone knows that your strength lies closer to the palace. Tonalasto withdrew her hand. Is that why you arranged this rendezvous? To fetch me home? Actually, I was the one who suggested a meeting. Alafandar took a seat across from Tanalasta, drawing her gaze away from the queen, and drew a roll of parchment from inside his robe. I have made some progress in our research, and I thought it might be of use here in the field. Tanalasta accepted the parchment, but glanced back to her mother. Then I'm not being recalled to the palace? As much as I would like to, the decision is not mine to make, said Phil Pharaoh. It will be for your father to decide when he arrives. Until then, all I ask, no command, is that you be careful. Command accepted. Tanalasta smiled and unfurled the parchment. It was a catalogue of the six gaznes they had identified so far along with notes on their demonstrated powers and speculations on their motivations for betraying Cormir. It also included suggestions as to what might satisfy the desires that had caused them to become traitors in the first place. "'This is good work, Alafandar. They're all here,' Tanalasta said, scanning the list. When she came to King Baldivar's name, she could not help glancing at her mother, whom the Gazneth had kidnapped in the early days of the crisis.' 
King Baldivar, scourge of madness, master of darkness, deception, and illusion, the queen quoted, guessing which entry had caused Tanalasta to stop reading. He loves the pain of others and their fear. To win power over him, one must surrender. Baldivar was the only one I could not figure out, said Lavendar. Your mother's experience was most useful on that account. Tanalasta let the parchment furl itself into a roll. Mother, I had no idea. Filfero merely looked away. When you faced the other Gasnes, I am sure your own distress was just as great. Though Tanalasta suspected it had not been, she knew better than to argue the point. Her mother had avoided speaking of the experience before, and showed little inclination to do so now. It was a Lavendar who filled the uncomfortable silence. The list names the weaknesses of all the Gaznes, but it remains lacking. You have not discovered why Xanthan's powers return? asked Auden. I fear not. A Lavendar shook his head drearily. Until we understand that, I fear we must assume that any advantage we gain over the others will also be temporary. Well, this is a good start, said Tanalasta, tucking the scroll into her cloak. At least it will help the advance company detain them until the rest of the army arrives. What will? asked a young voice at the fringe of the tree boughs. Have we discovered something good? Tanalasta looked up to see Orvindel Rallyhorn, Korvar's guileless younger brother, approaching with a tray of drinks. A squinting youth of about seventeen, he was as pale and awkward as Tanalasta had been at that age, which no doubt accounted for the sisterly affection she bore him. When the queen's bodyguards crossed their iron glaives in front of the boy, he cast a crestfallen look in Tanalasta's direction. I thought the royal sage most learned might like a refreshment. Corvair gasped at his brother's slighting of the queen, and Filfairil herself looked rather surprised, but Tanalasta could not help chuckling. It was just like the bookish youth to be taken with Elafandar and oblivious to the royals. She nodded to the guards and motioned the youth forward. A Lavendar Emerask, may I present Orvindel Rallyhorn? She waited for Orvindel to set the tray on the table and bow to the royal sage, then said, If aptitude and ardor count for anything, he will be master of the royal libraries one day. Orvindel's eyes grew wide. When? One day, Orvindel growled Corvar, clearly embarrassed by the youth's naivete. He stepped to his brother's side and motioned to Filfero. Perhaps you would like to bow to the queen, Orvindel? If Orvindel realized his mistake, his face did not show it. He bowed quickly to the queen and turned back to Alafandar. What do you think of Luthax? Because I was thinking— Noticing the horror-stricken look on her mother's face, Tanalasta caught Orvindel by the sleeve. "'Don't you have some supplies to see to?' Orvindel merely shook his head. "'That's done.' "'I think the princess is saying we would like some privacy,' said Alafandar, gently shooing the youth toward Korvar. "'If you are going to be a sage, you must start paying as much attention to what people do not say as to what they do.' A cloud came over Orvindale's face, but he finally seemed to realize that his presence was something of an intrusion and backed away. "'That's all right. I'll come back later.' He reached the circle of bodyguards and turned, saying, "'Maybe when the king gets here.' Tanalasta sent Korvar after the boy with a flick of her eyes, then looked to her mother. Before she could apologize, Filfairil asked, "'That boy is part of your army?' Not really, Tanalasta explained, but he knows these woods better than the wolves do. He leads out the supply trains and quietly keeps Korvar in good ale. A rare frown creased the queen's brow, but she looked pensively after the boy. Really, mother, said Tanalasta, you can't be thinking that Orvindel— How could I? 
interrupted Phil Farrell. I didn't know about him until now, but Korvar is still on the list. Korvar? Tanalasta rolled her eyes. That's not possible. You saw what he did when Sarman turned him into a hummingbird. As Tanalasta finished, the ewer and mugs Orvindel had brought began to shake. Suddenly, sharing in her mother's suspicions, the princess leaped up and swept the tray off the table. The ewer shattered on a stone and spilled nothing but red wine onto the ground. The whole ridge started to shake and rumble, and an alarm horn sounded in the top of the oak. Once, twice, then something crashed into the branches, and it came to a strangled halt. The queen's bodyguards and war wizards started forward, as did the princesses, and something long and green dropped to the table between Tanalasta and her mother. The princess was still trying to identify it when the thing twined itself into a coil and raised its head to strike at the queen. "'Gasniffs!' Tanalasta screamed. Tanalasta lashed out and caught the serpent by its coil, jerking the thing away from her mother even as it unfurled itself to strike. Filfaro cried out and pushed away from the table, tumbling over backward in her chair. The snake's head hung in the air above the queen, swinging back and forth for just an instant, then shot around in a half-circle and planted its fangs high in Tanalasta's breast. A torrent of liquid fire gushed through Tanalasta's chest and spread slowly outward. The arm holding the snake grew weak and numb and dropped limp at her side. She croaked out a surprised cry and staggered back two steps and fell. The ridge was shaken by a tremendous eruption. Pieces of slope began to slough off the escarpment and crash into the valley below. Tanalasta barely heard the roar, for a terrible ringing had filled her ears. She looked toward the sound and saw a fissure of magma opening down the spine of the ridge, spewing clouds of sulfur-stinking smoke and curtains of churning fire high into the air. The great oak listed across the fiery gap, and its trunk burst instantly into flames. The heat made Tanalasta feel queasy and confused. She tried to roll away and found herself too weak. She managed to turn her head, then saw a dark silhouette swooping down out of the smoking boughs above her. She recognized the wedge-shaped face of Xanthan Cormeril. Those red, ovoid eyes were hard to overlook, even with a head full of fog. Then saw a flurry of crossbow bolts catch the gazneth in the side, peppering him with so much iron that he veered over the escarpment and sank out of sight. A distant crackle came to Tanalasta above the ringing in her ears. Then there was a red flash and the anguished voices of burning dragoneers. Her vision narrowed and began to darken, and somewhere far away Korvar began to shout orders and curses. Auden Foley appeared above her. Then she felt something rip free of her breast. It was a pair of fangs. How could she have forgotten the snake? Auden's rough hand slipped under her weather cloak and ripped it free, exposing her from her collarbone to her swollen waist. He slashed the bite open with his dagger and began to squeeze the blood out, all the while calling upon Chontia to neutralize the poison and protect her from its effects. A circle of war wizards rushed up and stood gaping down at her. At first, Tanalasa could not imagine why they looked so surprised. Then she recalled her enlarged breasts and swollen belly, and the dark line running down the center of her abdomen. Auden placed his hands over the snake bite and chanted his spell, and Chontia's healing magic began to warm her chest and surge through her veins behind the snake's poison. A dozen dragoneers appeared next, gaping over the war wizard's shoulders and gasping at the obvious signs of the princess's pregnancy. Head clearing, Tanalasta reached for her torn robe, but found herself still too weak to pull it across her abdomen. A lavender appeared at her side and began to shove the circle back, chiding the gawkers for neglecting their fellows who were busy fighting the battle. As the chastened crowd backed away, Queen Filfarel finally broke into the circle and saw Tanalasta lying on the ground. Her eyes grew as large as saucers. She looked from Tanalasta's face to her belly, back to her face again, then to the thin pink blood dribbling out from beneath Auden's hands. 
"'Why is my daughter still here?' Phil Farrell demanded, speaking to no one in particular. She grabbed the nearest war wizard and shoved him toward Tonalasta. "'Back to the palace at once!' Seventeen. The cavern reminded Vangerdehast of what starry nights once looked like, save that these stars hung down around the height of his belly, winking and blinking in the radiance of the ball of lightning dancing atop the Gaznath's finger. The Gaznath, Vangerdehast, still found it difficult to think of him as Rowan Cormeril, had brought him into a strange warren of narrow passages and soaring chambers, packed with thousands of small goblin-sized iron racks. The racks looked eerily like goblin scarecrows, with anywhere from one to a dozen crooked iron arms hung with jagged scraps of metal, broken spectacles, brass buttons, bits of colored glass, anything that might glitter or gleam. No paths or trails twined through the peculiar little legion, which stood in such close array that Vanger de Haas could not thread his way through without constantly stopping to unsnag his tunic hem. The Gazness seemed to suffer no such difficulty. He slipped through the jagged hordes, swiveling his hips to and fro, sidestepping and pivoting past the little scarecrows so quickly that was all Vanger de Haas could do just to keep up. Presently the foul stench of rot and mold began to fill the air, and the scarecrows grew so thick that even Rowan could not slip through the host without dislodging a chain of brass buttons or knocking a string of tin scraps to the slimy floor. Whenever this happened, he paused to return the object to its place, arranging it more artfully than before. Vanger de Haas tried to move more carefully, but said nothing about the long string of displaced trinkets his own passage had left strewn behind. Finally they came to a dark clearing, and the stench grew so overbearing that Vanger de Hast had to cover his nose. The Gazneth stopped at the edge and put out an arm to prevent Vanger de Hast from going farther. "'Can you jump across, old man?' "'Across?' Vanger de Hast glanced down and saw that he was standing on the edge of a foul-smelling pit. By the wand! Rowan raised his hand, and the lightning ball expanded until Vanger de Hast could see the far edge of the pit, perhaps four paces away. Can you jump that far? When I was twenty, said Vanger de Hast, now it would take magic. Not wise, said Rowan. He took Vanger de Hast's arm and clasped it above the wrist. Grab hold! Vanger de Hast eyed the distance and frowned. Why don't we just work our way? The wizard's suggestion dissolved into a cry as the gasness sprang, jerking him out over the reeking pit. Vanger de Hast caught a glimpse of sheer, irregular walls, caked with a thick layer of brown something, then his knees buckled as he and Rowan crashed down on the opposite rim. Rowan pulled him to his feet and said, "'You're the one who asked for my help. Do not insult me by refusing to trust me. That might be a little easier if you let go.' Vanger de Hast cast a meaningful glance at his wrist, where the Gaznes hand was sliding down toward the ring of wishes. Rowan let go so abruptly that Vanger de Haas nearly fell and had to catch hold of a bauble rack. Let's go! Rowan backed away, his dark brow arched in horror, then started through the scarecrows again. Once you have the scepter, we are done with each other. Take it and hide some place I won't find you. I'm not going to do that. I can't. Before following, Vanger de Hast allowed the Gaznet to advance a few extra steps. Our chances are better together. Until my hunger grows too strong. Rowan was moving so fast that Vanger de Hast began to fall behind. Then I will steal your ring and drain the scepter. When that's gone, I'll turn on you. You won't. 
ventured Ahaz said. I can feed your hunger. But never satisfy it, said Rowan. The more you fill it, the more it will grow. It is like your thirst for the crown. Vangeta Hast stopped and stared at the Gaznas back. My what? I have no thirst for the crown. No? Then you did not claim to be king when Baldivar wounded you? Vangeta Hast was too astounded to reply. He had told Rowan about being wounded by the Mad King, but not what he had hallucinated. The wizard barely remembered that himself. A few steps later, Rowan stopped and turned to face Vangeta Hast. It was a guess. His tone was gentler now, almost sympathetic. But not a terribly hard one. We all have a dark seed in our hearts, and it is from that seed that a Gazness power sprouts. And what was your seed? Vangita Hast demanded huffily. Fear, Rowan said. Fear of never seeing Tanalasta again. Vangita Hast was not nearly as astonished by the admission as he was by his own reaction to it. During their travels together in the Stonelands, he had considered Roman's affection for Tanalasta a danger to the crown and done everything he could to discourage it. Now, here he was, relying on that same affection to ensure a Gaznes loyalty and protect himself from feral hungers he could only guess at. The irony was not lost even on Vangita Hast. He knew the real monster between them. Vangita Hast laid a hand on Rowan's shoulder and said, "'You'll see Tanalasta again. We both will.' "'And that is what I fear now,' Rowan shrugged the wizard's hand off. "'This is not how I want her to remember me.' "'She won't,' said Vangita Hast. What is done can always be undone. I'll see to it when we escape. If we escape, wizard, be careful of your arrogance. Vangita Hast started to object that it was confidence, not arrogance, then thought of how long he had been in the city already. Good advice, if we escape then. Rowan nodded, then started forward again. And if you do escape, you must never tell her what became of me. If I escape, I pray you will be there to tell her yourself. Vangita Hast's reply was careful, for there was a danger in making promises even a royal magician might find impossible to keep. He followed the Gaznath across the immense cavern, past another dozen pits, at least judging by the smell and the irregular crescents of dark clearing, and untold thousands more iron scarecrows. The chamber narrowed to a small passage, crammed full of racks and baubles, with a long sliver of a black pit running along one wall, then opened into an immense room where the scarecrow legion stood even thicker. The Gazneth threaded his way through the darkness into the center of the chamber, then stopped at the edge of another pit. This one was so large that the far side remained swaddled in darkness, even after Rowan doubled the size of the lightning ball on his fingertip. "'Down there!' Rowan pointed into the rancid hole. Vangita Hast dropped to his knees and peered down. The wall dropped away more or less vertically, though it was hard to be certain beneath a thick layer of brown gunk clinging to the sides. Somewhere below, he could not tell how far in the flickering light, lay a tangled mass of what looked like sticks. "'Do you see it?' "'Not without better light,' Vangita Hast said." I can't be sure what I'm seeing. Rowan dropped to one knee and thrust his arm down into the pit to illuminate the bottom, plunging the rest of the cavern into darkness. A loud chime rang out behind them, as though the sudden murk had caused someone to stumble into an iron scarecrow. Rowan extinguished his lightning ball at once. Goblins? Vangita Hast whispered. "'Not here,' came Rowan's soft reply. "'Not following us.' 
scraps of tin and glass began to tinkle as the unseen stalker broke into a rush. Vanger de Hast snatched a stone off the floor and started a light spell. He had not even reached the second syllable when Rowan shot a ball of silver lightning into the cavern roof. In the brilliant flash that followed, Vanger de Hast glimpsed a sinewy woman with flaming red hair dodging through the scarecrows toward them. Though her skin was fair, she was as naked as Rowan and far more powerfully built, with scaly red wings unfurling behind her back and a pair of fiery, diamond-shaped eyes glaring in their direction. She's free! As the cavern sank back into darkness, Rowan pushed Vanger de Hast away from the pit. Go! But Vanger de Hast had a better idea. He turned and flung himself into the pit. He gave himself a single heartbeat to vanish over the edge, then spoke a single word that slowed his fall to that of a feather. Seeing no reason to avoid magic now that Nalavara was free, he pulled a crow's feather from his pocket and spoke a long series of mystic syllables, then swooped down to snatch one of the sticks off the pit bottom. Vanger de Hast pulled into a steep ascent, flying blindly into the pitch darkness above. He pictured the scepter Rowan had described earlier, a long golden staff carved into the semblance of a sapling oak, then plucked a few hairs from his woolly beard. Leaving the direction of his flight to chance, he rubbed the hairs over the length of the stick and quietly uttered the twisted syllables of a little deception spell. The first clue of his enchantment's success came in the form of the heavy pulse of Nalavara's wings, approaching from straight ahead and rapidly growing louder. Vanjita Hast veered left and narrowly escaped a roaring cone of flame which splashed against the far wall and brightened the entire cavern. The wizard glimpsed the scaled figure of a two-hundred-foot elf woman changing into a giant dragon then again fell sightless when she closed her mouth and the flames vanished. Vanger de Hast cast a spell of light upon the stick in his hands, revealing what appeared to be an oak sapling of pure gold, with an amethyst pommel carved into the shape of a huge acorn. The wizard swung the staff to his side and saw Nalavara's huge mouth, all fangs and tongue and now completely reptilian, swooping into the light. He dived beneath her, then nearly lost control of his flight as her jaws boomed shut behind him. Flying beneath the dragon seemed to take forever. He passed between her first set of legs without incident, for Nalavara was still smacking her jaws and did not yet realize she had missed him. Her scales were the size of tournament shields and as thick as doors, and when Vanger de Hast came to her abdomen, the heat of the fire burning in her belly was enough to sear his flesh. Had he spread his arms and held the staff out to its full length, he would not have spanned half the breadth of her body. As he passed beneath her wings, the turbulence nearly knocked him from the air. Then a pair of taloned feet appeared in the light, reaching forward out of the darkness to slash at him blindly. He steered dead center between the huge claws and still had an arm's length to each side. Knowing better than to risk her thrashing tail, Vanger de Hast plunged groundward and turned toward the narrow passage by which he and Rowan had entered the chamber. If he could lure her out of the cavern, he would send his counterfeit scepter streaking off on its own and teleport back to recover the real one. Nalavara wheeled around, glancing off the wall and filling the cavern with an enormous crash. Knowing his light spell would draw her eye like a beacon, Vanger de Hast dropped to within a foot of the iron scarecrows, making wide erratic turns in both directions. The ploy failed miserably. As he neared his goal, a stream of fire shot past overhead and filled his escape tunnel, forcing him to dodge to one side and duck into a nearby hole. For a moment, Vanger de Hast dared hope it would not matter. The passage was as narrow as the first, and packed even more densely with the same iron scarecrows. He streaked twenty paces forward, then was forced to pull up short when he came to a gray, dead end. 
The ground rumbled, and the wizard knew Nalavara had landed behind him. He dropped down among the iron scarecrows and jerked one out of its base, then thrust it toward the entrance and began a spell. Vangitahas had barely started the incantation before Nalavara's snout blocked the mouth of the passage, her nostrils already boiling with fire. He rattled off the final syllables, sighed in relief as a thick wall of iron sprang up before him, then shrank away as the dragon's fiery breath crashed into his magic barrier. The roar continued for what seemed like several minutes. An orange circle appeared in the middle of the wall and slowly spread outward, pouring so much heat into the tunnel, Vangitahas thought he would burst into flames. The iron began to melt and drip out, and long tongues of flame poured through the hole, licking at the tunnel's end and turning the bauble racks white with heat. Vangitahast pressed himself to the side of the passage and crept closer to the iron wall, where he would be more sheltered from the flames. Finally, Nalavara's breath gave out, leaving a huge circle of white-hot iron between the wizard and his foe. He remained pressed against the wall, confident as ever that he would survive, but trying desperately to find some way to turn this to his advantage. "'Sir Magician!' rumbled Nalavara's voice. Vangitahas thought about remaining silent, then decided he would be better served by confidence. He took a deep breath and stepped in front of the hole. "'Still here, Nalava Orthotoral. He tipped the counterfeit scepter of lords briefly into view. "'I understand you have been looking for this. Feel free to come and get it.' A ghastly chuckle rumbled through the cavern outside. Then Nalavara tipped her head, blocking the mouth of the passage with one of her huge eyes. "'I think not, wizard. You have proven more challenging than I thought. "'Shall I take that as a compliment?' Vangitahast asked. Seeing no sense in allowing his foe more of a chance than necessary, he tipped the scepter out of sight. "'Or have you decided to surrender?' Again Nalavara chuckled. "'You are not that stupid, but you are dissatisfied. I could satisfy you. I trust your proposition is not a carnal one.' "'Hardly. You know what I have planned for Cormir, so your dream of ruling that particular realm is impossible. I see you have been eavesdropping.' "'More than you know, wizard!' Nalavara's eye was replaced by a half-open mouth, filled with teeth as tall as men. "'But there will be a realm left when I am through, a realm free of men, but in need of a ruler nonetheless.' "'How very generous of you,' Vangitahast said. "'So, you intend to give Cormier to a bunch of goblins? "'No wonder Ilifar's ghost rose against you.' "'The Grod will defend the wolfwoods,' Nalavara hissed. "'They will not yield it to a band of murdering humans.' "'Her voice grew calmer. "'And you, you will be their ruler.' "'I will, if you give me the scepter. "'And if I don't think that's a very good idea?' Vangitahast asked. "'Then destroy it yourself!' The dragon lowered her eye, again blocking the passage. "'It is all the same to me. "'All I need do is pick up the iron crown. "'It is waiting for you in the palace,' Nalavara said. "'Wear it, and you are master of your own kingdom.' "'A kingdom of goblins?' Vangitahast stepped back behind the iron wall. I think not. Nalavara remained ominously silent. Vangitahast closed his eyes and pictured himself standing beside the pit where he had left Rowan, then hissed his teleport spell. There was that instant of colorless, timeless falling. Then he found himself lying on his side, gasping for breath, staring up into a dark fissure between two teeth the size of wagon wheels. 
In his teleport after days, he could not imagine how he had managed to shrink himself to the size of a rat and end up in a terrier's mouth. Magic with me here, rumbled a deep voice. You are not as smart as I thought. Finally, recalling the situation, and recognizing by the scaly lip above what had happened, Vanger de Hast smashed the golden scepter against the dragon's teeth. The staff broke in two, and Nalavara flinched, jerking her head around and flinging the wizard across the dark chamber. He crashed down among the iron scarecrows, then rolled to a painful halt, and found himself staring at his hand, watching the glow fade from the stump of a broken little thigh bone. Though recovered enough from his teleport after days to recall that the scepter in his hand had been counterfeit, he couldn't think of why he should be holding a goblin's femur. Nalavara's head swung in his direction, then disappeared from sight as she spat out the top half of the thigh bone. Fraud! Vangita Hast rolled away before the stub could strike him, then found his escape blocked by a dozen iron scarecrows, and began to think the situation more serious than he had imagined. Ruin, he called. Help! A bolt of lightning crackled up from the opposite side of Nalavara and silhouetted her immense snout against the black vastness. Her head swung away and disappeared into the darkness. There was a booming crack as her jaws came together, and Rowan howled in agony. Vanger de Hast knew what he had to do. "'I wish Nalavara out of existence!' he cried, rubbing his ring of wishes. I wish Nalavathortoril the Red out of existence. I wish Lorelei Alavara out of existence. The cavern went suddenly quiet. Then a familiar flickering glow began to illuminate the scarecrows fifty paces distant. Rowan, Vangita Hast called. I, wizard, it's me. The Gazness stood and tried to walk, then doubled over backward and collapsed. But why in the thousand hells did you not make your wish before she bit me in two? Eighteen. Very good progress, Your Majesty, Warden Huntsilver confirmed. We can judge how far we've come by certain trees that mark the distance along the trail. There's one of them, Valerer's Oak, named for the sword captain buried there, after his valiant death fighting brigands by your great, great... A zoom. The voice in his mind was warm and familiar, yet sharp with an urgency he'd seldom heard before. It took a lot to break Filfarel's outward calm. The king put an imperious hand on Maystoon Huntsilver's arm, and the quick-witted and sensitive warden of the king's forest fell silent, instantly devoting his attention to guiding the silent Azun smoothly along the root-studded trail, so that the king need not even look down, or anywhere. "'Fairy, I am here,' he replied silently fumbling behind his belt buckle for the little catch that would release what he might need. To the gods' dark places with all Gazness. He was king in this land, and he'd use his ring if it seemed needful. What ill! Another three identical rings tumbled into his hand, the only spares he possessed, perhaps all that still existed. He held them ready to touch to the one on his finger not caring, just now, if he burned all the magic in the royal treasury. Gods, but he'd missed Fairy's voice, even if it did now bring dark tidings. Tana has been wounded, and, as many now know, though she keeps secrets well, is pregnant. Azun was more amused and pleased at his eldest daughter's spirit than angry, though he knew he should be furious at the keeping of a secret that could so endanger the crown. "'Do you approve of the father?' he sent to his queen, 
not hiding his feelings, as he touched one of the rings to the one he was wearing, and it flared up with a bright pulse that they felt in their linked minds like a racing line of fire. "'I have not yet met the father,' she replied tartly, "'so it is difficult to—' Her touch faded. Hastily, Azun thrust another ring against the first. In an instant it blazed up and was gone. Gods, would all magic prove so fleeting? Come to me, my lord love. Filfarel's voice was stronger now, almost pleading. Whatever Tana says or does, I need you. More than that, Cormir needs you here, if only briefly. I come in all commanded haste, Azun sent wryly, ending the contact with the wordless rush of emotion that they used in lieu of a kiss across the miles between their lips. Warden, the king said smoothly, shaking the ashes of a crumbling ring off a blistered finger and sliding his last replacement onto it without heed for the pain. Affairs of state call me away— Perhaps for a short time, but more likely for longer. You are to obey Sword Lord Ethan Glamourhand as you would me, and guide all here safely and swiftly through this my royal forest. The good Sword Lord is— Azun turned to find and identify Glamourhand, only to find him walking right behind him. Here, my liege, the Sword Lord said promptly. I have heard and will obey. Your needs now? Halt and rest the men, but speedily send to me the Lord Mage Arkenfrost. Glamourhand bowed his head and turned to give the orders. Ramirus Arkenfrost was the ranking war wizard accompanying the army, and a calm, shrewd diplomat to boot eminently suitable for teleporting himself and his king into the midst of a possibly tense court confrontation. He was also, as it happened, carrying many healing potions and other beneficial magics brought along to safeguard the king and officers. Azun disliked many of what he liked to privately call Vanji's brood, because they were arrogant— ignorant of the real world, openly ambitious and over-eager, or suffered from all of these faults at once. But there were exceptions, mages he liked on sight, and respected increasingly the more he saw of them. Arkenfrost was one such mage. Azun felt a rush of warmth now as he saw the man hastening toward him in response to the subtlest of hand signals from Glamourhand. Ever tired eyes like those of a hangdog hound, pepper and salt beard, well tailored but dark and plain robes worn over warriors' boots, what a war wizard who served Cormier before his own interests should be. Perhaps they could say and do the right things to rein in the more fractious nobles and set things to rights at court, then return to this army soon. Your Majesty, the wizard asked, kneeling as if he was an oath-sworn warrior. Some of Vanji's brood never knelt, even at the most formal state occasions. "'Good Lord Mage,' Azun greeted him, clasping the mage's work-hardened hands firmly and drawing Arkenfrost to his feet. "'I've urgent need to be at court, at the side of my queen. How soon can the two of—' Something blotted out the sun overhead.' something dark and large, very large. Almost instinctively, Azun drew in under the shading boughs of the nearest tree as he peered up at the biggest red dragon he'd ever seen. Just above the treetops it hung, gliding more slowly than he'd thought the lightest bird could manage, its sharp eyes fixed on the warriors of Cormir. Dragon ears and lion ears suddenly erupted into a whirlwind of shouting, trembling, and vomiting. Some men drew their swords and hacked wildly at those nearby, or at the empty air. One man stared fixedly ahead and began to foam at the mouth, while another sank down drooling something yellow from his blackening, bloated face. Others began to scratch feverishly, 
whimpering, and Azun saw a bristling green mold spreading over the limbs of one such victim, coating armor and flesh alike with horrifying speed. "'They come for us! They come!' one man bellowed, attacking the nearest tree with such insane force that his sword bent under the force of his blows. A sword captain beyond him started to howl like a hound. "'Sword Lord!' Azun said evenly. "'Are your wits still about you?' Ethan Glamourhand was sweating like a river, and a muscle was working on one side of his jaw, rippling in endless, uncontrolled spasms, but his voice was steady enough as he replied, "'I—I I think so, my liege.' The king drew his sword and said, "'Bring all of the mages and priests to me. Speedily, if you think they are as stricken as these men here.' Use any officers you can trust to disarm, and trust those doing harm to others. Worry not about chasing those who flee into the forest. Forthwith, your majesty, the sword lord snapped, and leapt away into the confusion of shouting, staggering men, with a stream of bellowed orders. The sound of his voice seemed to steady some of the demented, but Azun had eyes only for the war wizard standing beside him, and the point of his blade was raised and ready. Arkan Frost, he barked. The Lord Mage smiled thinly. I believe my wits are unaffected, Majesty, he said. In answer to your query, we can be standing beside the Dragon Queen in the space of two breaths. If I must now use magic to heal or quell maddened or injured clergy or mages, it will, of course, take longer to be elsewhere. Azun grimaced rather than grinning. You're as sound as any of us, I guess. Glamourhand was already trudging back toward them, head swinging constantly from side to side, as he shot glances around at the tumult of men among the trees. "'If any of the holy men or the mages were affected, Majesty, they've recovered speedily and thoroughly enough to conceal their reflections entirely from me. Can you handle those affected without us?' "'With all respect, Your Majesty,' the Sword Lord growled. I can do so better if I need not watch and worry for the king's safety. Get gone, then. Ethan Glamourhand's frowning face split in a real smile. Eloquently put, my liege. Azun gave him an answering smile, sheathed his blade, and turned to the waiting lord mage. Arkin Frost! The war wizard inclined his head and reached forward his hand to touch Azun's wrist. "'To the queen,' he murmured, and cast his spell. The world was suddenly a place of blue, roiling mists, shot through with lightning-like flickers of brighter, lighter blue, through which Azun was endlessly falling. But, suddenly on solid ground, or rather somewhere that moved underfoot, as warm and fetid as a slaughterhouse charnel pit, all rotting meat and damp rushing air, somewhere slippery. Shaking his head to clear his eyes of the after-days, Azun clung to the reassuring firmness of the sword in his hand, and crouched low, trying to listen, and keep his balance. He seemed to be somewhere dark and warm that was rapidly getting darker. Abruptly he realized that the dark bulk immediately in front of him was a gigantic tooth, long and sharp, and that it was one of a line of teeth, he was in the mouth of a huge creature, standing on a tongue that was rising under his boots like an inexorable wave to hurl him forward into the reach of those clashing fangs. Arkenfrost was already tumbling ahead of him. God's preserve, they were in the mouth of the dragon. The fangs drew back, Azun's world suddenly brightening and an instant later the King of Cormir was plunging helplessly forward, borne on the reeking wind of the dragon's breath. In a moment those cruel teeth would clash down, and he'd be cut in two or crushed. Shuddering, the most royal flower of the Oberskiers kicked out hard against the slippery tongue, tumbled crazily forward until his boots struck a fang, and sprang away. Teeth crashed down, Someone screamed, and the king was suddenly in utter darkness and awash in stinging fluid, fluid that seared like flame, and swiftly acquired the iron reek of fresh human blood. Arkenfrost was probably now dead. The dragon's teeth pottered again, 
Light flooded in around the king, and Azun flung himself between them, out into the brightness beyond. He was falling, tumbling away beneath the huge red dragon as it flew on over the forest, its jaws working, not, it seemed, having noticed his escape. His weather cloak's feather-fall magic would save him from a smashed bone's death when he reached the ground. If, of course, the dragon didn't see him and come flying back to bite and swallow. The king of Cormir watched the worm dwindle into the distance, and wondered grimly how Arkenfrost's spell had taken him into the red dragon's maw. A twisting of magic on the dragon's part? Or the act of some unknown foe? or the treachery of Arkenfrost himself. No sane man seeks his own death, but Azun Oberskir had been wrong when judging men a time or two in his life before. Yet not, he thought, this time. It was all too easy for any king to start to see conspiracies in every shadowed chamber and deceit in every word that fell from any lips. And to what purpose? If every man's hand is raised covertly against the king, what profits, said monarch, from acting differently? How does it help the realm, or keep a royal head on its accustomed shoulders for a breath or two longer? The dragon, it seemed, was not coming back, and this was undoubtedly the king's forest beneath him, the tops of its thick-standing trees approaching swiftly now. It was a long fall, cloaked in the magic that would save him from a killing landing. Too long a fall. Goblins had bows, and many forest beasts had keen eyes, and the habit of looking aloft for approaching trouble. Or meals. Azun drew his sword and devoted himself to peering all around and down at the trees rising to meet him. If nothing threatened, he might as well enjoy the view of his realm. Perhaps the last look at it he'd ever have time enough to enjoy. Or perhaps not. Something was streaking at him from the south, coming low over the trees and coming fast, a small dark fleck against the blue sky, rapidly becoming a larger dark spot with wings. Aye, a gazneth. Azun swallowed, finding his mouth suddenly dry, and licked his lips grimly raising his blade and slapping at the hilt of his nearest dagger to be sure of just where it was. Gods, but they were fast. The leathery black wings were almost a blur as the gasness swept up to the slowly descending king. Azun saw two thin arms, two crooked legs, a lanky but unmistakably female body trailing long brown hair, and a face whose eyes glittered with hatred and the rising fire of the hunter eager to slay. Her fingers had become impossibly long talons, hooked, cruel claws, whose needle-sharp tips seemed cloaked in clinging drops of dark liquid. Poison? Or the blood of her last victim? The gasneth climbed in the air as she closed with her drifting target, and Azun steadied his blade, holding it in both hands. On and down she came, with a wordless shriek of anger. Azun waited, his sword held low, and a little behind him, for just the right moment to strike. The gasneth beat foul wings in a flurry, to slow, then swoop then slow again, trying to fool him, but sacrificing the sheer power of a swift pounce. She twisted at the last moment, banking past him to claw and scream, and Azun swung his blade in a hard roundhouse slash, cutting mainly air and feathers, but biting into something as the gazneth flapped strongly away and dipped one wing to loop around. She was trying to come at him from behind as he fell, turning uncontrollably in the wake of his swing and her strike, but Azun snarled silently in determination, and twisted, trying to throw himself around to meet his foe. He was only just in time. The gasneth was gliding right at him, talons raking the air so as to present him with a whirling wall of death. He ducked his head to protect his eyes and slashed the air, chopping hard and swiftly to keep her from getting inside his reach. 
a talon got through, cutting a line of fire across his head, the Gazneth trying to blind him with his own blood. A second talon just caught his cheek as he twisted his head back and away and drove his blades solidly through a flailing wing and into the back and thigh beneath. The Gazneth screamed, a raw, rough cry of anger and pain. Azun found himself in the blind heart of a dark flurry of stinking wings that buffeted him like the winds of a spell-spun tempest he'd once been caught in. The fury ended only when she twisted away from his blade and spun in the air, the magnificently muscled line of her naked back momentarily only a foot or so from his nose to strike at him face to face, his sword, its ever-bright enchantments gone at her touch, was behind or beyond her wings and useless. But the king of Cormir was ready. As her talons swept up, and she drew back her legs to kick, she met his dagger, hard and full, into her breast. Azun grimly set aside the fact that this was a weaponless woman and his own blood kin, and kept stabbing, pumping his arm and keeping his legs drawn up to protect himself. She spat blood at him, breast heaving under his blade, but her shrieks and squalls soon became coughs, and she faltered in the air and drew away without striking home with a single talon. Where she had struck earlier, though, Azun felt a sickening weakness, and a trembling was beginning. Her wounds were closing as he watched, while his own were festering. No, worse than that. As the weakness spread— his skin was withering, and the flesh beneath it was rotting, a dark and spongy blight that was spreading swiftly. Soon he'd not be able to hold his sword. He had to end this quickly, or have it ended for him. Bringing his sword back in front of him like a leveled lance to keep her at bay, he felt in his codpiece for the magic he'd hoped not to have to waste this soon in the defense of Cormir. He sought to distract his foe with a taunting, polite purr. "'And whom, dark lady, have I the pleasure of slaying today?' Her reply was a scream of bubbling rage, out of which he could only just discern the name Sozara, before she plunged in again. The king was ready. He swung his sword aside and threw the small iron globe in his hand, full into Suzara's face. If only its explosive magic persisted long enough to work, in the face of the magic-starved Gazness draining of Dweomer, it did. In a flash of raging radiance, the sphere burst apart in leaping hoops and bands of cold iron that swung out into the air dimming and flickering as Suzara flung back her head and gasped in unmistakable pleasure. The iron bands shrank in with lightning speed to tighten around the fell creature. Gods be thanked. They were crashing through branches together now, Azun and his monstrously transformed ancestor, and already the iron bands were crumbling away to white flakes and gray ashes as the Gazneth greedily drank their magic. But as they tightened, the bands of cold iron burned Suzara, lacerating her limbs. The king saw her trapped wings spasm and writhe in pain as she tumbled past the last few boughs and smashed into a dark, stagnant forest pool. Its waters danced away from the crippled Gazneth, then slid back over her like an eager blanket, leaving no trace of her but a few bubbles that soon slowed, then stopped. Not dead, Azun knew, just down out of battle for a time, and probably not a long time. He'd best be away from here in haste, and without using more magic than he had to, either not with a dragon gliding along just above the trees, sniffing for it. Healing was needful right now, though he probably required more than he was carrying. Azun drained the two steel vials that rode in his boots, hefted his no longer magical blade, and set off through the damp green depths of the forest in the direction of the army he'd left behind such a short time ago. 
the king of Cormir felt surprisingly cheerful. Despite the small concerns of a gazneth behind him, a dragon lurking somewhere above, his kingdom hanging in the balance as orcs and goblins raided, the very real possibilities of meeting with a forest predator, or just failing to meet with his troops in the vast and trackless trees ahead, and, of course, the danger that the rotting brought on by the talons of the gazneth would claim him before he reached any aid, or leave him staggering when he did find a foe. The very thought brought a fresh spasm of weakness in his cooling, trembling limbs, and sent him staggering sideways against a tree. His smile, however, was a real one as he concentrated on Philfaril's image, bringing his queen to mind as he liked to remember her best, arching to meet his chest, a bubble with laughter, lusty fingers tugging at his hair. He felt the wry warmth of her awareness as she shared and appreciated that memory. Fairy, he said silently into her mind, I've been, as courtiers say, unaccountably delayed, but I'm alive, I'm coming, and never doubt, dying to see you. 19. As Vangedahast circled down into the pit, a fork of lightning cracked across the cavern ceiling, illuminating the host of spear-shaped stalactites overhead. An instant later the chamber was dark again, and a soft drizzle began to fall, deepening the stench of rot and decay that rose from below. Vangedahast stopped his descent and hovered in place, looking up toward the rim of the pit, where Rowan Cormayrel sat watching. "'Do you mind? This place smells bad enough as it is.' Vangita Hast lowered his light and saw that the tangle of sticks he had glimpsed earlier were in fact small bones. What the devil is this hole, anyway? A goblin grave, Rowan replied. A handful of mold-covered lumps that might have been fresh bodies came into view. There was also a glint of gold buried well down among the skeletons. Rowan continued. When the goblins became a burden on their clan, their children give them an iron tree. They bring it here, string all their treasures on it, and jump. Vanger de Haas nodded. Very practical of them. I take it that's the reason they never come here? The reason they never leave, Rowan corrected. The gazneth raised his face to the drizzle and closed his eyes in concentration. Though it had only been a short while since Nalavara had bitten him apart, all that remained of his wound was a pale scar across the top of his abdomen. After collapsing to the ground in two pieces, Rowan had pulled himself together and asked Vangedahast to start pelting him with magic. The wizard had blasted him with magic missiles, lightning bolts, and any other spell he could cast with the components at hand. Some of the magic did stun the Gazneth for a moment, but most of it he simply absorbed and used to regenerate himself. It was the most frightening thing Vangedahast had ever seen, at least until he recalled the other six phantoms wreaking havoc on Cormir at that very moment. The drizzle did not stop, and Rowan opened his eyes. "'I can't stop it,' he shook his head. "'All that magic!' I'm out of control. Ah, oh, well, Vangita asked, wanted to say something comforting, but could think of nothing. The boy would not recognize instantly to be a lie. A little rain never hurt anything. A little rain, no, but we both know it won't stop there. You should kill me now, before I become the seventh scourge. We'll have no talk of that kind, Vangedahas said sternly. He felt it more of a loss than he had since Onadar Bleth had managed to poison a zoon on that fateful hunting trip. I doubt I could kill you. To become a Gaznath in the first place, you had to betray your duty to Cormir and rob an elven tomb. Do you think I could just wave a hand and undo that? Rowan considered this a moment, then shook his head. 
I suppose not. It is the darkness of my betrayal that makes me a Gazneth, and a Gazneth I will stay until that betrayal is forgiven. If that were so, you would be a Gazneth no longer. Your betrayal was small enough as such things go. Vangerhast did not add that he himself had made worse mistakes for less cause, and still not turned into a Gazneth, but he had never opened an elven tomb either. I, for one, have already forgiven you. But you do not wear the crown of Cormir, Rowan let his chin drop. That will be the hardest part of this, to admit to Tunnelasta that she was the reason I betrayed my oath. He remained silent a moment, then turned his pearly eyes back to Vangelahast. You should have let Nalavara kill me. I couldn't. The realm still has need of your services, said Venger de Hast, hoping he had finally hit on a way to lift Roan's despair. We must get the scepter to Azun. But you wished Nalavara out of existence, said Rowan, as always too observant for his own good. Three times I heard it. And she no longer exists here, wherever here is. Vangelahast raised his hand and displayed the ring of wishes. "'Unless this damned thing worked better for me than it ever has for any of my predecessors, Nalavara remains a force to be reckoned with, and you may be our only way of getting the scepter to Azun. "'Me? When the change takes you,' Vangelahast explained, "'Xanthan could come and go at will. As you become more of a Gazneth, presumably you will too.' "'And you think you'll be able to trust me?' Rowan asked. "'With the scepter in your hand? "'That's the reason I risked what I did. "'Yes,' said Vanger de Hest. "'Though you may have to leave alone if it proves impossible for me to go with you.' Rowan laughed bitterly and stood. "'If I must leave alone, I think it would be wiser for you to kill me.' He began to back away from the edge of the pit, and said, "'What good will the scepter be to Cormir if I have drained all its magic?' 20. Alasair let her arm fall and nodded in grim satisfaction as the banner beside her dipped for the last signal. Obediently, at the head of the valley, a banner dipped in answer. "'Positions?' Alasair murmured almost absently, her eyes on that distant height. Men moved to their bows, and the bristling flowers of arrows standing ready in the turf, the few hopeless shots taking up bills and pikes behind the archers. They'd step forward only when the charging foe were mere paces away. It seemed to take only a few quick breaths before the first smoke drifted up. Alastair smiled grimly. "'Welcome to our cook-fires, you eaters of men,' she said aloud, reaching for her own bow. It shouldn't take long now. Orcs had no more love of smoke than men, and could no more resist ready food and water. Alastair's men had driven the few stray sheep they'd found down to the ponds in this valley the day before, setting the perfect lure— like stupid beasts, the orcs had plunged down upon the prize. They even fought among themselves over who'd get mutton for Evenfest. They were down there now, and Alasair had made ready their next meal, massed volleys of arrows right down their throats. Smoke was rising in dark clouds now, the breezes driving it right down the valley. Waste no shafts. Alasair murmured, repeating the order she'd given rather more forcefully some time ago. Fire only at tuskers you can see. There came a snarling out of the smoke. Then its cause. Orcs were running hard, some with unlaced armor bouncing askew, but all with weapons out and ready. Red eyes glittered with rage and smoke-smarting pain, seeing the doom to come and knowing there was no way to escape it. 
All around Alisair, bows twanged and death hummed. The steel princess chose a target, sighted, and let fly. She plucked up another shaft from the sheaf standing ready, even before her victim threw up its hands to claw at the air, her shaft standing out of its throat, and fell over on its side in the dust. It rolled under the running feet of orcs who stumbled and fell, but kept coming, only to sprout swift thickets of arrows and fall in twisting spasms of pain. A barricade of writhing orc bodies was growing across the mouth of the valley. The slaughter was as impressive as it was swift, unless they dared to tarry among the vultures for other orcs to kill, while they tore free their shafts to use again— Alisair's warriors would have very few arrows left to loose at later foes. Not that arrows were much use against the dragon she expected at any moment. Lord Mage Stormshoulder had hazarded a spell to warn her of what it had done to her father's army, and she had seen it winging across the horizon not long after setting this trap, as if that grim thought had been a signal. A dark and sinuous shape appeared over the hills on the horizon. Alisair cursed and cried out, Into the trees! Break off battle and run! Some did not hear her through the screams and whistling of arrows and the clang of blades rising from the few places where orcs had managed to stagger through the storm of shafts and reach the waiting line of Cormirian pikemen. But a horn echoed her order and the warriors of the forest kingdom started to move. That was when Alisair saw the first dark line of orcs stream over a nearby hilltop, then more, over the next hilltop. Gods, but there must be a thousand thousand of them. Move, gods, damn you, she raged, waving her blade. The dragon was growing in size with almost breathtaking speed. It was going to catch her army on the hillside, well shy of the trees. They were right in the open, as helpless as the sheep she'd left for the orcs. Alisair saw some of her swordsmen scrambling in among the arrow-bristling heaps of orc bodies across the mouth of the valley, and others staggering as they gasped for air in their haste. She saw a few turn and ready their pikes or bows in vain but valiant defiance as the dragon's dark shadow swept down, a shadow that was abruptly banished by fire, a long, blinding torrent of flame, unhampered by trees or rock barriers, or a dragon harried by spells or wounding weapons, a deluge of searing flame that blackened and laid bare half the hillside, and gave the men on it no chance to even scream. Alisair could have sworn that the roaring sound coming out of the dragon as it swept past, its belly low enough for her to touch if she'd leaped high, was mocking laughter. Dark red death swooped up into the sky, wheeled, and came down again. Alisair raised a blade she knew was useless and watched the dragon come. It spread its huge wings above and behind itself like two huge sails that cupped the air and slowed its racing bulk. Alisair heard the air rippling over them with its own roar in the instant before the dragon pounced. It snatched up two huge clawfuls of men in its talons and squeezed, reducing the men to bloody bonelessness even as it crashed down on vainly running warriors and rolled, crushing hundreds more with its great weight and flailing, smashing wings. It bit at men as it rolled playfully, twisting to and fro on its back like a gigantic dog. Alisair snarled at it in futility, never slowing her race for the trees. She half expected the great red dragon to rear upright and start plucking up clawfuls of trees like a petulant child tearing up flowers from a garden. Instead, it roared out its triumph in a wordless bellow that rang back from the hilltops and was echoed by orc throats on all sides before it sprang into the air and flew away, looping and wheeling in the air almost as if it was taunting the surviving humans below. Alisair crashed into a tree with bruising force, reeled away, and shook her head to clear it of images of horses and their riders, bitten in two with casual cruelty and great talons tearing men to bloody shreds of meat. In the space of a few breaths, victory had become disastrous defeat. 
With a vicious snarling, the foremost orcs reached the trees, raising their blades. Alasair shouted to rally her men, and moved to meet them almost eagerly. To have a foe she could reach and smite, and have any hope of felling, was suddenly a wonderful thing. Snarling, tusked mouths screamed as her blade bit down, and growling orcs were suddenly all around her, black blades singing out. She ducked and hacked and sprang, rolling and twisting like a young girl at play, alone among her foes. Black blades crashed together, skirling past her ear, and one bit sudden fire along her flank, cleaving armor with the force of its strike. Cormirian swordsmen were hacking their way to meet her, crying her name. The steel princess saw one man, Fairnguard, that was his name, take a blade in the stomach and fall to his knees, spilling out his guts in a steaming, bloody flood. He'd barely drawn breath to scream when an orc cut his throat, jerking the head around with brutal ease. Gods above! And what if the dragon returned? What then? Alisair stared in horror at the men dying all around her, some of them crying her name, men she knew, some of them men she'd bedded or gotten drunk with, died in bloody horror. They were protecting her with their own bodies and their lives. 21. Tanalasta woke feeling like someone was kicking her from the inside and discovered it was so. There was some little creature down in her abdomen, punching and pushing and trying to find its way out of her belly. She wanted it out, too. Groggy and confused, she pushed herself up in bed, and found herself looking down at a swollen belly that could not possibly be hers, and saw little ripples working their way across the tight-stretched skin, and tiny bulges rising where the thing was trying to push out through her skin. "'Guards!' she cried. It's alive! In the name of the flower, get it out! Tanalasta, it's all right. Nothing is wrong. The voice was male, kindly, and vaguely familiar. A dark, work-weathered hand appeared from beside her and gently forced her head back to the pillow. Stay down a moment. You've been asleep. Asleep? Tanalasta asked, growing calmer but continuing to stare down at her belly. The thing looked more familiar now, though she still could not understand how it had grown so huge, or why it was jumping around so. How long? Not long. A weathered face with gray, close-cropped hair leaned into view, and Tanalasta recognized the man as her friend and spiritual mentor, Auden Foley. Only a few days. Only a few? Tanalasta gasped. She frowned at her swollen belly. What happened? Happened? Auden asked, sounding as confused as she was. He followed her gaze, then chuckled heartily, and laid a hand on her stomach. Nothing bad. Your baby has learned to kick, that is all. My baby? Tanalasta repeated. She noticed the soreness in her breasts, and the scabs where the snake's fangs had pierced her skin, and everything that had happened came flooding back to her. She stared down at her writhing belly and suddenly felt tired and frightened and guilty. In the name of the goddess, how could I have forgotten? Forgotten, my dear? Tanalasta felt something wet and warm rolling down her cheeks, then realized she was crying. The fact surprised her, for she had considered herself long past tears, and far, far above the station where such luxuries could be permitted. She used the edge of a silk blanket to wipe the drops away, but they reappeared instantly, running down her face in such a torrent that they cascaded from her jaw and soaked the blanket. A muted clanking drew Tanalasta's attention to her ante-room door, where Korvar Rallyhorn and one other guard stood watching their crown princess sob like some delicate little girl who'd skinned her knees. Tanalasta wiped her eyes again and willed herself to stop crying. 
but her tears flowed all the more, unleashed by her embarrassment and a sudden appreciation of the risks she had been taking with the life of her unborn child. Seeing that the princess's eye had fallen on him, Corvar bowed cautiously. The princess called. Tanalasta started to order him away, then realized that doing so would only compound Corvar's concern and send a flurry of concerned whispers fluttering through the castle halls. She started to blubber an excuse about a bad dream, but made it only as far as, I was having, before she realized that reacting so strongly to a nightmare would make her appear even weaker. Tanalasta let the sentence trail off unfinished. Corvar's dark brows came together. "'Yes, Highness?' When Tanalasta could think of nothing to say, Auden came to her rescue by furling her blanket back and proudly pointing to her swollen stomach. "'The princess's child is quickening,' Auden explained happily. Corvar looked rather confused and did a quick scan of the room, no doubt trying to fathom whether there was some secret meaning to the priest's words. When he found nothing amiss, he gave Tanalasta an uncomfortable smile. "'That is very good news, I'm sure,' his gaze shifted to Auden. "'Thank you for informing me.' This drew a snort of amusement from the priest. "'Relax, Corvar.' "'No one's saying you're the father?' "'Of course not. I would never do such a thing to the princess.' Auden cocked his brow. "'Truly?' He looked to Tanalasta, then drew the blanket back over her. "'I don't know how you should feel about that, princess.' Corvar's face reddened. He began to stammer an apology, then seemed to lose his way and settled for simply clamping his jaw. The Lionar's embarrassment drew a deep chuckle from Auden, and the humor proved catching. Tanalasta found herself laughing and crying at the same time, then crying with laughter, then finally just laughing. She motioned the Lionar over and took him by the hand. "'Don't be embarrassed, Corvar. I may be your princess, but I'm also just a woman,' she said. "'A woman and a friend. Never forget that.' This seemed to put the Lionar a little more at ease. He smiled stiffly, then bowed. "'Thank you, Highness.' Auden rolled his eyes, then said, "'Corvar, perhaps you should inform Queen Philfairel that her daughter has awakened. As I recall, she can be touchy about that.' "'She did leave instructions to be notified,' said Corvar. Despite his acknowledgment, he made no move to leave.' "'But it may be some time before she is available.' "'Really?' Auden looked doubtful. "'I would want to be certain of that, were I you. "'The last time Queen Philfairo seemed most eager—' "'As she is this time, I assure you,' interrupted Corvar. "'But she is occupied with a matter of state.' "'The slight furrow in the Lionar's brow did not escape Tanalasta's notice. "'What matter of state?' she asked. The Lionar glanced in Auden's direction, clearly appealing for help and receiving none. "'Lionar, I asked you a question,' Tanalasta said. "'Where exactly is the Queen?' Corvar arched his dark brow at Auden one more time, then sighed and said, "'She is in the audience hall with the Lord's gold sword and silver swords and some others.' Tanalasta threw her covers back and swung her legs out of bed. "'Discussing what?' This time Corvar knew better than to hesitate. "'You, Highness, and what should be done?' "'Done?' Tanalasta stood, then nearly fell again when her head grew light and her vision blackened. Auden caught her by the arm and braced her up. "'I know you're concerned, Princess, but you must not rush. You have been in bed for days. Go slowly.' Tanalasta paused long enough to let her vision clear, then looked back to Corvar. "'Done about what?' "'About Sembia's offer, Highness,' said Corvar. "'Ambassador Hovene has repeated it, and Emlar Goldsword has been working hard to convince the more conservative nobles that the, uh, uncertain paternity of your child—' 
Uncertain? Tanalasta fumed. Practically dragging Auden along, she started across the room toward her wardrobe. Didn't anyone tell them? I'm afraid not, said Auden. Given your previous discretion, the Queen thought it best to keep the matter secret. Corvar scowled in confusion, but was too much the soldier to ask the question on the tip of his tongue. Tanalasta answered it anyway. There is nothing uncertain about the parentage of my child, and I think it's time we made that clear to Lord Goldsword and his ilk. Corvar mustered the courage to follow her toward the wardrobe. I beg the princess's pardon, but I may have put the matter too delicately. It is the child's legitimacy they are complaining about, that your firstborn should be misbegotten. It is not misbegotten, Corvar. Tanalasta could sense the disapproval in the Lionar's voice, and it was all she could do not to whirl on him. It was gotten by my husband. Corvar stumbled over his own feet and nearly fell. "'Husband? Rowan Cormeril,' Tanalasta said, "'and I think it is time the realm knows it, "'before Lord Goldsword and his cronies sell our kingdom to the Sembians.'" 22. The king of all Cormir took a cautious step forward on the damp forest moss, then froze— Overhead, through the dappling of many green fingers of leaves, the light had changed. A zoon Oberskir knew all too well what that meant. The source of the stolen sun flashed past overhead, beating dark wings. The dragon, a red dragon as large or larger than any he'd ever seen, was heading south in a hurry. A zoon grimly watched it go. Something fell in its wake, something that had spun out of its jaws to hurtle to the ground, forgotten, something that was plummeting down so close to Azun that the dragon's forgetting it was a very good thing. Azun stood as still as any tree, as the something crashed into the damp leaves, bounced once, then fell still. A little dust trailed away from where it had landed, but not enough to conceal from intent royal eyes what the forgotten detritus was. It was the bloody remnant of a human leg, still encased in a boot, a boot of the sort well-to-do Cormirian courtiers wear when they must take to the country. The king wondered which of his subjects this grim remnant had belonged to, and if a swift but brutal death now was going to turn out to be a fortunate thing for a Cormirian. An instant later, he was very glad he'd kept still and silent. Hoots and hissing chuckles, goblin mirth without a doubt, arose from just ahead of him. The sound came from at least three sides, mingled with cries of, Nalavara, and Ardrak. That last word, he knew, was dragon in some goblin tongues. No lad or lass of Cormir, over about four winters of age, thinks of the deep green forests as empty, private places. The tales there told leave them in no doubt that the woods are more alive than even barley fields, with no hawks or owls about to keep the mice down. They also know that if one is not to become hunted on any woodland journey, one must have stealth, wary alertness, and ready weapons. Yet in all but the most northerly reaches of the forest kingdom, goblins were a woodland rarity. Azun allowed himself a soundless curse of astonishment. A sizable band of the scuttling vermin must be just in front of him, very close by. They could only be in the woods on some sort of stealthy business, and that business, of course, could only be an intended ambush of the king's army. Azun Oberskir had not played at being a forester since the most daring and pranksome days of his last chasing youth, but he sank down onto his knees in the soft forest moss as slowly and gently as any veteran woodsman. The lives of many purple dragons depended on how careful he was now, to say nothing of the life of just one Azun Oberskir the Fourth. 
Moreover, goblin noses and ears were keener than those of the human guards and others he'd fooled when he was younger, bolder, and more agile. He was, he hoped, just a little wiser now, so he waited until a good ten breaths after he heard the faintest rustling moving away from him before he followed. Then he crawled. The rotting caused by the gasneth was feeble now, and would kill him as surely as a goblin blade if this took too long. Well, it would take as long as it took, that was all. The king of Cormir wore caution like a cloak during the eternity of stealthy creeping that ensued, moving along with infinite care so as to keep the stealthily advancing goblin battle band always ahead of him. Ahead, finally, to a place where he could hear the murmur of human voices, occasional heavy footfalls, and even the ring of an incautiously drawn blade. The goblins had led him back to his army, so that he could save it, if he handled this just right. Slowly, like a vengeful shadow, he drew himself to his feet, standing upright and throwing his head back to draw in the breath he knew he'd need. With but a single chance, this must be done just right. Araga, a goblin throat hissed, not far away to his left. That, if his memory served, meant, Ready? Azun decided not to wait for the answer. Filling his lungs, he roared as loudly as he could, We've got them surrounded. Purple dragons, attack! A ragged shriek of rage and dismay rose like a wall of wailing in his face. The king of Cormir flung himself forward to the highest perch within reach, atop a moss-cloaked boulder, and planted his feet, staring intently into the furious tumult below. Surprise lost and ambush ruined. Most of the furious goblins charged at the king's warriors on one front, while others turned to attack the foe who'd shouted. Azun Oberskir awaited those howling goblins calmly, standing alone and swaying with weakness, but wearing a wolfish smile. His eyes were looking for just one thing, ready crossbows in goblin hands. The moment he saw one, he triggered the first of the two blade barrier spells the plainest ring on his left hand held and sprang back down from the rock. No corals sped at him out of the grisly whirlwind of shredded leaves, wet goblin screams, and thudding bodies that followed. He calmly unleashed the second and last blade barrier off to the right of the first, where he could see more racing goblin bodies. He took the ring from his finger and hurled it into the heart of the butchery of conjured blades, watching where squalling goblins fell and where, amid the moss and dead leaves, their weapons landed. When he saw what he wanted, Azun was down from behind his rock like a striking snake. He had a cocked goblin crossbow in his hands and was darting sideways to scoop up a quarrel before any goblin nearby even knew it. Never! he murmured aloud as he settled himself under a thorn bush with the bow ready to fire, was a ring of spell-storing quite so valuable to the crown of Cormir. Have my thanks, Vanji, wherever you are. Both the main body of goblins and almost all the leaves in the area where the spell-borne blades whirled were shredded now, a dark, wet mass of huddled ruin beneath whirling emptiness. He suspected he'd not have much longer to wait before, like a dark thunderbolt, a gazneth plunged down. Flashing blades melted away like mist before a gale as it drank in the magic of Azun's unleashed spells, paying them almost no attention as it sought the ring. Azun calmly put his quarrel into the thickest part of its body as it stalked forward then threw himself down, not pausing to try to recognize it. "'Men of Cormir,' he bellowed up at the shredded branches above, "'empty every bolt and arrow you have into this beast. Stint not. Fire at the king's will.' He rolled upright and peered over the edge of the rock. He'd not taken the time to try to recognize the gazneth before, and he doubted he could be sure of it now. 
it was almost entirely obscured by the thudding rain of arrow after arrow, as the purple dragons enthusiastically feathered it with iron arrowheads by the dozens. Azun watched in satisfaction, as the Gaznath staggered, took two or three frantic running steps through the trees, then beat wings that shook and trembled until it was aloft, crashing through dozens of branches in its heavy, faltering flight away. "'Purple dragons, to me!' Azun roared, sitting down behind the rock again. Now would not be a heroic time to take an arrow from his own men, either mistaken or deliberate. There must be some in Cormir who blamed this war on the Oberskirs. There always were. In but a few moments, the king was surrounded by familiar, grinning faces above breastplates emblazoned with the purple dragon. "'Well met, your majesty,' a dragoneer bellowed, extending a hand to his king. Azun took it and was hauled to his feet. "'Well met, indeed,' he boomed, looking around as armored men clustered around him. "'What news?' "'More losses, my liege,' one of the sword lords growled. "'The war wizards, too, have deserted us.' "'Deserted?' "'Easy there,' a lance lord reproved the first officer, and turned to face the frowning king. "'They said they'd learned by magic that neither you, your majesty, nor Arkenfrost, had been seen at court. They told old Hestelen they feared treachery on the part of certain nobles. They named no names, and said they could trace you, if you stood nearby, through your clothes that they'd but lately handled. And with that they went. "'To Suzel, I, Stormshoulder, Gondolon, and—' "'And Starlagger,' the Lance Lord said unhappily. The king nodded grimly, seeing again a blooded, booted foot tumble to earth. "'I fear their journey ended in the dragon's jaws,' he told the sword-lord. "'Speak no ill of them. I'll be needing to use the healing vials of an officer or two, though, if they left no healing magic behind.' He drew in a deep breath and asked the question he must know the answer to. "'How is our muster now?' "'Your Majesty,' the sword-lord began, his tones matching the general unhappiness. "'I'm sorry to say that—' He was astonished when the king flung up a hand in a soundless order to be silent, but obeyed, watching mutely as Azun took two swift steps away and swung his arm to bid all of the men around him to keep silence and fall back. "'Father!' Alisair's voice in his mind trembled on the sword's edge of helpless tears. "'Yes, lass,' he muttered, as gently and warmly as he knew how. "'I'm here. Speak.' "'Utter slaughter. Dragon. Few of us left. Goblinkin on all sides. I fear I can't get my men out.' Azun threw back his head looking up through bare, hacked branches at a sky that was thankfully free of dragons, and drew in a deep breath. He knew in that moment that he was going to Alisair's side. Tunnelasta was just going to have to deal with the problems at court on her own. The gods and all Cormir knew she'd had long enough to get to know the nobles and their ways, and a trial by fire— while a certain Azun Oberskir lay near death, and a grasping young Blath romanced her and sought to dupe his way onto the throne. Moreover, the crown princess had come a long way since those dark days and learned much. In these last few months, she continually surprised him with the sudden flowering of her confidence and ability. The steel princess, on the other hand, was a known quantity— she was a warrior who could lead Cormir and keep it strong even if all of her kin, especially one old, white-haired, wheezing warrior who happened to wear a crown on his head, were to fall. She was a blade no kingdom should throw away, even if she hadn't been his favorite daughter. More than that, to stride into the palace now would be to rob Tanalas of any chance for a victory at court, or increased confidence, or a reputation for anything in the eyes of anyone, or learning anything from what had befallen, 
all would be swept away as the little girl mishandling the throne ere her father returned. It hadn't been such a hard decision after all. Make ready, men, he called, making sure Alasair would hear his words through their rings. We go north as swiftly as we can to join the force under the steel princess. No battle cries now and no noise. The dragon seemed to be bad this year. He wasn't sure who groaned more grimly at that, the men around him or Alasair in her desperation, standing wearily on a hilltop, leaning on a blade, black with drying orc blood. Twenty-three. They were sitting on the veranda of the grand Crown Silver estate, three of them, many all Crown Silver himself, Duke Castar Persnose, and the Lady of Pearls, Bridget Alamber, drinking Merlot and staring out over the rolling grounds of the estate. The lands looked as though a rare freeze had drifted in from the north and overstayed the tolerance of its hosts. The pear orchards had withered to neat rows of twisted black skeletons. The much-vaunted flock of silver marsh sheep lay bloated and huffing in their brown pasture, and the vineyard had vanished beneath a snowy blanket of white mold. "'A pity about the vineyard, Manny,' said Lady Alamber, draining the last red drops from her glass." There simply is no equal for the Silver Hill Merlot. I shall miss it, I'm afraid. We still have a barrel or a hundred in the cellar. Maniol drained the last of the ewer's contents into Lady Alamber's glass and set the empty container on the table edge, where an anonymous hand in a white glove took it away to be refilled. I'll have a cask sent over for you. "'You're too kind.' "'Not at all,' said Maniel. "'All I ask is that you keep it away from your magic.' "'You may rest assured,' said Lady Alamber. "'It would be a pity to have such a fine vintage spoiled by one of these gasneth things. "'Perhaps I'll even accept the princess's offer and send my magic to the castle for safekeeping.' "'The mockery in her voice drew a sardonic chuckle from both men.' The anonymous hand returned the ewer to the table. Duke Persnose offered his glass to Maniol to be refilled. "'Tell me, what are we going to do about this gold-sword business?' he asked. "'Do?' Maniol poured for the Duke. "'The same thing we always do, of course. Wait until the matter sorts itself out. "'Really, I don't know what the princess could have been thinking,' said Lady Alamber. It's bad enough to sleep with a petty noble, but to marry him? And a cormeral at that, agreed Maniol. Was she trying to make allies for Goldsword? Still, there are those who feel she showed nerve, and who admire her candor, said Pursnose. With the setbacks in the north, they say she has been showing leadership. Maniol nodded and poured for himself. The hard castles and rally horns— and the wyvern spurs as well. Now that they have the old Cormeral estates, they've become a family to be dealt with. Precisely the point, Lady Alamber drained her glass again. On the one hand, she's produced an heir. She held one hand out and lowered it dramatically. On the other hand, it's a Cormeral. She held out the other hand and lowered it. There's no telling who's going to win this thing. That is hardly important, my dear, Maniol said, refilling her glass. What is important is that we don't lose in it. In normal times, yes, said Persnose, but with these dreadful gaznes running about tearing the place up and orcs and goblins loose to the north, it's bad for the ledgers, and it could get worse. It might be less expensive if we simply choose a side. Maniol shook his head vigorously. And what if we were to choose the wrong side? You saw what Azun did to the Bleths and Cormerils after the Abraxas affair. I doubt the Symbians would be any more gracious if we were to side with Tonalasta against them. 
He took a long pull from his glass, then made a sour face. I say, the mold must have gotten to this cask. Pursenose had already noticed the same thing, but had not wanted to insult his host by complaining. There does seem to be a touch of vinegar to it, he said politely. But it seems to me we're overlooking the gasness and all this. Aren't they the real enemy? If we let things go on like this, we'll all lose our crops this year. Which will only drive the price of our stores that much higher. Maniol's sly smile was tainted by a sudden flushing of the brow. Nobody ever said it was easy to be a noble. He grimaced at a sudden burning down in his belly, but managed to keep a polite smile as he turned to draw Lady Allenbur back into the conversation. Wouldn't you agree, Bridget? But Lady Allenbur was not saying anything. She sat slumped in her chair, mouth agape and red-rimmed eyes staring into the sky. Bloody drool ran from the corner of her mouth, and an acidic stench rose from the chair beneath her. Duke Pursnose hissed in pain, and the glass slipped from his hand to shatter against the stone patio. "'I say, Maniol,' he gasped, slumping down in his own chair. "'This wine does seem a bit foul.' Lord Crownsilver was past caring. His head hit the table with a hard thump and a long, wet rasp gurgled from his mouth. Still gloved in white, the anonymous hand reached over and removed the ewer from the table. From the king's balcony, the royal gardens resembled the camp of some vast army settling in for a long siege. It was filled with smoky pillars rising from small campfires, and old sails, waxed tarps, and anything else that could serve as a tent were strung between delicate fruit trees and carefully shaped topiaries. There were people everywhere, gathered together in small, miserable groups, sleeping alone under trees, milling about listlessly looking for lost children and familiar faces. The smell of food, squalor, and aromatic flower beds all merged into one, creating a greasy, too sweet aroma. The cloying smell reminded Tanalasta of an old noblewoman whose nose had grown too accustomed to her own perfume. They started arriving last night, Corvar explained. We told them the park was not for sleeping, but they refused to leave. With the royal palace so close, they said it was the only safe place in Cormir to sleep. I'd be willing to argue the point with them, Tanalasta said dryly. Let me think on the matter for a time. At the moment I'm more concerned about these assassinations. She turned to Sarman the Spectacular, who sat behind her in a wheeled chair that a Lafandar had designed for him. Though she knew the wizard to be no more than fifty, he looked close to twice that age, with baggy eyes, wrinkled alabaster skin, and hair so thin she could see the liver spots on his scalp. You have been looking into this. What are your thoughts? Lord Crown Silver and his guests bring the total number of assassinations this ten day alone to fifteen, said Sarman. You really must have Lord Goldsword arrested before there are more. Tanalasta did not turn from the garden. And we know he is responsible? How? By the fact that we aren't, said Sarman. He's cutting your support from beneath you. Her support? asked Auden, standing as always at Tanalasta's side. I thought what made these killings strange is that all the victims are neutral. Lord Goldsword is discovering how the nobles are leaning, said Sarman, clearly. It is not so clear to me, Tanalasta turned and looked down at the old mage. How does he find out before we do? Sarman's wrinkled fingers tightened on the arms of his chair. The war wizards cannot eavesdrop without drawing the attention of a Gaznath highness. Of course, I didn't mean to imply you weren't doing everything possible. Though frustrated by the situation, Tanalasta refused to be short with a man who had lost fifty years of his life defending her. She turned to her mother. But what of our other spies? The queen looked away uncomfortably and said, 
I am afraid the loyalty of many is only to your father. There has been little to report. What's wrong with these people? Tanalasta shook her head and looked out over the refugee camp. Not for the first time. She wished Vangedahast were there to guide here, or at least to activate his own formidable network of spies. Can't they see how much danger Cormir is in? The only danger they see is their own, said Alafandar. With setbacks in the north, I fear Goldsword's call to accept help from the Sembians is falling upon more receptive ears. Tanalasta slapped the balustrade. We would not need Sembia's help if our own nobles would pick up their swords and fight. She paused a moment to collect herself, then looked to Auden and said, I am beginning to think I should have married Doneth. At least the nobles could not use my husband's name to flout my authority. They would find another excuse, said Auden. Do you really think they would become brave only because you lacked the courage to trust your own heart? The priest's question allayed some of Tanalasta's anger. I suppose not. She turned from the balustrade to her mother. Speaking of cowards and traitors, have you had any luck locating the spy in our midst? Filfairel met Tanalasta's eyes evenly. Of course, she said. I have known his identity for some time now. Tanalasta began to have a bad feeling about her mother's conclusion. And you didn't tell me? It would have accomplished nothing except to alert the spy. Tanalasta bristled at her mother's tone. If you know who he is, then why don't I have him in our dungeon? Filfairel smiled. Because spies can be very useful, especially the enemy's spies. Tanalasta raised her brow and asked, Would you care to elaborate? Not at this time. Filfairel held Tanalasta's eyes and did not look away. As you wish. Tanalasta said, realizing she would just have to be patient. I suppose we're done here. What about Lord Goldsword? asked Sarman. You are going to arrest him? Tanalasta shook her head. If I do that, it will look like I'm frightened of him. That's no way to inspire confidence among our wavering nobles. Sarman's knuckles whitened on the arms of his chair, but he did not argue. A wise choice, but we must do something, said Lavendar. With matters as bad as they are, the people are losing confidence. They need to see you act. Tanalasta glanced over the balustrade and cringed at the sight of all the people she was failing. What those people need, Lavendar, the princess said, is food. The old sage frowned. Of course they do, Highness. But what does that have to do with the matter at hand? Nothing, Tanalasta admitted. She continued to stare into the royal garden, and suddenly knew what she had to do. Nothing and everything. Clearly I can do nothing to stop the Gazness, and it may even be that I can do nothing to stop Goldsword. But there is one thing I can do. A Lavendar looked thoughtful. And that would be... Tanlust had turned away from the balustrade. I can feed my people. She motioned Korvar forward. Lionar, send a man to fetch the cooks, and have the bailey set with tables. I'll be down in an hour, and I expect a ladle to be ready for me. They met in a place in Suzale where such meetings took place, in the dimly lit storeroom of a shady tavern in a seedy quarter where no decent lord would be caught dead. That is why the six nobles had donned elaborately conceived costumes and disguised their faces with false beards, why they had dyed their hair and taken such care to be certain no one had followed them. 
The chambers stank of stale mead, mildewed wood, and unbathed sailors. It was surrounded on all sides by rooms kept vacant at the steep price of five gold crowns each, a price which had drawn even more attention to the group than the perfumed handkerchiefs they held over their noses as they approached their hidden refuge. Freyalt Illance was speaking, his dandy's face ridiculously disguised by a purple eye patch and a trio of wax scars. It's the princess. Natig Longflail told me himself that he had it from Patek Kor that the princess's own dressmaker told his wife that she had sewn no wedding dress for Tanalasta, and he said he would support no bastard on the dragon throne, be it the child of Rowan Cormeril or Alafandar Amarask or Malik Elsami in Nasser. Then he was dead. Her spies found him out, I tell you, and it was her assassins who killed him. "'And you are not blaming the princess just because she would have none of your soft talk, Freyalt? asked Tar Burnick, a broad and burly man who normally wore a bushy red beard. He had cut off all his whiskers and disguised himself as the guard of a merchant caravel not long from the sea wars, and he was one of the few men there who looked the part he had assumed. "'Nottig told me that as long as the princess was married when she made the child, he'd stand with her, and to the nine hells with Imlar Goldsword and his Symbians.' "'And why couldn't the Symbians be the ones behind these murders?' asked Lord Jur Greenmantle. "'It wouldn't matter to them which way we were leaning at all.' They could just keep killing us until there aren't enough of us left to stand with Tanalasta, even if we wanted to. She'd have no choice but to ask for their help. The room erupted into a spirited debate, until a tall, dark-haired figure with a long beard rose and began banging his dagger on the table. Enough, enough, the voice belonged to Elbert Redbow who was neither tall nor dark, but wealthy enough to make himself appear that way for one night. We could argue this all night, with every one of us coming to a different conclusion. I have even heard it said that it could be the Gesnes, though I don't know why they'd bother. Against them, the princess has proven ineffective enough as it is. Hear, hear! It was the first thing all six had agreed about all night. So... You have a plan, Lord Redbow? I do. His voice grew even deeper, and he braced his knuckles on the table. We must stop reacting and start acting. Again there was agreement. Hear, hear. We'll send a man to all the suspect parties, explained Elbert. He'll pretend to be a craven coward in fear for his own life, and claim I've called a secret meeting to divulge evidence about the identity of the assassin. And we'll know the identity of the cur by who shows up to kill us, cried Tar. A grand plan, just grand. As far as it goes, said Freyalt. But what do we do after we find out? You really are as slow as you look, aren't you? asked Lord Greenmantle. We join them, of course. It was at this point that someone knocked on the door. The eyes of all six lords darted toward it, and Elbert Redbow had the presence of mind to snarl, We said not to disturb us. Yes, but you have not ordered a single mug of ale, replied the tavern keeper. How am I to pay for the room's use? You must all buy at least one drink. Elbert snorted in disgust, then looked to the others. "'What say you? I'm thirsty, anyway.' Lord Greenmantle nodded and stepped to the door. "'A little refreshment never hurt anyone.' Greenmantle had barely slipped the chair from under the latch when the door crashed open and an anonymous hand tossed something tiny into the room. Elbert Redbow cursed and hurled himself across the table to make a diving catch. Something crackled and suddenly the room stank of oil and brimstone. Lord Redbow cursed again, and the air went scarlet. Twenty-four. "'Keep well apart,' the sword-lords shouted. 
turning as they strode to look at the purple dragons trudging along behind them, and to gesture with their swords at dragon ears they judged to be gathered too closely. King Azun almost smiled. It had been well over half a century ago when he'd first noticed that officers seemed to love pointing and gesturing with their blades. Perhaps many of them kept those swords unused and shiny in a diligent search for the greatest effect, so the steel would gleam and flash back the sun impressively when employed in such sweeping gestures. The scouts were well ahead, their horns lofting from time to time to warn the advancing army of orc and goblin patrols or battle forays. The horn calls most often persuaded goblins to try to sprawl on the ground and await a chance to gut the unwary with knives before springing to their feet and racing away, but usually they made orcs retreat, trading muttered oaths and wary warnings. These retreats inevitably led to larger and larger whelmings in the hills ahead, until, in the end, the king's forces would face a Tusker army. Azun wasn't worried about that occurring as any sort of surprise. A massed orc attack would be heralded, he was sure, by the appearance, probably involving diving out of the sky to tear men apart or incinerate them with fire, of the dragon. It seemed odd, really, that the sky had been empty of the vengeful worm for so long now. If only outpourings of magic didn't bring Gaznes swooping down to the attack. If only he could use the war wizards, as they should be used, so he'd know where the dragon was and what she was doing at all times. She might have torn apart Suzale by now, roof by roof and wall by wall, or sunk half the ships tied up to the docks in Marsember, or... It was beginning to gnaw at him, this not knowing, and Azun was past the age where nothing much made him fret, and even farther past the years when he'd welcomed fresh challenges atop ongoing adversities. He was beginning to be a lion of shorter temper and earlier bedtimes, who ached all too often, and who welcomed the familiar. He was beginning to feel truly old. Azun answered the next sword lord's shout, with a wordless snarl that made the man blink and blanch and mutter some sort of confused apology. Azun waved it away and dismissed the matter without even looking at him. The king of Cormir was going to die out here, sword in hand, and far from Filfaril. His body would fall cold in the rolling backlands of the realm, without ever warming his throne again, or seeing younglings in bright finery take their first awkward strides at court after kneeling to their king. He was, in a shining moment of firmly clasping his sword hilt, and lifting his head to stare away over the endless trees and the marching purple mountains beyond, quite content with it all. If he could but snatch magic enough so that he and Fairy could look into each other's eyes one last time and say proper goodbyes that both could hear, it would be all right, truly. He would not mind dying out here, if die he must, after all, t'was the lion's way, and, like it or not, he was the old lion. A different horn call suddenly floated up from the ridge ahead, and Azun forgot all about the death and doom to come. It was the signal that friendly forces had been sighted. That could only be Alasair on whatever she'd managed to salvage of her noble blades. Another, more distant horn replied, ringing out bright and clear. This was Alisair herself, telling all that she was coming in haste with foes on her tail. All around the king, men drew weapons or checked on the readiness of daggers with a sort of satisfaction. The steel princess always brought either battle or revelry with her, and these men were at home with either. The pursuing enemy would be orcs, no doubt, perhaps accompanied by the dragon. It was time to save Cormir again. "'You'd think that after all these years I'd be good at it,' Azun remarked to the empty air, causing more than one nearby helmed head to turn in curiosity, then carefully look away again. 
Madness in one's king is neither to be admitted nor encouraged unless desperation descends. I wonder if I am. While we shall see, I, we shall see. In the next moment he saw her, cresting the ridge. Alisair's armor was glinting in the sunlight, and her hair streamed around her shoulders in the usual tangled mess, with her helm, also as usual, off or lost. The steel princess was waving her sword, just as Azun's sword lords were wont to, commanding, directing, and cajoling like any growling sword captain. Prudence counseled a forewarned army to take up a strong position and await the foe. But all around Azun, men were running forward and shouting, excitement lifting their voices. The steel princess had that effect on the men of Cormir who went to war. It was as if the gods touched her into flame, a beacon for men to look to and take comfort in, a beacon that was running up to him now, arms spread wide to embrace him, and with a brightness in her eyes that could only be tears. Azun thought he'd never to be alive to see those tears again. Father, she cried as she came, gods, but it's good to see you. Old bones and all, eh? Azun replied, sweeping her into his arms in a clamor of clashing breastplates. Her arms were strong, and they rocked back and forth like two bears locked in some sort of shuffling dance for a moment before a laughing alisair broke away, crying. "'Enough. You can still break my ribs. I'll grant you that without requiring hard proof.' "'While you, lass,' Azun murmured, sweeping her face close to his with one long and insistent arm, "'can still lift the hearts of an entire army. This one of mine will follow you in an instant.' "'That's good to know.' she said with sudden, quiet seriousness, because I seem to have lost most of mine. That weight never goes away, Azun replied, just as quietly. You just have to know you always spent lives in pursuit of good purpose, and cling to that. Lives used to guard Cormir are never wasted, though I can't say the same for those who fall because of royal folly. Am I guilty of that now? Alisair asked, looking at her father sidelong through the worst tangle in her hair. The words might have been uttered with a defiant toss of her head, but the steel princess was listening very intently for his answer. Azun did not pause to weigh his words, knowing that to have done so would have been to hand Alisair a silence more damning than any words could undo. The only royal folly either of us has been guilty of, since the present peril fell upon the realm, he said firmly, is trying to raise armies to meet our foes in bright and ordered array, when those foes either swoop from the sky to tear bloody havoc from our ordered ranks, or swarm all over the countryside with us in chase, burning farms at will. Alisair nodded as sagely as any of the old retired battle-masters Azun had ever studied under, and said, "'I hope that means we won't try to chase a hundred goblins along a hundred trails at once, or try to lure any goblinkin into an ordered battle up here in these wilderlands.' "'I only wish that were possible,' the king replied. "'Try, though we might, we can never get all the orcs and goblins to stand on one field and face us. So I can never strike the blow that humbles them.' "'Well,' his daughter replied flatly, "'even if that opportunity seems to yawn open right in front of you, you must ignore it.' "'Oh, how so?' Azun asked, cocking his head to one side." This lass of his was sounding more like a veteran battle-master all the time. What she said next might tell him if she was already fit to be a trusted leader. "'It'll be a trap, set to lure you to your doom,' Alisair assured him. "'To hold the gathered might of Cormir out here to be butchered by orcs and goblins beyond counting.' Azun raised both eyebrows. "'Is our situation so dire?' he asked, still playing a part to draw his daughter out. Father, 
It is that and more, the seal princess told him. She took two quick steps back to a high rock and sprang up on it. Azun hid a proud smile. There, Alisair snarled, pointing with her sword. And there, her father looked, knowing full well what he'd see. Scattered bands of goblins and orcs beyond number were streaming down at the embattled Cormerians from all sides. The Tuskers were pouring over knolls and rock outcrops like rivulets of water poured over dry soil, seemingly endless dark fingers reaching greedily for human lives, reaching on three sides and soon the fourth. If the Cormerians didn't flee like the wind from this place, they'd be surrounded and butchered in vain, leaving all the realm undefended against the dragon and her ravening creatures. "'Sound the horns!' Azun said almost bitterly. "'It's Arabelle for us, though I begin to doubt if even its strong walls will be shield enough. Gods, look at them!' "'The ballistae and catapults on the walls should thin a few hundred out of those,' Alasair mused, "'though I'd be happier if we had a blade to use on them that could slay thousands at a stroke. They are numerous, aren't they?' She gnawed thoughtfully on her lip. No time to dig fire trenches. That water ditch, though, the king said slowly, is not finished yet. If I recall Donna's last report, it should be dry. Yes, it should run about a mile west from the walls by now, Alisair murmured. Their eyes met, not needing words for agreement. If the orcs could be trapped between the ditch and a hasty line of piled lamp-oil jugs and brush, the ditch filled with more oil, and both set alight with fire arrows, ballistae and catapults ranged on the space between could slaughter thousands of tuskers. "'You listen too much to battle boasts, father,' Alisair sighed, knowing it wouldn't, couldn't, be half so neat and easy as the king's leaping thoughts might have it. "'And I've been doing so for far more summers with a sword in my hand than you've been alive,' Azun reminded her with a grin, swatting her armored shoulders playfully with the flat of his sword. Alisair rolled her eyes and barked in a mockery of aged gruffness. "'Aye, but have ye learned which end of it to keep hold of yet?' The royal response was a mock thrust with the blade in question. Their eyes met over it, they chuckled in unison, and the king turned to his frowning, looming banner guard and said, "'We march on Arabelle as swiftly as we can. Pass the order.' The war captains had evidently been watching. Before the hulking armored man could more than turn, trumpets blared. Men rose, lifting packs and weapons, save for those who'd served with the steel princess before. They looked to her, seeing just what they'd expected. Her hand was raised in the, to me, rallying signal, as she strode to where the marcher's rear guard should be. Quietly, without any fuss, those men started to move to her. Alisair drew in a deep breath and wondered how much longer they would. 25. Vangerdehast was the proverbial fly on the wall in the goblin war room, save that he was actually a mouse-eared bat and, in deference to the diverse menu of his subjects, an invisible one at that. With Nalavara gone, he felt free to use all the magic he wished, so he made use of a live spider from the kitchen's garnish box and a pinch of coal dust from the cooking ovens to cast a spider climb spell on himself as well. He was hanging quite comfortably in a high, quiet corner, looking down on a sand-covered situation table surrounded by bronze-armored goblin generals. At the near end sat the high general's chair, with a back so tall Vangerdehast could not see the occupant. At the far end rested an even larger chair with a skunk fur seat, vacant save for the iron crown Nalavara had tried to press on him. Rowan was not in the room. He was outside, hiding in a small hollow near the top of the Grod Palace, drizzling rain on twenty legions of puzzled goblins assembled in the great plaza below. 
A smallish goblin in an iron breastplate rose from the high general's chair and clambered onto the situation table. The goblin, Vanger de Hast still could not tell the males from the females, crawled to the middle of the table, where a thin leather strap enclosed a pebble gridwork that bore an uncanny resemblance to Arabelle's street plan. Intersecting the model at right angles were four strings, each representing one of the highways that met at the caravan city. In the quadrant between the high road and Kalantar's way, there was even a small stand of crow feathers to represent the king's forest southwest of the city. A second goblin followed the leader to the middle of the table, then fished two handfuls of dead beetles from its belt pouch and tossed these onto the sand one in the quadrant northwest of the city, and one coming out of the forest to the southwest. With the others looking on, the leader carefully arranged both groups of creatures into triple-wide ranks of a Cormirian heavy company with a war-wizard complement. The lead beetles of both groups converged on the high road just west of Arabelle and seemed to be heading into the city. The goblin pointed to the company coming from the north. The Legion of the Steel Princess is this. Having made good use of the ingredients in the palace kitchens, Vanger de Hast had also cast a Comprehend Languages spell and recognized the leader's voice as that of Otka, the High Consul of the Grod. She has given our tusked allies much trouble. Otka pointed to the company from the south. The Legion of the Purple King is this. She held her hand out behind her. Her adjutant passed her a handful of dead ants, which she carefully arranged in two squares flanking the rear of Azun's army. The legions of Pepin and Rord have turned him back, and still the naked ones control the south. An angry rush filled Vanger de Hast's round ears. That he should be trapped here, helpless, while a bunch of goblins passed freely back and forth into his home plain, outraged him to no end. Again, Otka passed her hand back. The adjutant gave her a handful of cave roaches, which she arranged in an amorphous mass behind Alisair's army. When one of the creatures turned out to be not quite dead, she angrily snatched it up with a handful of sand and swallowed both down, then carefully rearranged the other roaches and smoothed the resulting divot. As soon as she was finished— her adjutant turned to another adjutant, who produced a beautiful red dragonfly mounted on a long, thin wire. Almost reverently, the assistant presented the thing to Otka, who took it in both hands and carefully sank the wire into the sand next to the high road, so that the dragonfly hovered over the convergence of the two Cormirian armies. "'The giver has joined the Tusked Ones,' "'And now must the steel princess flee into the great forest at four roads.' "'Otka jammed a finger into the great palace complex in Arabelle, then said, "'Here we stop the human things before they do to Grod what was done to Cormanthor. "'Here we repay the giver for all she has taught us.' "'Vanger de Hast expected Otka to continue on.' But instead, she simply accepted a pouch full of dried ants from her adjutant and began to arrange them in Arabelle's streets. This way, the Legion of Macker goes to fill the east streets with fire and death. This way, the Legions of Himmel and Yosso and Paik go to take the western gate and to the tusked ones throw it open. This way, the Legion of Jaff goes. Vanger de Hast listened in growing horror, as Otka outlined a plan to eradicate not only the Cormirian army, but the entire city of Arabelle as well. The goblin did not need to describe what would come next. Her legions would sweep over Cormir, driving all humans from the land, and reducing their grand cities to smoking midden heaps. Shadowdale and Sembia, and the other neighboring realms, would send troops either to aid Cormir or to bite off what they could, but the efforts would come too late and be too small. By the time they mobilized, the Grod would control all the crucial points Nall Pass, Thunder Gap, High Horn, the port cities, Walloon, and its crucial bridge. Their numbers and organization would astonish all comers, and with Nalavara to back them up, the kingdom would be theirs. 
Vangita Hast listened intently as Otka rattled off assignments, trying to discern some hint from the goblin's instructions of how she communicated with the legions she had already sent to Cormir. Thinking that perhaps Nalavara's disappearance had lifted whatever magic kept him captive in the caverns, the wizard had already tried to teleport and plain walk home but the only result had been that he and Rowan spent the next several hours searching each other out. His luck with communication spells had been no better, save when he tried to contact Rowan, all he ever heard back was the mad rushing of empty space. And yet Nalavara had gone to Cormir when he wished her out of existence, and the goblins were as free to pass back and forth as Xanthan had been, even now. They were standing along the rim of the black void where the dragon had raised herself from the plaza, arrayed in neat ranks, and ready to step through the darkness into the very heart of Arabelle. Vangita Hast cursed himself for not understanding how Nalavara had imprisoned him, and for being foolish enough to free her on Cormir. The truth of the matter was he had expected everything that had happened. Had he held his tongue— Nalavara would have destroyed Rowan, and perhaps him, and the Scepter of Lords as well, then departed in her own time. All the wish had done was preserve his hope, and that was really all he had expected to gain. As Vangita Hast watched Otka lay out her legions of ants, he had deduced her scale now, one ant per cohort. He thought about using the wish again. If Nalavara had been moved to Cormir by being wished out of existence, perhaps Vangita Hast could do the same thing by wishing himself out of existence. He could tell by the way Rowan's pearly eyes were constantly drawn to the ring that it still had plenty of magic in it, and it seemed reasonable to hope that if a thing worked once, it would work again. The trouble was that wishes were reasonable things. They were entirely reasonable, and it was that which made them entirely unpredictable. For the multiverse to stay in balance, there had to be a certain equilibrium to wishes, so that even as the thing the wisher asked was granted, something he did not wish also came to be. If people could simply go around wishing things without consequences, the multiverse would quickly grow unstable and spin out of control. By wishing Nalavara out of existence, he had merely taken her out of his immediate existence and placed her in another where he wanted her even less, and the multiverse had stayed in balance. To wish himself back to Cormir, he would have to wish for what he did not desire and hope that what he actually desired came about in reaction. He would have to wish himself out of existence, but choose his words carefully enough to be certain that he came back into existence in Cormir. That would, of course, trigger another reaction, since what he really desired could not possibly be as important as what he truly desired but did not wish. Vangerda Hast felt as though he were standing between two mirrors trying to find the last reflection when there simply was not one. No matter how carefully he worded the wish, he would be playing knuckle-bones with his own life. Even if he did find a way to cheat the spell, he would be gambling with the multiverse itself. That he could not do, even to save Cormir. Otka made her final assignments and turned to address her generals, reminding them of how much they owed Nalavara for bringing them the gift of iron and civilization, and that all the giver had ever asked of them was that one day they would go stop the depredations of the human things. As she spoke, Vangerda Hast found himself staring across the room to where the iron crown sat in the empty throne. Twice Nalavara had offered him the crown, and twice he had refused it. Even if he did want to rule a nation of goblins, which he did not, he had seen no reason to trust the dragon. The offer had seemed a mere trick to bind him to her service, or more likely an empty taunt meant to mock the dark ambitions everyone, save the wizard himself, seemed to sense lurking in his soul. He had dismissed the crown as a thing of no value to him or anyone else, and yet there it was, sitting empty in a seat of honor. 
it had value to the goblins. Still invisible, Vangedahast dropped out of his corner and spread his wings, swooping so low over the Otka's head that she ducked and cried out as he sifted past. The other goblins looked at her as though she were mad, and she gazed around the room with wide, suspicious eyes.' 